The Horror of the Heights by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Daniker. The Horror of the Heights by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The idea that the extraordinary narrative which has been called the Joyce Armstrong fragment is an elaborate practical joke, evolved by some unknown person, cursed by a perverted and sinister sense of humor, has now been abandoned by all who have examined the matter. The most macabre and imaginative of plotters would hesitate before linking his morbid fancies with the unquestioned and tragic facts which reinforce the statement. Although the assertions contained in it are amazing and even monstrous, it is nonetheless forcing itself upon the general intelligence that they are true, and that we must readjust our ideas to the new situation. This world of ours appears to be separated by a slight and precarious margin of safety from a most singular and unexpected danger. I will endeavor in this narrative, which reproduces the original document in its necessarily somewhat fragmentary form, to lay before the reader the whole of the facts up to date, prefacing my statement by saying that, if there be any who doubt the narrative of Joyce Armstrong, there can be no question at all as to the facts concerning Lieutenant Myrtle, R.N., and Mr. Hay Connor, who undoubtedly met their end in the manner described. The Joyce Armstrong fragment was found in the field which is called Lower Haycock, lying one mile to the westward of the village of Withiam upon the Kent and Sussex border. It was on the 15th September last that an agricultural laborer, James Flynn, in the employment of Matthew Dodd, farmer of the Chauntry Farm Withiam, perceived a briar pipe lying near the footpath which skirts the hedge in Lower Haycock. A few paces farther on, he picked up a pair of broken binocular glasses. Finally, among some nettles in the ditch, he caught sight of a flat, canvas-backed book, which proved to be a notebook with detachable leaves, some of which had come loose and were fluttering along the base of the hedge. These he collected, but some, including the first, were never recovered, and leave a deplorable hiatus in this all-important statement. The notebook was taken by the laborer to his master, who in turn showed it to Dr. J. H. Atherton of Hartfield. This gentleman at once recognized the need for an expert examination, and the manuscript was forwarded to the Aero Club in London, where it now lies. The first two pages of the manuscript are missing. There is also one torn away at the end of the narrative, though none of these affect the general coherence of the story. It is conjectured that the missing opening is concerned with the record of Mr. Joyce Armstrong's qualifications as an aeronaut, which can be gathered from other sources and are admitted to be unsurpassed among the air pilots of England. For many years he has been looked upon as amongst the most daring and the most intellectual of flying men, a combination which has enabled him to both invent and test several new devices including the common gyroscopic attachment, which is known by his name. The main body of the manuscript is written neatly in ink, but the last few lines are in pencil, and are so ragged as to be hardly legible, exactly, in fact, as they might be expected to appear if they were scribbled off hurriedly from the seat of a moving aeroplane. There are, it may be added, several stains, both on the last page and on the outside cover, which have been pronounced by the Home Office experts to be blood, probably human, and certainly mammalian. The fact that something closely resembling the organism of malaria was discovered in this blood, and that Joyce Armstrong is known to have suffered from intermittent fever, is a remarkable example of the new weapons which modern science has placed in the hands of our detectives. And now a word as to the personality of the author of this epic-making statement. Joyce Armstrong, according to a few friends who really knew something of the man, was a poet and a dreamer, as well as a mechanic and an inventor. 
He was a man of considerable wealth, much of which he spent in the pursuit of his aeronautical hobby. He had four private aeroplanes in his hangar near Devices, and is said to have made no fewer than 170 ascents in the course of last year. He was a retiring man with dark moods in which he would avoid the society of his fellows. Captain Dangerfield, who knew him better than anyone, says that there were times when his eccentricity threatened to develop into something more serious. His habit of carrying a shotgun with him in his aeroplane was one manifestation of it. Another was the morbid effect which the fall of Lieutenant Myrtle had upon his mind. Myrtle, who was attempting the height record, fell from an altitude of something over 30,000 feet. Horrible to narrate, his head was entirely obliterated, though his body and limbs preserved their configuration. At every gathering of airmen, Joyce Armstrong, according to Dangerfield, would ask with an enigmatic smile, and where, pray, is Myrtle's head? On another occasion after dinner, at the mess of the flying school in Salisbury Plain, he started a debate as to what will be the most permanent danger which airmen will have to encounter. Having listened to successful opinions as to air pockets, faulty construction, and overbanking, he ended by shrugging his shoulders and refusing to put forward his own views, though he gave the impression that they differed from any advanced by his companions. It is worth remarking that after his own complete disappearance, it was found that his private affairs were arranged with a precision which may show that he had a strong premonition of disaster. With these essential explanations, I will now give the narrative exactly as it stands, beginning at page 3 of the blood-soaked notebook. Nevertheless, when I dined at Rems with Cassilia and Gustav Raymond, I found that neither of them was aware of any particular danger in the higher layers of the atmosphere. I did not actually say what was in my thoughts, but I got so near to it that if they had any corresponding idea, they could not have failed to express it. But then they are two empty, vainglorious fellows with no thought beyond seeing their silly names in the newspaper. It is interesting to note that neither of them had ever been much beyond the 20,000-foot level. Of course, men have been higher than this both in balloons and in the ascent of mountains. It must be well above that point that the aeroplane enters the danger zone, always presuming that my premonitions are correct. Aeroplaning has been with us now for more than twenty years, and one might well ask, why should this peril be only revealing itself in our day? The answer is obvious. In the old days of weak engines, when a hundred-horsepower gnome or green was considered to be ample for every need, the flights were very restricted. Now that 300 horsepower is the rule rather than the exception, visit to the upper layers have become easier and more common. Some of us can remember how, in our youth, Garros made a worldwide reputation by attaining 19,000 feet and it was considered a remarkable achievement to fly over the Alps. Our standard now has been immeasurably raised, and there are 25 high flights for one in former years. Many of them have been undertaken with impunity. The 30,000-foot level has been reached time after time with no discomfort beyond cold and asthma. What does this prove? A visitor might descend upon this planet a thousand times and never see a tiger. Yet tigers exist, and if he chanced to come down in a jungle, he might be devoured. There are jungles of the upper air, and there are worse things than tigers which inhabit them. I believe in time they will map these jungles accurately out. Even at the present moment, I could name two of them. One of them lies over the Pau Birets district in France. Another is just above my head as I write here in my house in Wiltshire. I rather think there is a third in the Hamburg-Wiesbaden district. It was the disappearance of the airmen that first set me thinking. Of course, everyone said that they had fallen into the sea, but that did not satisfy me at all. First, there was Verrier in France. 
His machine was found near Bayonne, but they never got his body. There was the case of Baxter also, who vanished, though his engine and some of the iron fixings were found in a wood in Leicestershire. In that case, Dr. Middleton of Amesbury, who was watching the flight with a telescope, declares that just before the clouds obscured the view, he saw the machine, which was at an enormous height, suddenly rise perpendicularly upwards in a succession of jerks in a manner that he would have thought to be impossible. That was the last ever seen of Baxter. There was a correspondence in the papers, but it never led to anything. There were several other similar cases, and then there was the death of Hay Connor. What a cackle there was about an unsolved mystery of the air, and what columns in the halfpenny papers, and yet how little was ever done to get to the bottom of the business. He came down in a tremendous volplane from an unknown height. He never got off his machine and died in the pilot seat. Died of what? Heart disease, says the doctors. Rubbish. Hay Connor's heart was as sound as mine is. What did Venables say? Venables was the only man who was at his side when he died. He said that he was shivering and looked like a man who had been badly scared. Died of fright, said Venables, but could not imagine what he was frightened about. Only said one word to Venables, which sounded like monstrous. They could make nothing of that at the inquest, but I could make something of it monsters. That was the last word of poor Harry Hay Connor, and he did die of fright, just as Venables thought. And then there was Myrtle's head. Do you really believe, does anyone really believe, that a man's head could be driven clean into his body by the force of a fall? Well, perhaps it may be possible, but I, for one, have never believed that it was so with Myrtle and the grease upon his clothes, all slimy with grease, said someone at the inquest. Queer that no one got thinking after that. I did, but then I had been thinking for a good long time. I've made three ascents. How Dangerfield used to chaff me about my shotgun, but I've never been high enough. Now, with this new light Paul Verone machine and its 175 Robur, I should easily touch 30,000 tomorrow. I'll have a shot at the record. Maybe I'll have a shot at something else as well. Of course it's dangerous. If a fellow wants to avoid danger, he had best keep out of flying altogether and subside finally into flannel slippers and a dressing gown. But I'll visit the air jungle tomorrow, and if there is anything there, I shall know it. If I return, I'll find myself a bit of a celebrity. If I don't, this notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it. But no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. I chose my Paul Verone monoplane for the job. There's nothing like a monoplane when real work is to be done. Beaumont found that out in the very early days. For one thing, it doesn't mind damp, and the weather looks as if we should be in the clouds all of the time. It's a bonny little model and answers my hand like a tender-mouthed horse. The engine is a ten-cylinder rotary robur working up to 175. It has all the modern improvements, enclosed fuselage, high-curved landing skids, brakes, gyroscopic steadiers, and three speeds worked by an alteration of the angle of the planes upon the Venetian blind principle. I took a shotgun with me and a dozen cartridges filled with buckshot. You should have seen the face of Perkins, my old mechanic, when I directed him to put them in. I was dressed like an Arctic explorer with two jerseys under my overalls, thick socks inside my padded boots, a storm cap with flaps, and my talc goggles. It was stifling outside the hangars, but I was going for the summit of the Himalayas and had to dress for the part. Perkins knew there was something on and implored me to take him with me. Perhaps I should if I were using the biplane, but a monoplane is a one-man show, if you want to get the last foot of life out of it. Of course I took an oxygen bag. The man who goes for the altitude record without one will either be frozen, or smothered, or both. I had a good look at the planes, the rudder bar, and the elevating lever before I got in. Everything was in order so far as I could see. 
Then I switched on my engine and found that she was running sweetly. When they let her go, she rose almost at once upon the lowest speed. I circled my home field once or twice just to warm her up, and then with a wave to Perkins and the others, I flattened out my planes and put her on her highest. She skimmed like a swallow downwind for eight or ten miles until I turned her nose up a little and she began to climb in a great spiral for the cloud bank above me. It's all important to rise slowly and adapt yourself to the pressure as you go. It was a close, warm day for an English September and there was a hush and heaviness of impending rain. Now and then there came sudden puffs of wind from the southwest, one of them so gusty and unexpected that it caught me napping and turned me half round for an instant. I remember the time when gusts and whirls and air pockets used to be things of danger, before we learned to put an overmastering power into our engines. Just as I reached the cloud banks, with the altimeter marking 3,000, down came the rain. My word how it poured! It drummed upon my wings and lashed against my face, blurring my glasses so that I could hardly see. I got down onto a low speed, for it was painful to travel against it. As I got higher, it became hail, and I had to turn tail to it. One of my cylinders was out of action, a dirty plug, I should imagine, but still I was rising steadily with plenty of power. After a bit, the trouble passed, whatever it was, and I heard the full, deep-throated purr, the ten singing as one. That's where the beauty of our modern silencers comes in. We can at last control our engines by ear. How they squeal and squeak and sob when they are in trouble. All those cries for help were wasted in the old days when every sound was swallowed up by the monstrous racket of the machine. If only the early aviators could come back to see the beauty and perfection of the mechanism which have been bought at the cost of their lives. About 9.30 I was nearing the clouds. Down below me, all blurred and shadowed with rain, lay the vast expanse of Salisbury Plain. Half a dozen flying machines were doing hack work at the thousand-foot level, looking like little black swallows against the green background. I dare say they were wondering what I was doing up in cloudland. Suddenly a gray curtain drew across beneath me, and the wet folds of vapors were swirling round my face. It was clamily cold and miserable. But I was above the hailstorm, and that was something gained. The cloud was as dark and thick as a London fog. In my anxiety to get clear, I cocked her nose up until the automatic alarm bell rang, and I actually began to slide backwards. My soft and dripping wings had made me heavier than I thought, but presently I was in lighter cloud and soon had cleared the first layer. There was a second, opal-colored and fleecy, at a great height above my head, a white, unbroken ceiling above, and a dark, unbroken floor below with a monoplane laboring upward on a vast spiral between them. It is deadly lonely in these cloud spaces. Once a great flight of some small water bird went past me, flying very fast to the westward. The quick whir of their wings and their musical cry were cheery to my ear. I fancied that they were teal, but I am a wretched zoologist. Now that we humans have become birds, we must really learn to know our brethren by sight. The wind down beneath me whirled and swayed the broad cloud plain. Once a great eddy formed in it, a whirlpool of vapor, and through it, as down a funnel, I caught sight of the distant world. A large white biplane was passing at a vast depth beneath me. I fancy it was the morning mail service betwixt Bristol and London. Then the drift swirled inward again, and the great solitude was unbroken. Just after ten, I touched the lower edge of the upper cloud stratum. It consisted of fine diaphanous vapor drifting swiftly from the westward. The wind had been steadily rising all this time, and it was now blowing a sharp breeze. Twenty-eight an hour by my gauge. Already it was very cold, though my altimeter only marked nine thousand. The engines were working beautifully, and we went droning steadily upwards. The cloud bank was thicker than I had expected, 
but at last it thinned out into a golden mist before me, and then in an instant I had shot out from it, and there was an unclouded sky and a brilliant sun above my head, all blue and gold above, all shining silver below, one vast, glimmering plain as far as my eyes could reach. It was a quarter past ten o'clock, and the barograph needle pointed to twelve thousand eight hundred. Up I went, and up, my ears concentrated upon the deep purring of my motor, my eyes busy always with the watch, the revolution indicator, the petrol lever, and the oil pump. No wonder aviators are said to be a fearless race. With so many things to think of, there is no time to trouble about oneself. About this time, I noted how unreliable is the compass when above a certain height from the earth. At 15,000 feet, mine was pointing east and a point south. The sun and the wind gave me my true bearings. I had hoped to reach an eternal stillness in these high altitudes, but with every thousand feet of ascent, the gale grew stronger. My machine groaned and trembled in every joint and rivet as she faced it and swept away like a sheet of paper when I banked her on the turn, skimming downwind at a greater pace, perhaps, than ever mortal man has moved. Yet I had always to turn again and tack into the wind's eye, for it was not merely the height record that I was after. By all my calculations, it was above little Wiltshire that my air jungle lay, and all my labor might be lost, if I struck the outer layers at some farther point. When I reached the 19,000-foot level, which was about midday, the wind was so severe that I looked with some anxiety to the stays of my wings, expecting momentarily to see them snap or slacken. I even cast loose the parachute behind me and fastened its hook onto the ring of my leathern belt so as to be ready for the worst. Now was the time when a bit of scant work by the mechanic was paid for by the life of the aeronaut. But she held together bravely. Every cord and strut was humming and vibrating like so many harp strings. But it was glorious to see how, for all the beating and buffeting, she was still the conqueror of nature and the mistress of the sky. There is surely something divine in man himself that he should rise so superior to the limitations which creation seemed to impose. Rise, too, by such unselfish heroic devotion as this air conquest has shown. Talk of human denigration! When has such a story as this been written in the annals of our race? These were the thoughts in my head as I climbed that monstrous inclined plane, with a wind sometimes beating in my face and sometimes whistling behind my ears, while the cloudland beneath me fell away to such a distance that the folds and hummocks of silver had all smoothed out into one flat, shining plain. But suddenly I had a horrible and unprecedented experience. I have known before what it is to be in what our neighbors have called a tourbillon, but never on such a scale as this, that huge sweeping river of wind of which I have spoken, had, as it appears, whirlpools within it which were as monstrous as itself. Without a moment's warning, I was dragged suddenly into the heart of one. I spun round for a minute or two with such velocity that I almost lost my senses, and then fell suddenly, left wing foremost, down the vacuum funnel in the center. I dropped like a stone and lost nearly a thousand feet. It was only my belt that kept me in my seat, and the shock and breathlessness left me hanging half insensible over the side of the fuselage. But I am always capable of a supreme effort. It is my one great merit as an aviator. I was conscious that the descent was slower, the whirlpool was a cone rather than a funnel, and I had come to the apex. With a terrific wrench throwing my weight all to one side, I leveled my planes and brought her head away from the wind. In an instant I had shot out of the eddies and was skimming down the sky. Then, shaken but victorious, I turned her nose up and began once more my steady grind on the upward spiral. 
I took a large sweep to avoid the danger spot of the whirlpool, and soon I was safely above it. Just after one o'clock, I was 21,000 feet above sea level. To my great joy, I had topped the gale, and with every hundred feet of ascent, the air grew stiller. On the other hand, it was very cold, and I was conscious of that peculiar nausea that goes with the rarefication of the air. For the first time, I unscrewed the mouth of my oxygen bag and took an occasional whiff of the glorious gas. I could feel it running like a cordial through my veins, and I was exhilarated almost to the point of drunkenness. I shouted and sang as I soared upward into the cold, still outer world. It is very clear to me that the insensibility which came upon Glacier, and in a lesser degree upon Coxwell, when, in 1862, they ascended in a balloon to a height of 30,000 feet, was due to the extreme speed with which a perpendicular ascent is made. Doing it in an easy gradient, and accustoming oneself to the lessened barometric pressure by slow degrees, there are no such dreadful symptoms. At the same great height, I found that even without my oxygen inhaler, I could breathe without undue distress. It was bitterly cold, however, and my thermometer was at zero Fahrenheit. At 1.30, I was nearly seven miles above the surface of the earth and still ascending steadily. I found, however, that the rarefied air was giving markedly less support to my planes, and that my angle of ascent had to be considerably lowered in consequence. It was already clear that even with my light weight and strong engine power, there was a point in front of me where I should be held. To make matters worse, one of my sparking plugs was in trouble again, and there was intermittent misfiring in the engine. My heart was heavy with the fear of failure. It was about this time that I had a most extraordinary experience. Something whizzed past me in a trail of smoke and exploded with a loud hissing sound, sending forth a cloud of steam. For the instant I could not imagine what had happened. Then I remembered that the earth is forever being bombarded by meteor stones and would be hardly inhabitable were they not, in nearly every case, turned to vapor in the high outer layers of the atmosphere. Here is a new danger for the high-altitude man, for two others passed me when I was nearing the 40,000-foot mark. I cannot doubt that at the edge of the Earth's envelope, the risk would be a very real one. My barograph needle marked 41,300 when I became aware that I could go no further. Physically, the strain was not as yet greater than I could bear, but my machine had reached its limit. The attenuated air gave no firm support to the wings, and the least tilt developed into a side slip while she seemed sluggish on her controls. Possibly, had the engine been at its best, another thousand feet might have been within our capacity. But it was still misfiring, and two out of the ten cylinders appeared to be out of action. If I had not already reached the zone for which I was searching, then I should never see it upon this journey. But was it not possible that I had attained it? Soaring in circles like a monstrous hawk upon the 40,000-foot level, I let the monoplane guide herself, and with my Mannheim glass, I made a careful observation of my surroundings. The heavens were perfectly clear. There was no indication of those dangers which I had imagined. I have said that I was soaring in circles. It struck me suddenly that I would do well to take a wider sweep and open up a new air tract. If the hunter entered an earth jungle, he would drive through it if he wished to find his game. My reasoning had led me to believe that the air jungle which I had imagined lay somewhere over Wiltshire. This should be to the south and to the west of me. I took my bearings from the sun, for the compass was hopeless and no trace of earth was to be seen, nothing but the distant silver cloud plain. However, I got my direction as best I might, and I kept her head straight to the mark. I reckoned that my petrol supply would not last more than another hour or so, but I could afford to use it to the last drop, since a single magnificent vol plane could at any time take me to the earth.
suddenly I was aware of something new. The air in front of me had lost its crystal clearness. It was full of long, ragged wisps of something which I can only compare to very fine cigarette smoke. It hung about in wreaths and coils, turning and twisting slowly in the sunlight. As the monoplane shot through it, I was aware of a faint taste of oil upon my lips, and there was a greasy scum upon the woodwork of the machine. Some infinitely fine organic matter appeared to be suspended in the atmosphere. There was no life there. It was inchoate and diffuse, extending for many square miles and then fringing off into the void. No, it was not life, but might it not be the remnants of life? Above all, might it not be the food of life, of monstrous life, even as the humble grease of the ocean is food for the mighty whale? The thought was in my mind when my eyes looked upward and I saw the most wonderful vision that man has ever seen. Can I hope to convey it to you even as I saw it myself last Thursday? Conceive a jellyfish such as sails in our summer seas, bell-shaped and of enormous size, far larger, I should judge, than the Dome of St. Paul's. It was of a light pink color veiled with a delicate green, but the whole huge fabric so tenuous that it was but a fairy outline against the dark blue sky. It pulsated with a delicate and regular rhythm. From it there depended two long, drooping green tentacles which swayed slowly backwards and forwards. This gorgeous vision passed gently with noiseless dignity over my head as light and fragile as a soap bubble, and drifted upon its stately way. I half turned my monoplane that I might look after this beautiful creature when, in a moment, I found myself amidst a perfect fleet of them, of all sizes, but none so large as the first. Some were quite small, but the majority about as big as an average balloon, and with much the same curvature at the top. There was in them a delicacy of texture and coloring which reminded me of the finest Venetian glass. Pale shades of pink and green were the prevailing tints, but all had a lovely iridescence where the sun shimmered through their dainty forms. Some hundreds of them drifted past me, a wonderful fairy squadron of strange, unknown argosies of the sky creatures whose form and substance were so attuned to these pure heights that one could not conceive anything so delicate with an actual sight or sound of the earth. But soon my attention was drawn to a new phenomenon, the serpents of the outer air. These were long, thin, fantastic coils of vapor-like material which turned and twisted with great speed, flying round and round at such a pace that the eyes could hardly follow them. Some of these ghost-like creatures were twenty or thirty feet long, but it was difficult to tell their girth, for their outline was so hazy that it seemed to fade away into the air around them. These air snakes were of a very light gray or smoke color, with some darker lines within, which gave the impression of a definite organism. One of them whisked past my very face, and I was conscious of a cold, clammy contact, but their composition was so unsubstantial that I could not connect them with any thought of physical danger, any more than the beautiful bell-line creatures which had preceded them. There was no more solidity in their frames than in the floating spume from a broken wave. But a more terrible experience was in store for me. Floating downward from a great height there came a purplish patch of vapor, small as I saw at first, but rapidly enlarging as it approached me until it appeared to be hundreds of square feet in size. Though fashioned of some transparent, jelly-like substance, it was nonetheless of much more definite outline and solid consistence than anything which I had seen before. There were more traces, too, of a physical organization, especially two vast, shadowy, circular plates on either side which may have been eyes and a perfectly solid white projection between them which was as curved and as cruel as the beak of a vulture the whole aspect of this monster was formidable and threatening 
and it kept changing its color from a very light mauve to a dark, angry purple so thick that it cast a shadow as it drifted between my monoplane and the sun. On the upper curve of its huge body there were three great projections which I can only describe as enormous bubbles, and I was convinced as I looked at them that they were charged with some extremely light gas which served to buoy up the misshapen and semi-solid mass in the rarefied air. The creature moved swiftly along, keeping easy pace with the monoplane, and for twenty miles or more it formed my horrible escort, hovering over me like a bird of prey which is waiting to pounce. Its method of progression, done so swiftly that it was not easy to follow, was to throw out a long, glutinous streamer in front of it, which in turn seemed to draw forward the rest of the writhing body. So elastic and gelatinous was it that never for two successive minutes was it the same shape, and yet each change made it more threatening and loathsome than the last. I knew that it meant mischief. Every purple flush of its hideous body told me so. The vague, goggling eyes which were turned always upon me were cold and merciless in their viscid hatred. I dipped the nose of my monoplane downward to escape it. As I did so, as quick as a flash, there shot out a long tentacle from this mass of floating blubber, and it fell as light and sinuous as a whiplash across the front of my machine. There was a loud hiss as it lay for a moment across the hot engine, and it whisked itself into the air again while the huge flat body drew itself together as if in sudden pain. I dipped to a vole peak, but again a tentacle fell over the monoplane and was shorn off by the propeller as easily as it might have cut through a smoke wreath. A long, gliding, sticky, serpent-like coil came from behind and caught me round the waist, dragging me out of the fuselage. I tore at it, my fingers sinking into the smooth, glue-like surface, and for an instant I disengaged myself, but only to be caught round the boot by another coil which gave me a jerk that tilted me almost onto my back. As I fell over, I blazed off both barrels of my gun, though indeed it was like attacking an elephant with a pea-shooter to imagine that any human weapon could cripple that mighty bulk. And yet I aimed better than I knew, for with a loud report, one of the great blisters upon the creature's back exploded with a puncture of the buckshot. It was very clear that my conjecture was right, and that these vast, clear bladders were distended with some lifting gas, for in an instant the huge, cloud-like body turned sideways, writhing desperately to find its balance, while the white beak snapped and gaped in horrible fury. But already I had shot away on the steepest glide that I dared to attempt, my engine still full on, the flying propeller and the force of gravity shooting me downwards like an arrow light. Far behind me I saw a dull, purplish smudge growing swiftly smaller and merging into the blue sky behind it. I was safe out of the deadly jungle of the outer air. Once out of danger I throttled my engine, for nothing tears a machine to pieces quicker than running on full power from a height. It was a glorious spiral volplane from nearly eight miles of altitude, first to the level of the silver cloud bank, then to that of the storm cloud beneath it, and finally, in the beating rain, to the surface of the earth. I saw the Bristol Channel beneath me as I broke from the clouds, but having some petrol in my tank, I got twenty miles inland before I found myself stranded in a field half a mile from the village of Ashcombe. There I got six tins of petrol from a passing motor car, and at ten minutes past six that evening, I alighted gently in my own home meadow at Devesis after such a journey as no mortal upon earth has ever yet taken and lived to tell the tale. I have seen the beauty, and I have seen the horror of the heights, and greater beauty, or greater horror than that, is not within the ken of man. And now it is my plan to go once again before I give my results to the world. My reason for this is that I must surely have something to show by way of proof before I lay such a tale before my fellow men. It is true that others will soon follow and will confirm what I have said, and yet I should wish to carry conviction from the first. 
Those lovely iridescent bubbles of air should not be hard to capture. They drift slowly upon their way, and the swift monoplane could intercept their leisurely course. It is likely enough that they would dissolve in the heavier layers of the atmosphere, and that some small heap of amorphous jelly might be all that I should bring to earth with me. And yet, something there would surely be by which I could substantiate my story. Yes, I will go, even if I run a risk by doing so. These purple horrors would not seem to be numerous. It is probable that I shall not see one. If I do, I shall dive at once. At the worst, there is always the shotgun. In my knowledge. Here a page of the manuscript is unfortunately missing. On the next page is written, in large, straggling writing, 43,000 feet. I shall never see the earth again. They are beneath me. Three of them. God help me. It's an awful way to die. Such in its entirety is the Joyce Armstrong statement. Of the man, nothing has since been seen. Pieces of a shattered monoplane have been picked up in the preserves of Mr. Bud Lushington upon the borders of Kenton, Sussex, within a few miles of the spot where the notebook was discovered. If the unfortunate aviator's theory is correct that this air jungle, as he called it, existed only over the southwest of England, then it would seem that he had fled from it at the full speed of his monoplane, but had been overtaken and devoured by these horrible creatures at some spot in the outer atmosphere above the place where the grim relics were found. The picture of that monoplane skimming down the sky with the nameless terrors flying as swiftly behind it and cutting it off always from the earth while they gradually closed upon their victim is one upon which a man who valued his sanity would prefer not to dwell. There are many, as I am aware, who still jeer at the facts which I have set down, but even they must admit that Joyce Armstrong has disappeared, and I would commend to them his own words. This notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it, but no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. End of the Horror of the Heights Recording by Scott Daniker, Elizabeth City, North Carolina The Yellow Dog of K University From Animal Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. The Yellow Dog of K University from Animal Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell. Reading by Beagle Mixtape. Of the older English universities, many stories are told of bizarre happenings, of duels, ragging, suicides, and such like, in olden times, but of K, venerable, illustrious K of Ireland, few and far between are the accounts of similar occurrences. This is one, however, and it deals with the phantom of a dog. One evening, towards the end of the 18th century, John Kelly, a dean of the college, extremely unpopular on account of his supposed harsh treatment of some of the undergraduates, was about to commence his supper when he heard a low whine, and looking down saw a large yellow dog cross the floor in front of him and disappear immediately under the full-length portrait that hung over the antique chimney-piece. Something prompting him, he glanced at the picture. The eyes that looked into his blinked. It must be the result of an overtaxed brain, he said to himself. Those rascally undergraduates have got on my nerves. He shut his eyes and, reopening them, stared hard at the portrait. It was not a delusion. The eyes that gazed back at him were alive, alive with the spirit of mockery. They smiled, laughed, jeered, and as they did so, the knowledge of his surroundings was brought forcibly home to him. The room in which he was seated was situated at the end of a long, cheerless stone passage in the western wing of the college. Away from all of the other rooms of the building, it was absolutely isolated and had long borne the reputation of being haunted by a dog, which was said to appear only before some catastrophe. The dean had hitherto committed the story to the category of fables, but now, now, as he sat all alone in that big, silent room, 
lit only with the reddish rays of a fast-setting August sun, and stared into the gleaming eyes before him. He was obliged to admit the extreme probability of spookdom. Never before had the college seemed so quiet. Not a sound, not even the creaking of a board or the faraway laugh of a student, common enough noises on most nights, fell on his ears. The hush was omnipotent, depressing, unnerving. He could only associate it with the supernatural. Though he was too fascinated to remove his gaze from the thing before him, he could feel the room fill with shadows, and feel them steal through the half-open windows, and, uniting with those already in the corners, glide noiselessly and surreptitiously towards him. He felt, too, that he was under the surveillance of countless invisible visages, all scanning him curiously and delighted beyond measure at the sight of his terror. The moments passed in a breathless state of tension. He stared at the eyes, and the eyes stared back at him. Once he endeavored to rise, but a dead weight seemed to fall on his shoulders and hold him back, and twice when he tried to speak, to make some sound, no matter what, to break the appalling silence, his throat closed as if under the pressure of cruel, relentless fingers. But the ultima thule of his emotions had yet to come. There was a slight stir behind the canvas, a thud, a hollow groan that echoed and re-echoed throughout the room like the muffled clap of distant thunder, and the eyes suddenly underwent metamorphosis. They grew glazed and glassy like the eyes of a dead person. A cold shudder ran through the dean. His hair stood on end, his blood turned to ice. Again he essayed to move, to summon help. Again he failed. The strain on his nerves proved more than he could bear. A sudden sensation of nausea surged through him. His eyes swam, his brain reeled. There was a loud buzzing in his ears, and he knew no more. Some moments later, one of the college servants arrived at the door with a bundle of letters and on receiving no reply to his raps, entered. "'Good heavens! What's the matter?' he cried, gazing at the figure of the dean, lolling head downward on the table. "'Merciful prudence, the gentleman is dead!' "'No, he ain't. Some of the young gents will be sorry enough for that. He's fainted!' The good fellow poured out some water in a tumbler, and was proceeding to sprinkle the dean's face with it, when, a noise attracting his attention, he peered round at the picture. It was bulging from the wall. It was falling. And, good God, what was that that it was falling with? That huge black object. A coffin? No, not a coffin, but a corpse. The servant ran to the door shrieking, and in less than a minute, passage and room were filled to overflowing with a scared crowd of anchoring officials and undergraduates. "'What has happened? What's the matter with the dean? Has he had a fit, or what? And the picture? And... Anderson? Anderson lying on the floor? Hurt? No, not hurt. Dead! Murdered!' In an instant there was silence, and the white-faced throng closed in on one another as if for protection. In front of them, beside the fallen picture, lay the body of the most gay and popular student in the college, Bob Anderson. Bob Anderson, with a stream of blood running from a deep incision in his back made with some sharp instrument, that had been driven home with tremendous force. He had, without doubt, been murdered. But by whom? Then one of the undergraduates, a bright, boyish, fair-haired giant named O'Farrell, immensely popular both on account of his prowess in sport and an untold number of the most audacious escapades, spoke out. I saw Anderson about an hour ago, crossing the quadrangle. I asked him where he was going, and he replied, To old Kelly. I intend paying him out for gating me last week. I inquired how, and he replied, I have a glorious plan. You know that portrait stuck over his mantel shelf? Well, in poking about the room the other day, when the old man was out, I had a great find. Directly behind the picture is the door of a secret room, so neatly covered by the designs on the wall that it is not discernible. It was only by the merest fluke I discovered it. I was taking down the picture with the idea of touching up the face, when my knuckles bumped against the panels of the wall, touched a spring, and the door flew open, revealing an apartment about six by eight feet large. I at once explored it and found it could be entered by the chimney. An idea then struck me. I would play a trick upon the dean by hiding in the secret chamber one evening while he was feeding, cutting out the eyes of the portrait and peering through the cavities at him. And this, 
O'Farrell continued, pointing at the fallen picture, is what he evidently did after I left him. You can see the eyes of the portrait have been removed. That is so sure, one of the undergraduates, Mick McGuire, six feet two in his socks, every inch exclaimed, and what is more, I knew all about it. Anderson told me yesterday what he was going to do, and I wanted to join him. But he said I would never get up the chimney. I would stick there. And be dad, I think he was right. At this remark, despite the grimness of the moment, several of those present laughed. Come, come, gentlemen, one of the officials cried. This is no time for levity. Mr. Anderson has been murdered, and the question is, by whom? Then if that's the only thing that is troubling you, O'Farrell put in, I fancy the solution is right here at hand. And he looked significantly at the dean. An ominous silence followed, during which all eyes were fixed on John Kelly, some anxiously, some merely inquiringly, but not a few angrily, for Kelly, as I have said before, had made himself particularly obnoxious just then by his behavior to the rowdier students, and, as has ever been the case at K, these formed no small portion of the community. The dean hardly seemed to realize the situation. The dignity of office blinded him to danger. "'What do you mean?' he spluttered. "'I know nothing of what happened to Mr. Anderson. "'Really, really, O'Farrell, your presumption is preposterous. "'There was no one else in here but you and he, Mr. Kelly,' O'Farrell retorted coolly. "'It's only natural we should think you know something of what happened.' "'On the arrival of the police, who had been sent for somewhat reluctantly, "'for the prestige of the college at that date was very dear to all, "'the premises were thoroughly searched.' and no other culprit being found, first of all Dean Kelly was apprehended, and then, to make a good job of it, his accuser, Dennis O'Farrell. All the college was agog with excitement. No one could believe the dean was a murderer, and it was just as inconceivable to think O'Farrell had committed the deed. And yet, if neither of them had killed Anderson, who in God's name had killed him? The night succeeding the affair, while the dean and O'Farrell were still in jail awaiting the inquest, a party of undergraduates were discussing the situation in McGuire's rooms, when the door burst open, and into their midst, almost breathless with excitement, came a measly bespectacled youth named Brady, Patrick Brady. "'I'm awfully sorry to disturb you fellows,' he stammered, "'but there have been odd noises just outside my room all the evening, and I've just seen a queer kind of dog that vanished, God knows how.' I, I, well, you will call me an ass, of course, but I'm afraid to stay there alone, and that's the long and short of it. Big Cora, McGuire exclaimed, it can't be poor Bob's ghosts already. What sort of noises were they? Noises like laughter, Brady said. Loud peals of horrid laughter. Someone trying to frighten you, one of the undergrads observed, and faith he succeeded. You are twice as white as any sheet. It's ill time mirth anyhow, someone else put in, with Anderson's dead body upstairs. I'm for making an example of the blackguard. And I, and I, the others echoed. A general movement followed, and headed by Brady, the procession moved to the north wing of the college. At that time, be it remembered, a large proportion of K undergrads were in residence. Now it is otherwise. On reaching Brady's rooms, the crowd halted outside and listened. For some time, there was silence and then a laugh, low, monotonous, unmirthful, metallic, coming as it were from some adjacent chamber, and so unnatural, so abhorring, that it held everyone spellbound. It died away in the reverberations of the stone corridor, its echoes seeming to awake a chorus of other laughs hardly less dreadful. Again there was silence, no one daring to express his thoughts. Then, as if by common consent, all turned precipitately into Brady's room and slammed the door. "'That is what I heard,' Brady said. "'What does it mean?' "'Is it the meaning of it you're wanting to know?' McGuire observed. "'Sure, tis the devil, for no one but him could make such a noise. "'I've never heard the like of it before. "'Who has the rooms on either side of you?' "'These?' Brady replied, pointing to the right. "'No one. "'They were vacated at Easter and are being repainted and decorated. "'These on the left—' Dobson, who I happen to know, is at the present moment in County Mayo. He won't be back till next week. Then we can search them, a student called Hartnell intervened. To be sure we can, Brady replied, but I doubt if you'll find anyone. A search was made, and Brady proved to be correct. Not a vestige of anyone was discovered. 
Much mystified, McGuire's party was preparing to depart, when Hartnell, who had taken the keenest interest in the proceedings, suddenly said, "'Who has the rooms over yours, Brady? Sound, as you know, plays curious tricks, and it is just as likely as not that that laugh came from above.' "'Oh, I don't think so,' Brady answered. "'The man overhead is Belton, a very decent sort. He is going in for his final shortly and is sweating fearfully hard at present. We might certainly ask him if he heard the noise.' The students agreeing, Brady led the way upstairs, and in response to their summons, Belton hastily opened the door. He was a typical bookworm, thin, pale, and rather emaciated, but with the pleasant expression in his eyes and mouth that all felt was assuring. Halloa, he exclaimed. It isn't often I'm favored with a surprise party of this sort. Come in. And he pressed them so hard that they felt constrained to accept his hospitality, and before long all were seated round the fire quaffing whiskey and puffing cigars as if they meant to make a night of it. At two o'clock, someone suggested that it was high time they thought of bed, and Belton rose with them. "'Before we turn in, let's have another search,' he said. "'It's strange you should all hear that noise except me, unless, of course, it came from below.' "'But there's nothing under me,' Brady remarked, except the dining hall. "'Then let's search that,' Belton went on. "'We ought to make a thorough job of it now once we've begun.' Besides, I don't relish being in this lonely place with that laugh knocking around any more than you do. He went with them, and they completely overhauled the ground floor, hall, dining room, studies, passages, vestibules, everywhere that was not barred to them. But they were no wiser at the end of their search than at the beginning. There was not the slightest clue as to the author of the laugh. On the morrow, there was a fresh shock. One of the college servants, on entering Mr. McGuire's room to call him, found that gentleman half-dressed and laying on the floor. Terrified beyond measure, the servant bent over him and discovered he was dead, obviously stabbed with the same weapon that had put an end to Bob Anderson. The fact told him at once gave the alarm. Everyone in the college came trooping to the room, and for the second time within three days a general hue and cry was raised. All again to no purpose. The murderer had left no traces as to his identity. However, one thing at least was established, and that was the innocence of Dean Kelly and Dennis O'Farrell. They were both liberated. Then Hartnell, who seems to have been a regular Sherlock Holmes, got to work in grim earnest. On the floor in McGuire's room, he picked up a diminutive silver-topped pencil, which had rolled under the fender and had so escaped observation. He asked several of McGuire's most intimate friends if they remembered seeing the pencil case in McGuire's possession, but they shook their heads. He inquired in other quarters, too, but with no better result, and finally resolved to ask Brady, who belonged to quite a different set from himself. With that object in view, he set off to Brady's room shortly after supper. As there was no response to his raps, he at length opened Brady's door. In front of the hearth, in a big easy chair, sat a figure. "'Brady, by all that's holy!' Hartnell exclaimed, "'By Jupiter, the beggar's asleep. That's what comes of swatting too hard. Brady?' Approaching the chair, he called again, "'Brady!' And getting no reply, patted the figure gently on the back. "'Be jabbers, you sleep soundly, old fellow,' he said. "'How about that?' And he shook him heartily by the shoulder. The instant he let go, the figure collapsed. In order to get a closer view, Hartnell then struck a light with the tinderbox. The flickering of the candle flame fell on Brady's face. It was white, ghastly white. There was no animation in it. The jaw dropped. With a cry of horror, Hartnell sprung back, and as he did so, a great yellow dog dashed across the hearth in front of him, whilst from somewhere close at hand came a laugh, long, low, and satirical. A cold terror gripped Hartnell, and for a moment or so he was on the verge of fainting. However, hearing voices in the quadrangle, he pulled himself together, approached the window on tiptoe, and peering through the glass, perceived to his utmost joy two of his friends directly beneath him. "'I say, you fellows!' he called in low tones. "'Come up here quickly! Brady's rooms! I've seen the phantom dog! There's been another tragedy, and the murderer is close at hand. Come quietly, and we may catch him!' He then retraced his steps to the center of the room and listened. Again there came the laugh subtle, protracted, hellish, and it seemed to him as if it must originate in the room overhead. A noise in the direction of the hearth made him look round. Some loose plaster had fallen, and while he still gazed, more fell. The truth of the whole thing then dawned on him. The murderer was in the chimney! 
Hartnell was a creature of impulse. In the excitement of the moment, he forgot danger, and the dastardly nature of the crimes gave him more than his usual amount of courage. He rushed at the chimney, and regardless of soot and darkness, began an impromptu ascent. Halfway up, something struck him. Once, twice, thrice, sharply, and there was a soft, malevolent chuckle. At this juncture, the two undergraduates arrived in Brady's room. No one was there, nothing save a hunched-up figure on a chair. Hartnell! They whispered. Hartnell! No reply. They called again. Still no reply. Again and again they called, until at length, through sheer fatigue, they desisted, and seized with a sudden panic, fled precipitately down the stairs and out into the quadrangle. Once more the alarm was given, and once again the whole college, well with excitement, hastened to the scene of the outrage. This time there was a double mystery. Brady had been murdered. Hartnell had disappeared. The police were summoned and the whole building ransacked, but no one thought of the chimney till the search was nearly over, and half the throng, overcome with fatigue, had retired. O'Farrell was the discoverer. Happening to glance at the hearth, he saw something drop. "'For heaven's sake, you fellows!' he shouted. "'Look! Blood! You may take it from me, there's a corpse in the chimney!' A dozen candles invaded the hearth, and a Herculean policeman undertook the ascent. In breathless silence, the crowd below waited, and after a few seconds of intense suspense, two helpless legs appeared on the hob. Bit by bit, the rest of the body followed, until at length the whole figure of Hartnell, black, bleeding, and blood-stained, was disclosed to view. At first it was thought that he was dead, but the surgeon, who had hurried to the scene pronouncing him still alive, there arose a tremendous cheer. The murder had at all events been foiled this time. Begora, cried O'Farrell, Hartnell was going after the murderer when he was struck, and sure I'll be after him the same way myself. And before anyone could prevent him, O'Farrell was up the chimney. Up, 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 until he found himself going down, down, down. And then, bedad, he stepped right out onto the floor of Belton's room. Halloa, the latter exclaimed, looking not a bit disconcerted. That's a curious mode of making your entrance into my domain. Why didn't you come by the door? Because, O'Farrell replied, pointing to a patch of soot near the washstand, I followed you. Own up, Dickie Belton. You're the culprit. You did for them all. And Belton laughed. Yes, it was true, overwork had turned Belton's brain, and he was subsequently sent to a criminal lunatic asylum for the rest of his life. But there were moments when he was comparatively sane, and in these interims he confessed everything. Anderson had told him that he was going to hoax the dean, and filled with indignation at the idea of such a trick being played on a college official, for he, Belton, was a great favorite with the Beaks. He had accompanied Anderson on the plea of helping him intending, in reality, to frustrate him. It was not till he was in the chimney, crouching behind Anderson, that the thought of killing his fellow students had entered his mind. The heat of his hiding place, acting on an already overworked brain, hastened on the madness, and his fingers, closing on a clasped knife in one of his pockets, inspired him with a desire to kill. The work once begun, he had argued with himself, would have to be continued, and he had then and there decided that all unruly graduates should be exterminated. With what measure of success this determination was carried out need not be recapitulated here, but with regard to the phantom dog, a few words may be added. Since it appeared immediately before the committal of each of the three murders I have just recorded, it was seen by Mr. Kelly before the death of Bob Anderson, by Brady before the murder of McGuire, and by Hartnell before Brady was murdered, I think there can neither be doubts as to its existence, nor as to the purport of its visits. Moreover, its latest appearance in the university, reported to me quite recently, preceded a serious outbreak of fire. End of The Yellow Dog of K University From Animal Ghosts by Elliot O'Donnell The Eyes of the Panther by Ambrose Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Eyes of the Panther by Ambrose Beers. 
1. One does not always marry when insane. A man and a woman, nature had done the grouping, sat on a rustic seat in the late afternoon. The man was middle-aged, slender, swarthy, with the expression of a poet and the complexion of a pirate, a man at whom one would look again. The woman was young, blonde, graceful, with something in her figure and movements suggesting the word lithe. She was habited in a grey gown with odd brown markings in the texture. She may have been beautiful, one could not readily say, for her eyes denied attention to all else. They were grey-green, long and narrow, with an expression defying analysis. One could only know that they were disquieting. Cleopatra may have had such eyes. The man and the woman talked. Yes, said the woman. I love you, God knows, but marry you. No, I cannot, will not. Irene, you have said that many times, yet always have denied me a reason. I have a right to know, to understand, to feel and prove my fortitude if I have it. Give me a reason for loving you. The woman was smiling through her tears and her pallor. That did not stir any sense of humour in the man. No, there is no reason for that. A reason for not marrying me. I've a right to know. I must know. I will know. He had risen and was standing before her with clenched hands, on his face a frown. It might have been called a scowl. He looked as if he might attempt to learn by strangling her. She smiled no more, merely sat looking up into his face with a fixed set regard that was utterly without emotion or sentiment. Yet it had something in it that tamed his resentment and made him shiver. You are determined to have my reason? She asked in a tone that was entirely mechanical. A tone that might have been her look made audible. If you please, if I'm not asking too much. Apparently, this lord of creation was yielding some part of his dominion over his co-creature. Very well, you shall know. I am insane. The man started then looked incredulous, and was conscious that he ought to be amused. But again, the sense of humour failed him in his need, and despite his disbelief, he was profoundly disturbed by that which he did not believe. Between our convictions and our feelings, there is no good understanding. That is what the physicians would say, the woman continued. If they knew... I might myself prefer to call it a case of possession. Sit down and hear what I have to say. The man silently resumed his seat beside her on the rustic bench by the wayside. Over against them on the eastern side of the valley, the hills were already sunset flushed, and the stillness all about was of that peculiar quality that foretells the twilight. Something of its mysterious and significant solemnity had imparted itself to the man's mood. In the spiritual, as in the material world, are signs and presages of night, rarely meeting her look, and whenever he did so, conscious of the indefinable dread with which, despite their feline beauty, her eyes always affected him. Jenna Braiding listened in silence to the story told by Irene Marlowe, in deference to the reader's possible prejudice against the artless method of an unpractised historian, the author ventures to substitute his own version for hers. 2. A room may be too narrow for three, though one is outside. In a little log house containing a single room, sparely and rudely furnished, crouching on the floor against one of the walls was a woman, clasping to her breast a child. Outside, a dense, unbroken forest extended for many miles in every direction. This was at night, and the room was black-dark. No human eye could have discerned the woman and the child. 
yet they were observed narrowly vigilantly with never even a momentary slackening of attention and that is the pivotal fact upon which this narrative turns charles marlowe was of the class now extinct in this country of woodman pioneers men who found their most acceptable surroundings in sylvan solitudes that stretched along the eastern slope of the mississippi valley from the great lakes to the gulf of mexico for more than a hundred years these men pushed ever westward generation after generation with rifle and axe reclaiming from nature and her savage children here and there an isolated acreage for the plough no sooner reclaimed than surrendered to their less venturesome but more thrifty successors at last they burst through the edge of the forest into the open country and vanished as if they had fallen over a cliff the woodman pioneer is no more the pioneer of the plains he whose easy task it was to subdue for occupancy two-thirds of the country in a single generation is another and inferior creation with charles marlowe in the wilderness sharing the dangers hardships and privations of that strange unprofitable life were his wife and child to whom in the manner of his class in which the domestic virtues were a religion he was passionately attached the woman was still young enough to be comely new enough to the awful isolation of her lot to be cheerful by withholding the large capacity for happiness which the simple satisfactions of the forest life could not have filled heaven had dealt honourably with her in her light household tasks her child her husband and her few foolish books she found abundant provisions for her need one morning in midsummer marlowe took down his rifle from the wooden hooks on the wall and signified his intention of getting game we've meat enough said his wife please don't go outside today i dreamed last night oh such a dreadful thing i cannot recollect it but i am almost sure that it will come to pass if you go out it is painful to confess that marlowe received this solemn statement with less of gravity than was due to the mysterious nature of the calamity foreshadowed in truth he laughed try to remember he said maybe you dreamed that baby had lost the power of speech the conjecture was obviously suggested by the fact that baby clinging to the fringe of his hunting coat with all her ten pudgy thumbs was at that moment uttering her sense of the situation in a series of exultant goo-goos inspired by sight of her father's raccoon skin cap the woman yielded lacking the gift of humour she could not hold out against his kindly badinage so with a kiss for the mother and a kiss for the child he left the house and closed the door upon his happiness for ever at nightfall he had not returned the woman prepared supper and waited then she put baby to bed and sang softly to her until she slept by this time the fire on the hearth at which she had cooked supper had burned out and the room was lighted by a single candle this she afterward placed in the open window as a sign and welcome to the hunter if he should approach from that side she had thoughtfully closed and barred the door against such wild animals as might prefer it to an open window of the habits of beasts of prey in entering a house uninvited she was not advised though with true female prevision she may have considered the possibility of their entrance by way of the chimney as the night wore on she became not less anxious but more drowsy and at last rested her arms upon the bed by the child and her head upon the arms the candle in the window burned down to the socket sputtered and flared a moment and went out unobserved for the woman slept and dreamed in her dreams she sat beside the cradle of a second child the first one was dead the father was dead the home in the forest was lost and the dwelling in which she lived was unfamiliar there were heavy oaken doors always closed and outside the windows fastened into the thick stone walls were iron bars obviously so she thought a provision against indians all this she noted with an infinite self-pity 
but without surprise, an emotion unknown in dreams. The child in the cradle was invisible under its coverlet which something impelled her to remove. She did so, disclosing the face of a wild animal. In the shock of this dreadful revelation the dreamer awoke, trembling in the darkness of her cabin in the wood. As a sense of her actual surroundings came slowly back to her, she felt for the child that was not a dream, and assured herself by its breathing that all was well with it. Nor could she forbear to pass a hand lightly across its face. Then, moved by some impulse for which she probably could not have accounted, she rose and took the sleeping babe in her arms, holding it close against her breast. The head of the child's cot was against the wall to which the woman now turned her back as she stood. Lifting her eyes, she saw two bright objects tearing the darkness with a reddish-green glow. She took them to be two coals on the hearth, but with her returning sense of direction came the disquieting consciousness that they were not in that quarter of the room, moreover were too high, being nearly at the level of the eyes of her own eyes for these were the eyes of a panther. The beast was at the open window, directly opposite and not five paces away. Nothing but those terrible eyes was visible. But in the dreadful tumult of her feelings, as the situation disclosed itself to her understanding, she somehow knew that the animal was standing on its hinder feet, supporting itself with its paws on the window ledge. That signified a malign interest, not the mere gratification of an indolent curiosity. The consciousness of the attitude was an added horror, accentuating the menace of those awful eyes, in whose steadfast fire her strength and courage were alike consumed. Under their silent questioning she shuddered and turned sick. Her knees failed her, and by degrees, Instinctively striving to avoid a sudden movement that might bring the beast upon her, she sank to the floor, crouched against the wall, and tried to shield the babe with her trembling body, without withdrawing her gaze from the luminous orbs that were killing her. No thought of her husband came to her in her agony, no hope nor suggestion of rescue or escape. Her capacity for thought and feeling had narrowed to the dimensions of a single emotion, fear of the animal's spring, of the impact of its body, the buffeting of its great arms, the feel of its teeth in her throat, the mangling of her babe. Motionless now and in absolute silence she waited her doom, the moments growing to hours, to years, to ages, and still those devilish eyes maintained their watch. Returning to his cabin late at night with a deer on his shoulders, Charles Marlowe tried the door. It did not yield. He knocked. There was no answer. He laid down his deer and went round to the window. As he turned the angle of the building he fancied he heard a sound as of stealthy footfalls and a rustling in the undergrowth of the forest. But they were too slight for certainty, even to his practised ear. Approaching the window and to his surprise finding it open, he threw his leg over the sill and entered. All was darkness and silence. He groped his way to the fireplace, struck a match, and lit a candle. Then he looked about. Cowering on the floor against a wall was his wife, clasping his child. As he sprang toward her, she rose and broke into laughter, long, loud, and mechanical, devoid of gladness and devoid of sense the laughter that is not out of keeping with the clanking of a chain. Hardly knowing what he did, he extended his arms. She laid the babe in them. It was dead, pressed to death in its mother's embrace. 3. The Theory of the Defense That is what occurred during a night in a forest. But not all of it did Irene Marlowe relate to Jenna Braiding. Not all of it was known to her. When she had concluded, the sun was below the horizon and the long summer twilight had begun to deepen in the hollows of the land. For some moments Braiding was silent, expecting the narrative to be carried forward to some definite connection with the conversation introducing it. But the narrator was as silent as he, her face averted, her hands clasping and unclasping themselves as they lay in her lap, 
with a singular suggestion of an activity independent of her will. "'It is a sad, a terrible story,' said Braiding at last. "'But I do not understand. "'You call Charles Marlowe father, that I know. "'That he is, old before his time, "'broken by some great sorrow I have seen or thought I saw. "'But pardon me, you said that you, that you, "'that I am insane?' said the girl without a movement of head or body. But, Irene, you say, please, dear, do not look away from me. You say that the child was dead, not demented. Yes, that one. I am the second. I was born three months after that night, my mother being mercifully permitted to lay down her life in giving me mine. Braiding was again silent. He was a trifle dazed and could not at once think of the right thing to say. Her face was still turned away. In his embarrassment, he reached impulsively towards the hands that lay closing and unclosing in her lap. But something, he could not have said what, restrained him. He then remembered vaguely that he had never altogether cared to take her hand. It is likely, she resumed, that a person born under such circumstances is like others, is what you call sane. Braiding did not reply. He was preoccupied with a new thought that was taking shape in his mind, what a scientist would have called an hypothesis, a detective, a theory. It might throw an added light, albeit a lurid one, upon such doubt of her sanity as her own assertion had not dispelled. The country was still new, and outside the villages sparsely populated. The professional hunter was still a familiar figure, and among his trophies were heads and pelts of the larger kind of game. Tales variously credible of nocturnal meetings with savage animals in lonely roads were sometimes current, passed through the customary stages of growth and decay, and were forgotten. A recent addition to these popular apocrypha, originating apparently by spontaneous generation in several households, was of a panther which had frightened some of their members by looking in at windows by night. The yarn had caused its little ripple of excitement, had even attained to the distinction of a place in the local newspaper. But Braiding had given it no attention. Its likeness to the story to which he had just listened now impressed him as perhaps more than accidental. Was it not possible that the one story had suggested the other, that finding congenial conditions in a morbid mind and a fertile fancy, it had grown to the tragic tale that he had heard? Braiding recalled such circumstances of the girl's history and disposition, of which, with love's incuriosity, he had hitherto been heedless, such as her solitary life with her father, at whose house no one, apparently, was an acceptable visitor, and her strange fear of the night, by which those who knew her best accounted for her, never being seen after dark. Surely, in such a mind, imagination once kindled might burn with a lawless flame, penetrating and enveloping the entire structure. That she was mad, though the conviction gave him the acutest pain, he could no longer doubt. She had only mistaken an effect of her mental disorder for its cause, bringing into imaginary relation with her own personality the vagaries of the local mitmakers. With some vague intention of testing his new theory, and no definite notion of how to set about it, he said, gravely but with hesitation, Irene. Dear, tell me, I beg you will not take offence, but tell me. I have told you, she interrupted, speaking with a passionate earnestness that he had not known her to show. I have already told you that we cannot marry. Is anything else worth saying? Before he could stop her, she had sprung from her seat and without another word or look was gliding away among the trees toward her father's house. Braiding had risen to detain her. He stood watching her in silence until she had vanished in the gloom. Suddenly he started as if he had been shot. His face took on an expression of amazement and alarm. In one of the black shadows into which she had disappeared, 
he had caught a quick, brief glimpse of shining eyes. For an instant he was dazed and irresolute. Then he dashed into the wood after her, shouting, Irene! Irene, look out! The panther! The panther! In a moment he had passed through the fringe of forest into open ground, and saw the girl's grey skirt vanishing into her father's door. No panther was visible. 4. An Appeal to the Conscience of God Jenna Brading, attorney at law, lived in a cottage at the edge of the town. Directly behind the dwelling was the forest. Being a bachelor and therefore by the draconian moral code of the time and place denied the services of the only species of domestic servant known thereabout, the hired girl, he boarded at the village hotel, where also was his office. The woodside cottage was merely a lodging maintained at no great cost, to be sure, as an evidence of prosperity and respectability. It would hardly do for one to whom the local newspaper had pointed with pride as the foremost jurist of his time to be homeless, albeit he may sometimes have suspected that the words home and house were not strictly synonymous. Indeed, his consciousness of the disparity and his will to harmonize it were matters of logical inference, for it was generally reported that soon after the cottage was built its owner had made a futile venture in the direction of marriage, had in truth gone so far as to be rejected by the beautiful but eccentric daughter of old man Marlowe, the recluse. This was publicly believed because he had told it himself, and she had not a reversal of the usual order of things which could hardly fail to carry conviction. Brading's bedroom was at the rear of the house, with a single window facing the forest. One night he was awakened by a noise at that window. He could hardly have said what it was like. With a little thrill of the nerves he sat up in bed and laid hold of the revolver which, with a forethought most commendable in one addicted to the habit of sleeping on the ground floor with an open window, he had put under his pillow. The room was in absolute darkness, but being unterrified he knew where to direct his eyes, and there he held them, awaiting in silence what further might occur. He could now dimly discern the aperture, a square of lighter black. Presently there appeared at its lower edge two gleaming eyes that burned with a malignant luster inexpressibly terrible. Braiding's heart gave a great jump, then seemed to stand still. A chill passed along his spine and through his hair. He felt the blood forsake his cheeks. He could not have cried out not to save his life. But being a man of courage, he would not, to save his life, have done so if he had been able. Some trepidation his coward body might feel, but his spirit was of sterner stuff. Slowly the shining eyes rose with a steady motion that seemed an approach and slowly rose Brading's right hand holding the pistol. He fired. Blinded by the flash and stunned by the report, Brading nevertheless heard, or fancied that he heard, the wild high scream of the panther, so human in sound, so devilish in suggestion. Leaping from the bed, he hastily clothed himself and, pistol in hand, sprang from the door, meeting two or three men who came running up from the road. A brief explanation was followed by a cautious search of the house. The grass was wet with dew. Beneath the window it had been trodden and partly leveled for a wide space, from which a devious trail, visible in the light of a lantern, led away into the bushes. One of the men stumbled and fell upon his hands, which as he rose and rubbed them together were slippery. On examination they were seen to be red with blood. An encounter, unarmed with a wounded panther, was not agreeable to their taste. All but Braiding turned back. He, with lantern and pistol, pushed courageously forward into the wood. Passing through a difficult undergrowth, he came into a small opening, and there his courage had its reward. There he found the body of his victim. But it was no panther. What it was is told, even to this day, upon a weather-worn headstone in the village churchyard, and for many years 
was attested daily at the graveside by the bent figure and sorrow-seamed face of old man Marlowe, to whose soul, and to the soul of his strange and happy child, peace, peace and reparation. End of The Eyes of the Panther by Ambrose Beers Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Ghost in Love by Unknown Translated by Georges Solier This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Ghost in Love by Unknown Translated by Georges Solier On the fifteenth day of the first moon, in the second year of the period of renewed principles, the streets of the town of the eastern lake were thronged with people who were strolling about. At the setting of the sun, every shop was brightly lit up. Processions of people moved hither and thither. Strings of boys were carrying lanterns of every form and color. Whole families passed, every member of whom, young or old, small or big, was holding at the end of a thin bamboo the lighted image of a bird, an animal, or a flower. Richer ones, several together, were carrying enormous dragons whose luminous wings waved at every motion and whose glaring eyes rolled from right to left. It was the fate of the lanterns. A young man, clothed in a long, pale, green dress, allowed himself to be pushed about by the crowd. The passers-by bowed to him. How is my Lord Lee the peaceful? The humble student thanks you. And you, how are you? Very well, thanks to your happy influence. Does the precious student soon pass his second literary examination? In two months ignorant that i am i am idling instead of working the fate was drawing to a close when the peaceful quitted the main street and went towards the east gate where the house was to be found in which he lived alone he went farther and farther the moving lights were rarer ere long he only saw before him the fire of a white lantern decorated with two red peonies the paper globe was swinging to the steps of a tiny girl, clothed in the blue linen that only slaves wore. The light, behind, showed the elegant silhouette of another woman, this one covered with a long jacket made in a rich pink silk edged with purple. As the student drew nearer, the belated walker turned round, showing an oval face and big long eyes wherein shone a bright speck, cruel and mysterious. Lee, the peaceful, slackened his pace. Following the two strangers, whose small feet glided silently on the shining flagstones of the street, he was asking himself how he could begin a conversation, when the mistress turned round again, softly smiled, and in a low, rich voice said to him, is it not strange that in the advancing night we are following the same road? I owe it to the favor of heaven, he at once replied, for I am returning to the east gate. Otherwise, I should never have dared to follow you. The conversation, once begun, continued as they walked side by side. The student learned that the pretty walker was called Double Peony, that she was the daughter of Judge Sue, that she lived out of the city in a garden planted with big trees on the road to the lake. On arriving at his house, the peaceful insisted that his new friend should enter and take a cup of tea. She hesitated. Then the two young people pushed the door, crossed the small yard bordered right and left with walls covered with tiles, 
and disappeared in the house. The servant remained under the portal. Daylight was breaking when the young girl came out again, calling the servant, who was asleep. The next evening she came again, always accompanied by the slave bearing the white lantern with two red peonies. It was the same each day following. A neighbor who had watched these nocturnal visits was inquisitive enough to climb the wall which separated his yard from that of the lovers, and to wait, hidden, in the shade of the house. At the accustomed hour, the street door, left ajar, opened to let in the visitors. Once in the courtyard, they were suddenly transformed. Their eyes became flaming and red, their faces grew pale, their teeth seemed to lengthen. An icy mist escaped from their lips. The neighbor did not see any more. Terrified, he let himself slide to the ground and ran to his inner room. The next morning, he went to the student and told him what he had seen. The lover was paralyzed with fear. In order to reassure himself, he resolved to find out everything he could about his mistress. He at once went outside the ramparts, on the road to the lake, hoping to find the house of Judge Sue, but at the place he had been told of there was no habitation. On the left, a fallow plain, sown with tombs, went up to the hills. On the right, cultivated fields extended as far as the lake. However, a small temple was hidden there under big trees. The student had given up all hope. He entered, notwithstanding, into the sacred enclosure, knowing that travelers stayed there sometimes for several weeks. In the first yard, a bond was passing in his red dress and shaven head. He stopped him. Do you know Judge Sue? He has a daughter. Judge Sue's daughter? asked the priest, astonished. Well, yes, but wait, I will show her to you. The peaceful felt his heart overflowing with joy. His beloved was living. He was going to see her by the light of day. He quickly followed his companion. Passing the first court, they crossed the threshold and found themselves in a yard planted with high pine trees and bordered by a low pavilion. The bonds, passing in first, pushed the door and, turning round, said, Here is Judge Sue's daughter. The others stopped, terrified. On a trestle, a heavy black lacquered coffin bore this inscription in golden letters. Coffin of Double Peony, Judge Sue's daughter. On the wall was an unfolded painting representing the little maid. A white lantern decorated with two red peonies was hung over it. Yes, she has been there for the last two years. Her parents, according to the right, are waiting for a favorable day to bury her. The student silently turned on his heel and went back, not deigning to reply to the mocking bow of the priest. Evening arrived. He locked himself in, and covering his head with his blankets, he waited. Sleep came to him only at daybreak. But he could not cease to think of her, whom he no longer saw. His heart beat as if to burst. When, in the street, he perceived the silhouette of a woman which reminded him of his friend. At last he was incapable of containing himself any longer. One evening he stationed himself behind the door. After a few minutes there was a knock. He opened the door. It was only the little maid. My mistress is in tears. Why do you never open the door? I come every evening. If you will follow me, perhaps she will forgive you. The peaceful, blinded by love, started at once, walking by the light of the white lantern. The next day, the neighbors, seeing that the student's door was open, and that his house was empty, made a declaration to the governor of the town. The police made an inquest. They collected the evidence of several people who had been watching the nightly visitors the student had received. The bonds of the temple outside the city walls came to say what he knew. 
The chief of the police went to the road leading to the lake. He crossed the threshold of the little edifice, passed the first yard, and at last opened the door of the pavilion. Everything was in order, but under the lid of the heavy coffin one could see the corner of the long green dress of the student. In order to do away with evil influences, there was a solemn funeral. Ever since this time, on light, clear nights, the passers-by often meet the two lovers, entwined together, slowly walking on the road which leads to the lake. End of The Ghost in Love by Unknown Translated by George Soyer The Vacant Lot by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. The Vacant Lot by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. When it became generally known in Townsend Center that the Townsends were going to move to the city, there was great excitement and dismay. For the Townsends to move was about the equivalent to the town's moving. The Townsend ancestors had founded the village a hundred years ago. The first Townsend had kept a wayside hostelry for man and beast, known as the Sign of the Leopard. The signboard, on which the leopard was painted a bright blue, was still extant, and prominently so, being nailed over the present Townsend's front door. This Townsend, by name of David, kept the village store. There had been no tavern since the railroad was built through Townsend Center in his father's day. Therefore, the family, being ousted by the march of progress from their chosen employment, took up with a general country store as being the next thing to a country tavern, the principal difference consisting in the fact that all the guests were transients, never requiring bedchambers, securing their rest on the tops of sugar and flour barrels and codfish boxes, and the refreshment from stray nibblings at the stock and trade, to the profitless deplenishment of raisins and loaf sugar and crackers and cheese. The flitting of the Townsends from the home of their ancestors was due to a sudden access of wealth from the death of a relative and the desire of Mrs. Townsend to secure better advantages for her son, George, sixteen years old, in the way of education, and for her daughter, Adriana, ten years older, better matrimonial opportunities. However, this last inducement for leaving Townsend Center was not openly stated, only ingeniously surmised by the neighbors. Sarah Townsend don't think there's anybody in Townsend Center fit for her Adriana to marry, and so she's going to take her to Boston to see if she can't pick up somebody there, they said. Then they wondered what Abel Lyons would do. He had been a humble suitor for Adriana for years, but her mother had not approved, and Adriana, who was dutiful, had repulsed him delicately and rather sadly. He was the only lover whom she had ever had, and she felt sorry and grateful. She was a plain, awkward girl, and had a patient recognition of the fact. But her mother was ambitious, more so than her father, who was rather pugnaciously satisfied with what he had, and not easily disposed to change. However, he yielded to his wife and consented to sell out his business and purchase a house in Boston and move there. David Townsend was curiously unlike the line of ancestors from whom he had come. He had either retrograded or advanced, as one might look at it. His moral character was certainly better, but he had not the fiery spirit and eager grasp at advantage which had distinguished them. Indeed, the old Townsends, though prominent and respected as men of property and influence, had reputations not above suspicions. There was more than one dark whisper regarding them, handed down from mother to son in the village, and especially was this true of the first Townsend. 
he who built the tavern bearing the sign of the blue leopard his portrait a hideous effort of contemporary art hung in the garret of david townsend's home there was many a tale of wild roistering if no worse in that old roadhouse and high stakes and quarrelling in cups and blows and money gotten in evil fashion and the matter hushed up with a high hand for inquirers by the imperious townsends who terrorized everybody david townsend terrorized nobody he had gotten his little competence from his store by honest methods the exchanging of sterling goods and true weights for country produce and country shillings he was sober and reliable with intense self-respect and a decided talent for the management of money it was principally for this reason that he took great delight in his sudden wealth by legacy he had thereby greater opportunities for the exercise of his native shrewdness in a bargain this he evinced in his purchase of a house in boston one day in spring the old townsend house was shut up the blue leopard was taken carefully down from his lair over the front door the family chattels were loaded on the train and the townsends departed it was a sad and eventful day for townsend center a man from bar had rented the store david had decided at the last not to sell and the old familiars congregated in melancholy fashion and talked over the situation an enormous pride over their departed townsmen became evident they paraded him flaunting him like a banner in the eyes of the new man david is awful smart they said there won't nobody get the better of him in the city if he has lived in townsend center all his life he's got his eyes open nobody paid for his house in boston well sir that house cost twenty five thousand dollars and david he bought it for five yes sir he did must have been some out about it remarked the new man scowling over his counter he was beginning to feel his disparaging situation not an out sir david he made sure um catch him getting bit everything was in apple pie order hot and cold water and all and in one of the best locations of the city real high up street david he said the rent in that street was never under a thousand yes sir david he got a bargain five thousand dollars for a twenty five thousand dollar house some out about it growled the new man over the corner however as his fellow townsmen and allies stated there seemed to be no doubt about the desirableness of the city house which david townsend had purchased and the fact that he had secured it for an absurdly low price the whole family were at first suspicious it was ascertained that the house had cost a round sum only a few years ago it was in perfect repair nothing whatever was amiss with plumbing furnace anything there was not even a soap factory within smelling distance as mrs townsend had vaguely surmised she was sure that she had heard of houses being undesirable for such reasons but there was no soap factory they all sniffed and peeked when the first rainfall came they looked at the ceiling confidently expecting to see dark spots where the leaks had commenced but there were none they were forced to confess that their suspicions were allayed that the house was perfect even overshadowed with the mystery of a lower price than it was worth that however was an additional perfection in the opinion of the townsends who had their share of new england thrift they had lived just one month in their new house and were happy although at times somewhat lonely from missing the society of townsend center when the trouble began the townsends although they lived in a fine house in a genteel almost fashionable part of the city were true to their antecedents and kept as they had been accustomed only one maid she was the daughter of a farmer on the outskirts of their native village was middle-aged and had lived with them for the last ten years one pleasant monday morning she rose early and did the family washing before breakfast which had been prepared by Mrs. Townsend and Adriana, as was their habit on washing days. 
the family were seated at the breakfast table in their basement dining room and this maid whose name was cordelia was hanging out the clothes in the vacant lot this vacant lot seemed a valuable one being on a corner it was rather singular that it had not been built upon the townsends had wondered at it and agreed that they would have preferred their own house to be there they had however utilized it as far as possible with their innocent rural disregard of property rights in unoccupied land we might just as well hang out our washing in that vacant lot mrs townsend had told cordelia the first monday of their stay in the house our little yard ain't half big enough for all our clothes and it is sunnier there too so cordelia had hung out the wash there for four mondays and this was the fifth the breakfast was about half finished they had reached the buckwheat cakes when this maid came rushing into the dining room and stood regarding them speechless with a countenance indicative of the utmost horror she was deadly pale her hands sodden with soap sets hung twitching at her sides in the folds of her calico gown her very hair which was light and sparse seemed to bristle with fear all the townsends turned and looked at her david and george rose with a half-defined idea of burglars cordelia battles what is the matter cried mrs townsend adriana gasped for breath and turned as white as the maid what is the matter repeated mrs townsend but the maid was unable to speak mrs townsend who could be peremptory sprang up ran to the frightened woman and shook her violently cordelia battles you speak said she and not stand there staring that way as if you were struck dumb what is the matter with you then cordelia spoke in a fainting voice there's somebody else hanging out clothes in the vacant lot she gasped and clutched at a chair for support who cried mrs townsend rousing to indignation for already she had assumed a proprietorship in the vacant lot is it the folks in the next house i'd like to know what right they have we are next to that vacant lot i dunno who it is gasped cordelia why we've seen that girl next door go to mass every morning said mrs townsend she's got a fiery red head seems as if you might know her by this time cordelia it ain't that girl gasped cordelia then she added in a horror-stricken voice i couldn't see who twas they all stared why couldn't you see demanded her mistress are you struck blind no ma'am then why couldn't you see all i could see was cordelia hesitated with an expression of the utmost horror go on said mrs townsend impatiently all i could see was the shadow of somebody very slim hanging out the clothes and what i could see the shadows of the things flapping on their line you couldn't see the clothes only the shadow on the ground what kind of clothes were they queer replied cordelia with a shudder if i didn't know you so well i should think you had been drinking said mrs townsend now cordelia battles i'm going out in that vacant lot and see myself what you're talking about i can't go gasped the woman with that mrs townsend and all the others except adriana who remained to tremble with the maid sallied forth into the vacant lot they had to go out the area gate into the street to reach it it was nothing unusual in the way of vacant lots one large poplar tree the relic of the old forest which had once flourished there twinkled in one corner for the rest it was overgrown with coarse weeds and a few dusty flowers the townsends stood just inside the rude board fence which divided the lot from the street and stared with wonder and horror for cordelia had told the truth 
they all saw what she had described, the shadow of an exceedingly slim woman moving along the ground with upstretched arms, the shadows of strange, nondescript garments flapping from a shadowy line. But when they looked up for the substance of the shadows, nothing was to be seen except the clear, blue October air. "'My goodness!' gasped Mrs. Townsend. Her face assumed a strange gathering of wrath in the midst of her terror. Suddenly she made a determined move forward, although her husband strove to hold her back. "'You let me be,' said she. She moved forward. Then she recoiled and gave a loud shriek. "'The wet sheet flapped in my face!' she cried. "'Take me away! Take me away!' Then she fainted. Between them they got her back to the house. It was awful, she moaned when she came to herself with the family all around her where she lay on the dining room floor. Oh, David, what do you suppose it is? Nothing at all, replied David Townsend stoutly. He was remarkable for courage and staunch belief in actualities. He was now denying to himself that he had seen anything unusual. Oh, there was, moaned his wife. I saw something, said George, in a sullen, boyish bass. The maid sobbed convulsively, and so did Adriana for sympathy. We won't talk any about it, said David. Here, Jane, you drink this hot tea. It will do you good. And Cordelia, you hang out the clothes in our own yard. George, you go and put up the line for her. The line is out there said George, with a jerk of his shoulder. Are you afraid? No, I ain't, replied the boy resentfully, and went out with a pale face. After that, Cordelia hung the Townsend wash in the yard of their own house, standing always with her back to the vacant lot. As for David Townsend, he spent a good deal of his time in the lot, watching the shadows, but he came to no explanation, although he strove to satisfy himself with many. I guess the shadows come from the smoke, from our chimneys, or else the poplar tree, he said. Why did the shadows come on Monday mornings and no other, demanded his wife. David was silent. Very soon new mysteries arose. One day Cordelia rang the dinner bell at their usual dinner hour, the same as in Townsend Center, high noon, and the family assembled. With amazement, Adriana looked at the dishes on the table. Why, that's queer, she said. What's queer? asked her mother. Cordelia stopped short as she was about setting a tumbler of water beside a plate, and the water slopped over. Why, said Adriana, her face paling, I thought there was boiled dinner. I smelled cabbage cooking. I knew there would something else come up, gasped Cordelia, leaning hard on the back of Adriana's chair. "'What do you mean?' asked Mrs. Townsend sharply, but her own face began to assume the shocked pallor which it was so easy nowadays for all their faces to assume at the merest suggestion of anything out of the common. "'I smelt cabbage cooking all the morning up in my room,' Adriana said faintly, "'and here's codfish and potatoes for dinner.' The Townsends all looked at one another. David rose with an exclamation and rushed out of the room. The others waited tremblingly. When he came back, his face was lowering. "'What did you?' Mrs. Townsend asked hesitatingly. "'There's some smell of cabbage out there,' he admitted reluctantly. Then he looked at her with a challenge. "'He comes from the next house,' he said. "'Blows over our house.' Our house is higher. I don't care. You can never account for such things. Cordelia, said Mrs. Townsend, you go over to the next house and you ask if they've got cabbage for dinner. Cordelia switched out of the room, her mouth set hard. She came back promptly. Says they never have cabbage, she announced with gloomy triumph and a conclusive glance at Mr. Townsend. Their girl was real sassy. 
Oh, father, let's move away. Let's sell the house, cried Adriana in a panic-stricken tone. If you think I'm going to sell a house that I got as cheap as this one because we smell cabbage in a vacant lot, you're mistaken, replied David firmly. It isn't the cabbage alone, said Mrs. Townsend. And a few shadows, added David. I am tired of such nonsense. I thought you had more sense, Jane. One of the boys at school asked me if we lived in the house next to the vacant lot on Well Street and whistled when I said yes, remarked George. Let him whistle, said Mr. Townsend. After a few hours, the family, stimulated by Mr. Townsend's calm, common sense, agreed that it was exceedingly foolish to be disturbed by a mysterious odor of cabbage. They even laughed at themselves. I suppose we have got so nervous over those shadows hanging out clothes that we notice every little thing, conceded Mrs. Townsend. You will find out some day that that is no more to be regarded than the cabbage, said her husband. You can't account for that wet sheet hitting my face, said Mrs. Townsend, doubtfully. You imagined it. I felt it. That afternoon, things went on as usual in the household until nearly four o'clock. Adriana went downtown to do some shopping. Mrs. Townsend sat sewing beside the bay window in her room, which was a front one in the third story. George had not got home. Mr. Townsend was writing a letter in the library. Cordelia was busy in the basement. The twilight, which was coming earlier and earlier every night, was beginning to gather, when suddenly there was a loud crash which shook the house from its foundations. Even the dishes on the sideboard rattled, and the glasses rang like bells. The pictures on the walls of Mrs. Townsend's room swung out from the walls. But that was not all. Every looking-glass in the house cracked simultaneously, as nearly as they could judge, from top to bottom, then shivered into fragments over the floors. Mrs. Townsend was too frightened to scream. She sat huddled in her chair, gasping for breath, her eyes rolling from side to side in incredulous terror, turned toward the street. She saw a great black group of people crossing it, just in front of the vacant lot. There was something inexpressibly strange and gloomy about this moving group. There was an effect of sweeping, wavings and foldings of sable draperies, and gleams of deadly white faces. Then they passed. She twisted her head to see, and they disappeared in the vacant lot. Mr. Townsend came hurrying into the room. He was pale, and looked at once angry and alarmed. "'Did you fall?' he asked inconsequently, as if his wife, who was small, could have reduced such a manifestation by a fall. "'Oh, David, what is it?' whispered Mrs. Townsend. "'Darned if I know,' said David. "'Don't swear. It's too awful. Oh, see the looking-glass, David.' "'I see it. The one over the library mantel is broken, too. Oh, it is a sign of death. Cordelia's feet were hurt as she staggered on the stairs. She almost fell into the room. She reeled over to Mr. Townsend and clutched his arm. He cast a sidewise glance, half furious, half commiserating, at her. Well, what is it all about? he asked. I don't know. What is it? Oh, what is it? The looking-glass in the kitchen is broken, all over the floor. Oh, oh, what is it? I don't know any more than you do. I didn't do it. Looking-glass is broken is a sign of death in the house, said Cordelia. If it's me, I hope I'm ready. But I'd rather die than be so scared as I've been lately. Mr. Townsend shook himself loose and eyed the two trembling women with gathering resolution. Now look here. Both of you, he said, this is nonsense. You'll die sure enough of fright if you keep on this way. I was a fool myself to be startled. Everything, it is, is an earthquake. 
Oh, David, gasped his wife, not much reassured. It is nothing but an earthquake, persisted Mr. Townsend. It acted just like that. Things always are broken on the walls, and the middle of the room isn't affected. I've read about it. Suddenly, Mrs. Townsend gave a loud shriek and pointed. How do you count for that? she cried. If that's an earthquake, oh, oh, oh! She was on the verge of hysterics. Her husband held her firmly by the arm as his eyes followed the direction of her rigid pointing finger. Cordelia looked also, her eyes seeming converged to a bright point of fear. On the floor, in front of the broken-looking glass, lay a mass of black stuff in a gruesome, long ridge. "'It's something you dropped there!' almost shouted Mr. Townsend. "'It ain't! Oh!' Mr. Townsend dropped his wife's arm and took one stride toward the object. It was a very long crepe veil. He lifted it, and it floated out from his arm as if imbued with electricity. "'It's yours,' he said to his wife. "'Oh, David, I never had one. You know, oh, you know, I shouldn't, unless you died. How came it there?' "'I'm darned if I know,' said David, regarding it. He was deadly pale, but still resentful rather than afraid. Don't hold it. Don't. I'd like to know what in thunder all this means, said David. He gave the thing an angry toss, and it fell on the floor in exactly the same long heap as before. Cordelia began to weep with racking sobs. Mrs. Townsend reached out and caught her husband's hand, clutching it hard with ice-cold fingers. What's got into this house, anyhow? he growled. You'll have to sell it. Oh, David, we can't live here. As for selling a house I paid only 5000 for when it's worth twenty five, for any such nonsense as this, I won't. David gave one stride toward the black veil, but it rose from the floor and moved away before him, across the room at exactly the same height as if suspended from a woman's head. He pursued it clutching vainly, all around the room. Then he swung himself on his heel with an exclamation, and the thing fell to the floor again in the long heap. Then were heard hurrying feet on the stairs, and Adriana burst into the room. She ran straight to her father and clutched his arm. She tried to speak, but she chattered unintelligibly. Her face was blue. Her father shook her violently. Adriana! Do have more sense, he cried. Oh, David, how can you talk so, sobbed her mother. I can't help it. I'm mad, said he with emphasis. What has got into this house, and you all, anyhow? What is it, Adriana, poor child, asked her mother. Only look what has happened here. It's an earthquake, said her father, staunchly. Nothing to be afraid of. How do you count for that? said Mrs. Townsend in an awful voice, pointing to the veil. Adriana did not look. She was too engrossed with her own terrors. She began to speak in a breathless voice. I was coming by the vacant lot, she panted, and I, I had my new hat in a paper bag and a parcel of blue ribbon, and I saw a crowd, an awful, oh, a whole crowd of people with white faces as if they were dressed all in black where are they now i don't know oh adriana sank gasping feebly into a chair get her some water david sobbed her mother david rushed with an impatient exclamation out of the room and returned with a glass of water which he held to his daughter's lips here, drink this, he said roughly. Oh, David, how can you speak so, sobbed his wife. I can't help it. I'm mad clean through, said David. Then there was a hard bound upstairs, and George entered. He was very white, but he grinned at them with an appearance of unconcern. 
Hello, he said in a shaking voice, which he tried to control. What on earth's to pay in that vacant lot now? Well, what is it? demanded his father. Oh, nothing. Only, well, there are lights over it exactly as if there was a house there, just about where the windows would be. It looked as if you could walk right in, but when you look close, there are those old dried-up weeds rattling away on the ground the same as ever. I looked at it and couldn't believe my eyes. A woman saw it, too. She came along just as I did. She gave one look, then she screeched and ran. I waited for someone else, but nobody came. Mr. Townsend rushed out of the room. I dare say it'll be gone when he gets there, began George. Then he stared round the room. What's to pay here? he cried. Oh, George, the whole house shook all at once, and all the looking-glasses broke, wailed his mother, and Adriana and Cordelia joined. George whistled with pale lips. Then Mr. Townsend entered. Well, asked George, see anything? I don't want to talk, said his father. I've stood just about enough. We've got to sell out and go back to Townsend Center, cried his wife in a wild voice. Oh, David, say you'll go back. I won't go back for any such nonsense as this and sell a $25,000 house for 5000 said he firmly. But that very night his resolution was shaken. The whole family watched together in the dining room. They were all afraid to go to bed, that is, all except possibly Mr. Townsend. Mrs. Townsend declared firmly that she for one would leave that awful house and go back to Townsend Center, whether he came or not, unless they all stayed together and watched, and Mr. Townsend yielded. They chose the dining room for the reason that it was nearer the street, should they wish to make their egress hurriedly, and they took up their station around the dining table on which Cordelia had placed a luncheon. It looks exactly as if we were watching with a corpse, she said, in a horror-stricken whisper. Hold your tongue if you can't talk sense, said Mr. Townsend. The dining room was very large, finished in oak, with a dark blue paper above the wainscoting. The old sign of the tavern, the blue leopard, hung over the mantel-shelf. Mr. Townsend had insisted on hanging it there. He had a curious pride in it. The family sat together until after midnight, and nothing unusual happened. Mrs. Townsend began to nod. Mr. Townsend read the paper ostentatiously. Adriana and Cordelia stared with roving eyes about the room, then at each other, as if comparing notes on terror. George had a book, which he studied furtively. All at once, Adriana gave a startled exclamation, and Cordelia echoed her. George whistled faintly. Mrs. Townsend awoke with a start, and Mr. Townsend's paper rattled to the floor. Look! gasped Adriana. The sign of the blue leopard over the shelf glowed as if a lantern hung over it. The radiance was thrown from above. It grew brighter and brighter as they watched. The blue leopard seemed to crouch and spring with life. Then the door into the front hall opened the outer door which had been carefully locked it squeaked and they all recognized it they sat staring mr townsend was as transfixed as the rest they heard the outer door shut then the door into the room swung open and slowly that awful black group of people which they had seen in the afternoon entered the townsends with one accord rose and huddled together in a far corner. They all held to each other and stared. The people, their faces gleaming with a whiteness of death, their black robes waving and folding, crossed the room. They were a trifle above mortal height, or seemed so, to the terrified eyes which saw them. They reached the mantel-shelf where the signboard hung. Then a black draped long arm was seen to rise and make a motion as if plying a knocker. Then 
the whole company passed out of sight, as if through the wall, and the room was as before. Mrs. Townsend was shaking in a nervous chill. Adriana was almost fainting. Cordelia was in hysterics. David Townsend stood glaring in a curious way at the sign of the blue leopard. George stared at him with a look of horror. There was something in his father's face which made him forget everything else. At last, he touched his arm timidly. Father, he whispered. David turned and regarded him with a look of rage and fury. Then his face cleared. He passed his hand over his forehead. Good Lord, what did come to me? he muttered. You look like that awful picture of old Tom Townsend in the garret in Townsend Center, father, whimpered the boy, shuddering. Should think I might look like most any old cuss after such darned work as this, growled David, but his face was white. Go and pour out some hot tea for your mother, he ordered the boy sharply. He himself shook Cordelia violently. Stop such actions, he shouted in her ears, and shook her again. Ain't you a church member, he demanded. What be you afraid of? You ain't done nothing wrong, have ye? Then Cordelia quoted scripture in a burst of sobs and laughter. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, she cried out. If I ain't done wrong, maybe them that's come before me did, and when the evil one and the powers of darkness is abroad, I'm liable, I'm liable. Then she laughed loud and long and shrill. If you don't hush up, said David, but still with that white terror and horror on his own face. I'll bundle you out in that vacant lot, whether or no. I mean it. Then Cordelia was quiet. After one wild roll of her eyes at him, the color was returning to Adriana's cheeks. Her mother was drinking hot tea in spasmodic gulps. It's after midnight, she gasped, and I don't believe they'll come again tonight. Do you, David? No, I don't said David, conclusively. Oh, David, we mustn't stay another night in this awful house. We won't. Tomorrow we'll pack off bag and baggage to Townsend Center, if it takes all the fire department to move us, said David. Adriana smiled in the midst of her terror. She thought of Abel Lyons. The next day, Mr. Townsend went to the real estate agent who had sold him the house. It's no use he said. I can't stand it. Sell the house for what you can get. I'll give it away rather than keep it. Then he added a few strong words as to his opinion of parties who sold him such an establishment, but the agent pleaded innocent for the most part. I'll own I suspected something wrong when the owner, who pledged me to secrecy as to his name, told me to sell that place for what I could get and did not limit me. I had never heard anything, but I began to suspect something was wrong. Then I made a few inquiries and found out that there was a rumor in the neighborhood that there was something out of the usual about that vacant lot. I had wondered myself why it wasn't built upon. There was a story about its being undertaken once, and the contract made, and the contract to die in, then another man took it, and one of the workmen was killed on his way to dig the cellar, and the others struck. I didn't pay much attention to it. I never believed much in that sort of thing anyhow. And then, too, I couldn't find out that there had ever been anything wrong about the house itself, except as the people had lived there was said to have seen and heard queer things in the vacant lot. So I thought you might be able to get along especially as he didn't look like a man who was timid, and the house was such a bargain as I never handled before. But this, you tell me, is beyond belief. Do you know the names of the people who formerly owned the vacant lot? asked Mr. Townsend. I don't know for certain, replied the agent, for the original owners flourished long before your or my day but I do know that the lot goes by the name of the old Gaston lot. What's the matter? Are you ill? No, it is nothing, 
replied Mr. Townsend. Get what you can for the house. Perhaps another family might not be as troubled as we have been. I hope you are not going to leave the city, said the agent urbanely. I am going back to Townsend Center as fast as steam can carry me after we get packed up and out of that cursed house, replied Mr. David. He did not tell the agent nor any of his family what had caused him to start when told the name of the former owners of the lot. He remembered all at once the story of a ghastly murder which had taken place in the Blue Leopard. The victim's name was Gaston, and the murderer had never been discovered. End of The Vacant Lot by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman The Wind in the Rosebush by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Simmons The Wind in the Rosebush by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman Ford Village has no railroad station, being on the other side of the river from Porter's Falls, and accessible only by the Ford which gives it its name, and a ferry line. The ferry boat was waiting when Rebecca Flint got off the train with her bag and lunch basket. When she and her small trunk were safely embarked, she sat stiff and straight and calm in the ferry boat as it shot swiftly and smoothly across stream. There was a horse attached to a light country wagon on board, and he pawed the deck uneasily. His owner stood near, with a wary eye upon him, although he was chewing with as dully reflective an expression as a cow. Beside Rebecca sat a woman of about her own age, who kept looking at her with furtive curiosity. Her husband, short and stout and saturnine, stood near her. Rebecca paid no attention to either of them. She was tall and spare and pale, the type of a spinster, yet with rudimentary lines and expressions of matronhood. She all unconsciously held her shawl, rolled up in a canvas bag, on her left hip, as if it had been a child. She wore a settled frown of dissent at life, but it was the frown of a mother who regarded life as a froward child rather than as an overwhelming fate. The other woman continued staring at her. She was mildly stupid, except for an overdeveloped curiosity which made her at times sharp beyond belief. Her eyes glittered. Red spots came on her flaccid cheeks. She kept opening her mouth to speak, making little abortive motions. Finally, she could endure it no longer. She nudged Rebecca boldly. A pleasant day, said she. Rebecca looked at her and nodded coldly. Yes, very, she assented. Have you come far? I've come from Michigan. Oh, said the woman with awe. It's a long way, she remarked presently. Yes, it is, replied Rebecca conclusively. Still, the other woman was not daunted. There was something which she determined to know, possibly roused thereto by a vague sense of incongruity in the other's appearance. "'It's a long ways to come and leave a family,' she remarked with painful slyness. "'I ain't got any family to leave,' returned Rebecca shortly. "'Then you ain't—' "'No, I ain't.' "'Oh,' said the woman— Rebecca looked straight ahead at the race of the river. It was a long ferry. Finally, Rebecca herself waxed unexpectedly loquacious. She turned to the other woman and inquired if she knew John Dent's widow, who lived in Ford Village. Her husband died about three years ago, she said by way of detail. The woman started violently. She turned pale, then she flushed. She cast a strange glance at her husband, who was regarding both women with a sort of stolid keenness. "'Yes, I guess I do,' faltered the woman finally. "'Well, his first wife was my sister. 
said Rebecca, with the air of one imparting important intelligence. Was she? responded the other woman feebly. She glanced at her husband with an expression of doubt and terror, and he shook his head forbiddingly. I'm going to see her and take my niece Agnes home with me, said Rebecca. Then the woman gave such a violent start that she noticed it. What is the matter? she asked. Nothing, I guess, replied the woman with eyes on her husband, who was slowly shaking his head like a Chinese toy. Is my niece sick? asked Rebecca with quick suspicion. No, she ain't sick, replied the woman with alacrity. Then she caught her breath with a gasp. When did you see her? Let me see. I ain't seen her for some little time, replied the woman. Then she caught her breath again. She ought to have grown up real pretty if she takes after my sister. She was a real pretty woman, Rebecca said wistfully. Yes, I guess she did grow up pretty, replied the woman in a trembling voice. What kind of a woman is the second wife? The woman glanced at her husband's warning face. She continued to gaze at him while she replied in a choking voice to Rebecca. I guess she's a nice woman, she replied. I don't know. I guess so. I don't see much of her. I felt kind of hurt that John married again so quick, said Rebecca. But I suppose he wanted his house kept, and Agnes wanted care. I wasn't so situated that I could take her when her mother died. I had my own mother to care for, and I was school teaching. Now mother has gone, and my uncle died six months ago and left me quite a little property, and I've given up my school, and I've come for Agnes. I guess she'll be glad to go with me, though I suppose her stepmother is a good woman and has always done for her. The man's warning shake at his wife was fairly portentous. I guess so, said she. John always wrote that she was a beautiful woman, said Rebecca. Then the ferry boat grated on the shore. John Dent's widow had sent a horse and wagon to meet her sister-in-law. When the woman and her husband went down the road, on which Rebecca in the wagon with her trunk soon passed them, she said reproachfully, Seems as if I'd ought to have told her, Thomas. Let her find it out herself replied the man. Don't you go to burning your fingers and other folks' pudding, Maria. Do you suppose she'll see anything? asked the woman with a spasmodic shudder and a terrified roll of her eyes. See, returned her husband with stolid scorn. Better be sure there's anything to see. Oh, Thomas, they say. Lord, ain't you found out that what they say is mostly lies? But if it should be true... And she's a nervous woman. She might be scared enough to lose her wits, said his wife, staring uneasily after Rebecca's erect figure in the wagon, disappearing over the crest of the hilly road. Wits that so easy upset ain't worth much, declared the man. You keep out of it, Maria. Rebecca, in the meantime, rode on in the wagon beside a flaxen headed boy who looked, to her understanding, not very bright. She asked him a question, and he paid no attention. She repeated it, and he responded with a bewildered and incoherent grunt. Then she let him alone, after making sure that he knew how to drive straight. They had traveled about half a mile, past the village square, and gone a short distance beyond, when the boy drew up with a sudden, whoa, before a very prosperous-looking house. It had been one of the aboriginal cottages of the vicinity, small and white, with a roof extending on one side over a piazza, and a tiny L jutting out in the rear, on the right hand. Now the cottage was transformed by dormer windows, a bay window on the piazza-less side, a carved railing down the front steps, and a modern hardwood door. "'Is this John Dent's house?' asked Rebecca." The boy was as sparing of speech as a philosopher. His only response was in flinging the reins over the horse's back, 
stretching out one foot to the shaft and leaping out of the wagon, then going around to the rear for the trunk. Rebecca got out and went toward the house. Its white paint had a new gloss. Its blinds were an immaculate apple green. The lawn was trimmed as smooth as velvet, and it was dotted with scrupulous groups of hydrangeas and cannas. I always understood that John Dent was well-to-do, Rebecca reflected comfortably. I guess Agnes will have considerable. I've got enough, but it will come in handy for her schooling. She can have advantages. The boy dragged the trunk up the fine gravel walk, but before he reached the steps leading up to the piazza, for the house stood on a terrace, the front door opened, and a fair, frizzled head of a very large and handsome woman appeared. She held up her black silk skirt, disclosing voluminous ruffles of starched embroidery, and waited for Rebecca. She smiled placidly. Her pink, double-chinned face widened and dimpled, but her blue eyes were wary and calculating. She extended her hand as Rebecca climbed the steps. "'This is Miss Flint, I suppose,' said she. "'Yes, ma'am,' replied Rebecca, noticing with bewilderment a curious expression compounded of fear and defiance on the other's face. "'Your letter only arrived this morning,' said Mrs. Dent in a steady voice. Her great face was a uniform pink, and her china-blue eyes were at once aggressive and veiled with secrecy. "'Yes, I hardly thought you'd get my letter,' replied Rebecca. "'I felt as if I could not wait to hear from you before I came. I supposed you would be so situated that you could have me a little while, without putting you out too much, from what John used to write me about his circumstances. And when I had that money so unexpected, I felt as if I must come for Agnes.' I suppose you'll be willing to give her up. You know she's my own blood, and of course she's no relation to you, though you must have got attached to her. I know from her picture what a sweet girl she must be. And John always said she looked like her own mother, and Grace was a beautiful woman, if she was my sister. Rebecca stopped and stared at the other woman in amazement and alarm. The great handsome blonde creature stood speechless, livid, gasping, with her hand to her heart, her lips parted in a horrible caricature of a smile. "'Are you sick?' cried Rebecca, drawing near. "'Don't you want me to get you some water?' Then Mrs. Dent recovered herself with a great effort. "'It is nothing,' she said. "'I am subject to... spells. I am over it now. Won't you come in, Miss Flint?' As she spoke, the beautiful deep rose color suffused her face. Her blue eyes met her visitors with the opaqueness of turquoise, with a revelation of blue, but a concealment of all behind. Rebecca followed her hostess in, and the boy, who had waited quiescently, climbed the steps with the trunk. But before they entered the door, a strange thing happened. On the upper terrace, close to the piazza post, grew a great rose bush, and on it, Late in the season, though it was, one small red perfect rose. Rebecca looked at it, and the other woman extended her hand with a quick gesture. Don't you pick that rose, she brusquely cried. Rebecca drew herself up with stiff dignity. I ain't in the habit of picking other folks' roses without leave, said she. As Rebecca spoke, she started violently and lost sight of her resentment, for something singular happened. Suddenly, the rose bush was agitated violently, as if by a gust of wind, yet it was a remarkably still day. Not a leaf of the hydrangea standing on the terrace close to the rose trembled. What on earth? began Rebecca. Then she stopped with a gasp at the sight of the other woman's face. Although a face, it gave somehow the impression of a desperately clutched hand of secrecy. Come in said she in a harsh voice, which seemed to come forth from her chest with no intervention of the organs of speech. Come into the house. I'm getting cold out here. What makes that rose bush blow so when there isn't any wind? asked Rebecca, trembling with vague horror, yet resolute. I don't see as it is blowing, returned the woman calmly, and as she spoke, indeed the bush was quiet. 
It was blowing, declared Rebecca. It isn't now, said Mrs. Dent. I can't try to account for everything that blows out of doors. I have too much to do. She spoke scornfully and confidently, with defiant, unflinching eyes, first on the bush, then on Rebecca, and led the way into the house. It looked queer, persisted Rebecca, but she followed, and also the boy with the trunk. Rebecca entered an interior, prosperous, even elegant, according to her simple ideas. There were Brussels carpets, lace curtains, and plenty of brilliant upholstery and polished wood. "'You're real nicely situated,' remarked Rebecca, after she had become a little accustomed to her new surroundings, and the two women were seated at the tea table. Mrs. Dent stared with a hard complacency from behind her silver-plated service. "'Yes, I be,' said she. "'You got all the things new?' said Rebecca, hesitatingly, with a jealous memory of her dead sister's bridal furnishings. Yes, said Mrs. Dent. I was never one to want dead folks' things, and I had money enough of my own, so I wasn't beholden to John. I had the old duds put up at auction. They didn't bring much. I suppose you saved some for Agnes. She'll want some of her poor mother's things when she is grown up said Rebecca, with some indignation. The defiant stare of Mrs. Dent's blue eyes waxed more intense. "'There's a few things up, Garrett,' said she. "'She'll be likely to value them,' remarked Rebecca. As she spoke, she glanced at the window. "'Isn't it most time for her to be coming home?' she asked. "'Most time,' answered Mrs. Dent carelessly. "'But when she gets over to Addie Slocum's, she never knows when to come home. Is Addie Slocum her intimate friend? Intimate as any. Maybe we can have her come out to see Agnes when she's living with me, said Rebecca wistfully. I suppose she'll be likely to be homesick at first. Most likely, answered Mrs. Dent. Does she call you mother? Rebecca asked. No, she calls me Aunt Emmeline, replied the other woman shortly. "'When did you say you were going home?' "'In about a week, I thought, "'if she can be ready to go so soon,' "'answered Rebecca, with a surprised look. "'She reflected that she would not remain a day longer "'than she could help, "'after such an inhospitable look and question. "'Oh, as far as that goes,' said Mrs. Dent, "'it wouldn't make any difference about her being ready. "'You could go home whenever you felt that you must, "'and she could come afterward.' Alone? Why not? She's a big girl now, and you don't have to change cars. My niece will go home when I do, and not travel alone, and if I can't wait here for her, in the house that used to be her mother's and my sister's home, I'll go and board somewhere, returned Rebecca with warmth. Oh, you can stay here as long as you want to. You're welcome, said Mrs. Dent. Then Rebecca started. There she is, she declared in a trembling, exultant voice. Nobody knew how she longed to see the girl. She isn't as late as I thought she'd be, said Mrs. Dent. And again that curious, subtle change passed over her face, and again it settled into that stony impassiveness. Rebecca stared at the door, waiting for it to open. Where is she? she asked presently. I guess she stopped to take off her hat in the entry suggested Mrs. Dent. Rebecca waited. Why don't she come? It can't take her all this time to take off her hat. For answer, Mrs. Dent rose with a stiff jerk and threw open the door. Agnes, she called. Agnes. Then she turned and eyed Rebecca. She ain't there. I saw her past the window, said Rebecca in bewilderment. You must have been mistaken. I know I did, persisted Rebecca. You couldn't have. I did. I saw first a shadow go over the ceiling, then I saw her in the glass there. She pointed to a mirror over the sideboard opposite. And then the shadow passed the window. How did she look in the glass? Little and light-haired, with the light hair kind of tossing over her forehead. You couldn't have seen her. Was that like Agnes? 
like enough. But of course you didn't see her. You've been thinking so much about her that you thought you did. You thought you did? I thought I saw a shadow pass the window, but I must have been mistaken. She didn't come in, or we would have seen her before now. I knew it was too early for her to get home from Addie Slocum's anyhow. When Rebecca went to bed, Agnes had not returned. Rebecca had resolved that she would not retire until the girl came. But she was very tired, and she reasoned with herself that she was foolish. Besides, Mrs. Dent suggested that Agnes might go to the church social with Addie Slocum. When Rebecca suggested that she be sent for and told that her aunt had come, Mrs. Dent laughed meaningly. I guess you'll find out that a young girl ain't so ready to leave a sociable where there's boys to see her aunt, said she. She's too young, said Rebecca incredulously and indignantly. She's sixteen, replied Mrs. Dent, and she's always been great for the boys. She's going to school four years after I get her before she thinks of boys, declared Rebecca. We'll see laughed the other woman. After Rebecca went to bed, she lay awake a long time listening for the sound of girlish laughter and a boy's voice under her window. Then she fell asleep. The next morning she was down early. Mrs. Dent, who kept no servants, was busily preparing breakfast. "'Don't Agnes help you about breakfast?' asked Rebecca. "'No, I let her lay,' replied Mrs. Dent shortly. What time did she get home last night? She didn't get home. What? She didn't get home. She stayed with Addie. She often does. Without sending you word? Oh, she knew I wouldn't worry. When will she be home? Oh, I guess she'll be along pretty soon. Rebecca was uneasy, but she tried to conceal it, for she knew of no good reason for uneasiness. What was there to occasion alarm in the fact of one young girl staying overnight with another? She could not eat much breakfast. Afterward, she went out on the little piazza, although her hostess strove furtively to stop her. Why don't you go out back of the house? It's real pretty, a view over the river, she said. I guess I'll go out here, replied Rebecca. She had a purpose to watch for the absent girl. Presently, Rebecca came hustling into the house through the sitting room, into the kitchen where Mrs. Dent was cooking. That rose bush, she gasped. Mrs. Dent turned and faced her. What of it? It's a blowin'. What of it? There isn't a mite of wind this morning. Mrs. Dent turned with an inimitable toss of her fair head. If you think I can spend my time puzzling over such nonsense as she began, but Rebecca interrupted her with a cry and a rush to the door. There she is now, she cried. She flung the door wide open, and curiously enough, a breeze came in, and her own gray hair tossed, and a paper blew off the table to the floor with a loud rustle. But there was nobody in sight. There's nobody here, Rebecca said. She looked blankly at the other woman, who brought a rolling pin down on a slab of pie crust with a thud. I didn't hear anybody, she said calmly. I saw somebody pass that window. You were mistaken again. I know I saw somebody. You couldn't have. Please shut that door. Rebecca shut the door. She sat down beside the window and looked out on the autumnal yard with its little curve of footpath to the kitchen door. "'What smells so strong of roses in this room?' she said presently. She sniffed hard. "'I don't smell anything but these nutmegs.' "'It is not nutmeg.' "'I don't smell anything else.' "'Where do you suppose Agnes is?' "'Oh, perhaps she has gone over the ferry to Porter's Falls with Addie. She often does. Addie's got an aunt over there.' And Addie's got a cousin, a real pretty boy. You suppose she's gone over there? Maybe. I shouldn't wonder. When should she be home? Oh, not before afternoon. Rebecca waited with all the patience she could muster. She kept reassuring herself 
telling herself that it was all natural, that the other woman could not help it, but she made up her mind that if Agnes did not return that afternoon, she should be sent for. When it was four o'clock, she started up with resolution. She had been furtively watching the onyx clock on the sitting-room mantel. She had timed herself. She had said that if Agnes was not home by that time, she should demand that she be sent for. She rose and stood before Mrs. Dent, who looked up coolly from her embroidery. I've waited just about as long as I'm going to, she said. I've come away from Michigan to see my own sister's daughter and take her home with me. I've been here ever since yesterday, 24 hours, and I haven't seen her. Now I'm going to. I want her sent for. Mrs. Dent folded her embroidery and rose. Well, I don't blame you, she said. It is high time she came home. I'll go right over and get her myself. Rebecca heaved a sigh of relief. She hardly knew what she had suspected or feared, but she knew that her position had been one of antagonism, if not accusation, and she was sensible of relief. I wish you would, she said gratefully, and went back to her chair while Mrs. Dent got her shawl and her little white head tie. I wouldn't trouble you, but I do feel as if I couldn't wait any longer to see her, she remarked apologetically. Oh, it ain't any trouble at all, said Mrs. Dent as she went out. I don't blame you. You have waited long enough. Rebecca sat at the window watching breathlessly until Mrs. Dent came stepping through the yard alone. She ran to the door and saw, hardly noticing it this time, that the rose bush was again violently agitated, yet with no wind evident elsewhere. Where is she? she cried. Mrs. Dent laughed with stiff lips as she came up the steps over the terrace. Girls will be girls, said she. She's gone with Addie to Lincoln. Addie's got an uncle who's conductor on the train and lives there, and he got him passes. And they're going to stay to Addie's Aunt Margaret's a few days. Mrs. Slocum said Addie didn't have time to come over and ask me before the train went, but she took it on herself to say it would be all right and... Why hadn't she been over to tell you? Rebecca was angry, though not suspicious. She even saw no reason for her anger. Oh, she was putting up grapes. She was coming over just as soon as she got the black off her hands. She heard I had company, and her hands were a sight. She was holding them over sulfur matches. You say she's going to stay a few days? repeated Rebecca dazedly. Yes, till Thursday, Mrs. Slocum said. How far is Lincoln from here? About fifty miles. It'll be a real treat to her. Mrs. Slocum's sister is a real nice woman. It is going to make it pretty late about my going home. If you don't feel as if you could wait, I'll get her ready and send her on just as soon as I can, Mrs. Dent said sweetly. I'm going to wait said Rebecca grimly. The two women sat down again, and Mrs. Dent took up her embroidery. Is there any sewing I can do for her? Rebecca asked finally in a desperate way. If I can get her sewing along some. Mrs. Dent arose with alacrity and fetched a mass of white from the closet. Here, she said. If you want to sew the lace on this nightgown, I was going to put her to it, but she'll be glad enough to get rid of it. She ought to have this and one more before she goes. I don't like to send her away without some good underclothing. Rebecca snatched at the little white garment and sewed feverishly. That night, she wakened from a deep sleep a little after midnight and lay a minute trying to collect her faculties and explain to herself what she was listening to. At last, she discovered that it was the then-popular strains of The Maiden's Prayer, floating up through the floor from the piano in the sitting-room below. She jumped up, threw a shawl over her nightgown, and hurried downstairs, trembling. There was nobody in the sitting-room. The piano was silent. She ran to Mrs. Dent's bedroom and called hysterically, Emmeline! Emmeline! What is it? asked Mrs. Dent's voice from the bed. 
The voice was stern, but had a note of consciousness in it. Who, who was that playing the maiden's prayer in the sitting room on the piano? I didn't hear anybody. There was someone. I didn't hear anything. I tell you there was someone, but there ain't anybody there. I didn't hear anything. I did. Somebody was playing the maiden's prayer on the piano. Has Agnes got home? I want to know. Of course Agnes hasn't got home, answered Mrs. Dent with rising inflection. Be you gone crazy over that girl? The last boat from Porter's Falls was in before we went to bed. Of course she ain't come. I heard you were dreaming. I wasn't. I was broad awake. Rebecca went back to her chamber and kept her lamp burning all night. The next morning her eyes upon Mrs. Dent were wary and blazing with suppressed excitement. She kept opening her mouth as if to speak, then frowning and setting her lips hard. After breakfast, she went upstairs and came down presently with her coat and bonnet. Now, Emmeline, she said, I want to know where the Slocums live. Mrs. Dent gave a strange, long, half-lidded glance at her. She was finishing her coffee. Why? she asked. I'm going over there and find out if they have heard anything from her daughter and Agnes since they went away. I don't like what I heard last night. You must have been dreaming. It don't make any odds whether I was or not. Does she play the maiden's prayer on the piano? I want to know. What if she does? She plays it a little, I believe. I don't know. She don't half play it anyhow. She ain't got an ear. That wasn't half played last night. I don't like such things happening. I ain't superstitious, but I don't like it. I'm going. Where do the Slocums live? You go down the road, over the bridge, past the old grist mill. Then you turn to the left. It's the only house for half a mile. You can't miss it. It has a barn with a ship in full sail on the cupola. Well, I'm going. I don't feel easy. About two hours later, Rebecca returned. There were red spots on her cheeks. She looked wild. I've been there, she said, and there isn't a soul at home. Something has happened. What has happened? I don't know. Something. I had a warning last night. There wasn't a soul there. They've been sent for to Lincoln. Did you see anybody to ask? asked Mrs. Dent with thinly concealed anxiety. I asked the woman that lives on the turn of the road. She's stone deaf, I suppose you know. She listened while I screamed at her to know where the Slocums were, and then she said, Mrs. Smith don't live here. I didn't see anybody on the road, and that's the only house. What do you suppose it means? I don't suppose it means much of anything, replied Mrs. Dent coolly. Mr. Slocum is conductor on the railroad, and he'd be away anyway, and Mrs. Slocum often goes early when he does, to spend the day with her sister in Porter's Falls. She'd be more likely to go away than Addie. And you don't think anything has happened? Rebecca asked, with diminishing distrust before the reasonableness of it. Land, no. Rebecca went upstairs to lay aside her coat and bonnet but she came hurrying back with them still on. "'Who's been in my room?' she gasped. Her face was pale as ashes. Mrs. Dent also paled as she regarded her. "'What do you mean?' she asked slowly. "'I found when I went upstairs that little nightgown of Agnes's on the bed, laid out. It was laid out.' The sleeves were folded across the bosom, and there was that little red rose between them. Emmeline, what is it? Emmeline, what's the matter? Oh! Mrs. Dent was struggling for breath in great, choking gasps. She clung to the back of a chair. Rebecca, trembling herself so she could scarcely keep on her feet, got her some water. As soon as she recovered herself... Mrs. Dent regarded her with eyes full of the strangest mixture of fear and horror and hostility. What do you mean talking so? 
she said in a hard voice. It is there. Nonsense, you threw it down and it fell that way. It was folded in my bureau drawer. It couldn't have been. Who picked that red rose? Look on the bush, Mrs. Dent replied shortly. Rebecca looked at her. Her mouth gaped. She hurried out of the room. When she came back, her eyes seemed to protrude. She had in the meantime hastened upstairs and come down with tottering steps, clinging to the banisters. Now I want to know what all this means, she demanded. What what means? The rose is on the bush, and it's gone from the bed in my room. Is this house haunted or what? I don't know anything about a house being haunted. I don't believe in such things. Be you crazy? Mrs. Dent spoke with gathering force. The color flashed back to her cheeks. No, said Rebecca shortly. I ain't crazy yet, but I shall be if this keeps on much longer. I'm going to find out where that girl is before night. Mrs. Dent eyed her. What be you going to do? I'm going to Lincoln. A faint, triumphant smile overspread Mrs. Dent's large face. You can't, said she. There ain't any train. No train? No, there ain't any afternoon train from the falls to Lincoln. Then I'm going over to the Slocums again tonight. However, Rebecca did not go. Such a rain came up as deterred even her resolution, and she had only her best dresses with her. Then in the evening came the letter from the Michigan village which she had left nearly a week ago. It was from her cousin, a single woman, who had come to keep her house while she was away. It was a pleasant, unexciting letter enough, all the first of it, and related mostly how she missed Rebecca, how she hoped she was having pleasant weather and kept her health, and how her friend, Mrs. Greenaway, had come to stay with her since she had felt lonesome the first night in the house. How she hoped Rebecca would have no objections to this, although nothing had been said about it, since she had not realized that she might be nervous alone. The cousin was painfully conscientious, hence the letter. Rebecca smiled in spite of her disturbed mind as she read it. Then her eye caught the postscript. That was in a different hand, purporting to be written by the friend, Mrs. Hannah Greenaway, informing her that the cousin had fallen down the cellar stairs and broken her hip and was in a dangerous condition and begging Rebecca to return at once as she herself was rheumatic and unable to nurse her properly and no one else could be obtained. Rebecca looked at Mrs. Dent, who had come to her room with the letter quite late. It was half past nine and she had gone upstairs for the night. Where did this come from? she asked. Mr. Amblecrome brought it, she replied. Who's he? The postmaster. He often brings the letters that come on the late mail. He knows I ain't anybody to send. He brought yours about your coming. He said he and his wife came over on the ferry boat with you. I remember him, Rebecca replied shortly. There's bad news in this letter. Mrs. Dent's face took on an expression of serious inquiry. Yes, my cousin Harriet has fallen down the cellar stairs. They were always dangerous, and she's broken her hip, and I've got to take the first train home tomorrow. You don't say so. I'm dreadfully sorry. No, you ain't sorry, said Rebecca, with a look as if she leaped. You're glad. I don't know why, but you're glad. You've wanted to get rid of me for some reason ever since I came. I don't know why. You're a strange woman. Now you've got your way, and I hope you're satisfied. How you talk. Mrs. Dent spoke in a faintly injured voice, but there was a light in her eyes. I talk the way it is. Well, I'm going home tomorrow morning, and I want you, just as soon as Agnes Dent comes home, to send her out to me. Don't you wait for anything. You pack what clothes she's got, and don't wait even to mend them, and you buy her ticket. I'll leave the money, and you send her along. She don't have to change cars. You start her off when she gets home on the next train. Very well, replied the other woman. 
she had an expression of covert amusement. Mind you do it. Very well, Rebecca. Rebecca started on her journey the next morning. When she arrived two days later, she found her cousin in perfect health. She found, moreover, that the friend had not written the postscript in the cousin's letter. Rebecca would have returned to Ford Village the next morning, but the fatigue and nervous strain had been too much for her. She was not able to move from her bed. She had a species of low fever induced by anxiety and fatigue. But she could write, and she did, to the Slocums. And she received no answer. She also wrote to Mrs. Dent. She even sent numerous telegrams, with no response. Finally, she wrote to the postmaster, and an answer arrived by the first possible mail. The letter was short, curt, and to the purpose. Mr. Amblecrom, the postmaster, was a man of few words, and especially wary as to his expressions in a letter. Dear Madam, he wrote, your favor received. No Slocums in Ford's village. All dead. Addie ten years ago. Her mother two years later. Her father five. House vacant. Mrs. John Dent said to have neglected stepdaughter. Girl was sick. Medicine not given. Talk of taking action. Not enough evidence. House said to be haunted. Strange sights and sounds. Your niece, Agnes Dent, died a year ago, about this time. Yours truly, Thomas Amblecrom. End of The Wind in the Rosebush Recording by Anne Simmons A Halloween Wraith by William Black this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. A Halloween Wraith by William Black. 1. The vast bulk of Ben Cleverick was dark in shadow, but the wide waters of Loch Nava shone a soft silver grey in the moonlight. As Hector McIntyre, keeper and forester in the far solitudes of Glencorn, came striding along the road toward Invermudal. As he approached the little hamlet, which consists merely of the inn and its surroundings, and one or two keeper's cottages, certain small points of red told him of its whereabouts among the black trees, and as he drew still nearer, he thought he would let the good people there know of his coming. Hector had brought his pipes with him, for there were to be great doings on this Halloween night, and now, when he had inflated the bag and tuned the drones, there sprang into the profound silence reigning everywhere around this wild skirl of the hills of Glenorque. Surely the sound would reach and carry its message. If not, here was Giliadrova, played still more bravely, and again the proud strains of the Glen's mine, by which time he had got near to the inn and was about to turn down from the highway by the semicircular drive passing the front door. But here he suddenly encountered a fearful sight. From out of the dusk of the wall surrounding the front garden, there came three luminous objects, three globes of a dull saffron hue, and on each of these appeared the features of a face, eyes, mouth and nose, all flaming and fire. On beholding this terrible thing, the tall, brown-bearded forester turned and fled, and the pipes told of his dismay, for they shrieked and groaned and made all sorts of indescribable noises as if they too were in mortal alarm. Then Mrs. Moray's three children, with victorious shouts of laughter, pursued the tall forester, and kept waving before them the hollowed-out turnips with a bit of candle burning within. When he had got up to the corner of the road, Hector turned and addressed the children, who had come crowding round him, holding up their flaming turnips, to cause him still further dismay. "'Well now,' said he, in the Gaelic, "'there is a fearful thing to alarm any poor person with. Were you not thinking I should die of fright? And the pipes squealing as well, for they never saw anything like that before. But never mind, we are going down to the house now. And do you know, Roland and Isabel, and you little Shana, do you know, I have brought you some of the fur tops that grow in Glengorm. 
for it is a wonderful place, Glencorn, and the fir tops that grow on the larches there are not as the fir tops that grow anywhere else. They are very small, and they are round, and some are pink, and some are blue, and some are black and white, and some others, why, they have an almond inside them. Oh, it is a wonderful place, Glengorm. But it is not always you can get the fir tops from the larches. It is only on some great occasion like the Halloway night. And let me say now, if I put any of them in my pocket, here, Ronald, take the pipes from me, and hold them properly on your shoulder, for one day you will be playing Miss Ramsay Stratspe as well as any one, and I will search my pockets and say if I put any of those wonderful fur tops into them. The children knew very well what all this preamble meant, but neither they nor their elders could have told how it was that Hector McIntyre, every time he came to Invermoodal, brought with him packages of sweetmeats, though he lived in one of the most inaccessible districts in, in Sutherland. Glengorm being about two and twenty miles away from anywhere. However, here was a precious little parcels, and when they had been distributed, Hector took his pipes again, and escorted by his small friends, went down to the inn. Well, Mr. Moray, the innkeeper, had also heard the distant carol of the pipes, and here he was at the door. How are you, Hector? he asked in Gaelic. What is your news? There is not much news in Glengorm, was the answer. And when is your wedding to be? Mr. Murray said. We will make a grand day of that, Hector. And I have been thinking, I will get some of the lads to kindle a bonfire on the top of Ben Clebrig, a fire that they will see down in Rosshire. And there's many a pistol and many a gun will make a crack when you drive up to this door and bring your bride in, for I am one who believes in the old customs. And whether it is a wedding or the new year or Halloween night, I am for the old ways and the free church ministers can say what they like. Now come away, and Hector, my lad, and take a dram after your long walk. There is plenty of hard work before you this evening, for Johnny has broken his fiddle, and the lasses have not been asked to dance up a reel for many a day. And then he paused and said, And how is Flora Campbell, Hector? Have you any news of her? No, said the forester, in something of an undertone, and his face looked troubled. I have had no letter for a while back and I do not know what it means. Her sister that lives in Greenock has taken ill, and Flora said she must go down from Oban to see her, and that is the last I have heard. If I knew her sister's address in Greenock, I would write and ask Flora why there was no letter so long. But if you send a letter to one called Mary Campbell in such a big place as Greenock, what use is it? But no news is good news, Hector, said Mr. Murray cheerfully and therewith he led the way through a stone corridor into the great kitchen, where a considerable assemblage of lads and lasses were engaged in noisy merriment and pastime. The arrival of the tall forester and his pipes were hailed with general satisfaction, but there was no call as yet for the inspiring music. In fact, this big kitchen was given over to the games of the children and the younger boys and girls, a barn having been prepared for supper and for the celebration of occult Halloween rites, when the time came for their elders to take part in the festivities. At present, there was a large tub filled with water placed in the middle of the floor, and there were apples in it, and the youngsters with their hands behind their backs were trying to snatch out an apple with their teeth. There was many a sousing of heads, of course, in excellent trial of temper, while sometimes a bolder white than usual would pursue his prize to the bottom and try to fasten upon it there, or some shy young damsel would cunningly shove the apple over to the side of the tub and it succeed by mother wit, where masculine courage had failed. Then from the roof, suspended by a cord, hung a horizontal piece of wood, at one end of which was an apple, at the other a lighted tallow candle. And when the cord had been twisted up and set free again, causing the transverse piece of wood to whirl around, the competitor was invited to snatch with his mouth at the apple, failing to do which secured him a rap on the cheek from the guttering candle. There were all sorts of similar diversions going forward the origin and symbolism of them little dreamt of by these light-hearted lads and lasses. When little Isabel Murray came up to the big, handsome, good-natured-looking forester from Glengorm. "'Will you burn a nut with me, Hector?' she said kindly. "'Indeed I will, Isabel, if you will take me for your sweetheart,' said he in reply. "'And now we will go to the fire, and see whether we are to be at peace and friendship all our lives.' They went to the hearth. They put the two nuts among the blazing pates and awaited the response of the oracle. Could any augury have been more auspicious? 
The two knots lay together, burning steadily and quickly. A soft loaf flame, no angry sputtering, no sudden explosion and separation. Now do you see that lamp of my heart, said the tall forester, using a familiar Gaelic phrase. I no doubt the little lass was very highly pleased. However, at this moment up came Mrs. Murray, with the announcement that the children might continue at their games some time longer, but that the grown-up folk were wanted in the barn, where supper was waiting them. It was a joyous scene. The huge peat fire was blazing brightly. The impoverished chandelier was studded with candles. There were a couple of lamps on the long table, which were otherwise most sumptuously furnished. And when Hector McIntyre, in his capacity of piper, had played the people into the stirring strains of the Marchioness of Tweeddale's delight, he put the papes aside and went and took the seat that had been reserved for him by the side of the fair-haired Nelly, who was very smartly dressed for this great occasion, as befitting the reigning beauty of the neighbourhood. "'You'll be sorry that Flora is not here tonight,' said the fair-haired damsel, rather saucily, to her brown-bearded companion. "'And no one to take her place. I suppose there was no one in Sutherland good enough for you, Hector, that you must take up with the lass from Eisley. And there is little need for you to dip your slave in the burn and hang it up to dry when you go to bed, so that the fire may show you your sweetheart. For well you know already who that is. Well, well, you will have no heart for the merrymaking tonight, for a lad that has a sweetheart away in the south has no heart for anything. You'll just mind this, Nelly, said the forester, not to carry your merrymaking too far this night. Alistair Ross, he continued, glancing down the table toward the huge rough red-bearded drover who was seated there, is not the man to be made a fool of, and if that young fellow Semple does not take heed, he will find himself gripped by the waist some fine dark evening and flung into Loch Naver. Oh, you are like all the rest, Hector, said the coquettish Nelly, with some impatience. Every one of you is jealous of Johnny Semple, because he is neatly dressed, and has good manners, and is civil-spoken. What is he doing here at all? said Hector, with a frown. Is it a fine thing to see a young man idling about a place with his hands in his pockets, just because his uncle is the landlord? If he has learned his fine manners in the towns, why does he not earn his living in the towns? He is no use here. Oh, no, said Nelly, with a toss of her head. Perhaps he's not much use on the hill. Perhaps he could not set traps and shoot hooks. But he knows all the new songs from the theatre, and he can dance more steps than any one in Sutherland. Well, this is what I am telling you, Nelly, the companion said with some firmness. I do not know what there is between you and Alistair Ross. If there is anything, as people say, then do not make him an angry man. Let Semple alone. An honest lass should beware of a town dandy like that. Here this private little conversation was interrupted by Mr. Murray, who rose at the head of the table and called upon the company to fill their glasses. He wished to drink with them, as they did not seem loath. When Hector and his pretty companion found the opportunity to resume their talk, he discovered that Nelly was in quite a different mood. Well, now it is a good thing, Hector, that everyone knows that you and Flora are to be married, for I can talk to you without Alistair getting red in the face with rage. And when we go out to pull the cabbage stalks, will you go with me? I know the way into the garden better than you, and we can both go blindfold if you will take my hand. But what need is there for you to pull a cabbage stalk, lass? said he. Do you not know already what like your husband is to be? Again the pretty Nelly tossed her head. Who can tell what is to happen in the world? And maybe you would rather not pull a stalk that was tall and straight and strong. That would mean Alistair, said the companion, glancing at her suspiciously. Maybe you would rather find you had got hold of a withered old stump with a lot of earth at the root, a decrepit old man with plenty of money in the bank. Or maybe you are wishing for one that is slim and supple and not so tall for one that might mean Johnny Simple. I am wishing to know who the man is to be, and that is all, said Nelly, with some affectation of being offended. And what harm can there be in doing what everyone else is doing? However, not all Nelly's blandishments and petulant coquetteries could induce Hector McIntyre to take part in this appeal to the divinations of the kale yard, for when after supper the lads and lasses went away blindfold, to pull the castock that was to reveal to them the figure and circumstances of their future spouse, the big forester remained to have a quick smoke with the married capers and shepherds who had no interest in such matters. It was noticed that he was unusually grave. He who was ordinarily one of the lightest of the light-hearted. Naturally, they put it down to the fact that among all the merry-making and sweet-hearting and spying into the future of the young people, 
he alone had no companion, or rather not the companion whom he would have wished to have. For Flora, the young girl whom he was to marry, had left in Bermudal for the south in the preceding autumn. And when they had asked if Flora was quite well, and when he had answered, oh yes, there was nothing further to be said. 2. Now, on All Hallows' Eve, there is one form of incantation which is known to be extremely, nay, terribly potent when all others have failed. You go out by yourself, taking a handful of hemp seed with you. You get to a secluded place and begin to scatter the seed as you walk along the road. You say, Hemp seed, I sow thee. Hemp seed, I sow thee. He who is to be my true love, appear now and show thee. And if you look furtively over your shoulder, you will behold the desired apparition following you. When Nellie came back from consulting the oracle of the kale yard, it appeared that she had received what oracles generally vouchsafe, a doubtful answer. What kind of custard did you pull, Nellie? Hector asked of her. Well, said she, it is not much one way or the other. No, I cannot tell anything by it. But I am going out now to sow the hemp seed, Hector. I shall be far too frightened to look over my shoulder. And this is what I want you to do for me. You will stop at the door of the inn and hide yourself, and I will go up the road and sow the hemp seed, and if anything appears, you will see it. Will you do that, Hector? It is a clear night. You will be sure to see if there is anything. He did not seem in the mood for taking part in these superstitious observances, but he was good-natured, and eventually followed her to the door. The little walled garden in front of Inver Mudal Inn is shaped like a horseshoe, the two ends of the semicircle touching the main highway at some distance apart. He saw Nelly go up toward the main road, and looked after her absently and without interest. Nay, he was so little thinking of his promised watch, that as she was some time over the sowing of the hemp seed, he left the shadow of the inn door and strolled away up the main road by the other fork of the semicircular drive. It was a beautiful clear moonlit night. His thoughts were far away from the Halloween diversions. He was recalling other evenings long ago, when Cleverig, as now, seemed joining earth and heaven, and when there was no sound but the murmuring of the burns through the trackless heather. The highway up there was white before him. On the other side was a plantation of young firs, black as jet. Not even the cry of a startled bird broke this perfect stillness. The wide world of mountains and lochs and moor was plunged in sleep profound. All at once his pipe, that he happened to be holding in his hand, dropped to his feet. There before him in the white highway, and between him and the black belt of the fairs, stood Flora Campbell, regarding him with eyes that said nothing, but only stared in a somewhat sad way, as it seemed. He was not paralysed with terror at all. He had no time to ask himself what she was doing here, or how she had come here. Flora Campbell, standing there in the road, and looking at him in silence, and then the horror came when suddenly he saw that the white highway was empty. He began to shake and shiver as if with extremity of cold. He did not move. He could not move. He knew what had happened to him now. Flora Campbell's wraith had appeared to him. But with what message? The steady gaze of her eyes had told him nothing. If they were anything, they were mournful. Perhaps it was a token of farewell. Perhaps it was an intimation of death. Hardly knowing what he did, and trembling in every limb, he advanced a step or two, so that he could command the whole length of the highway. There was no sign of any living thing there. He could not recall how it was she first appeared. He could not tell in what manner she had gone away. He only knew that for a few moments before, Flora had been regarding him with steady plaintive eyes, and that now he was alone with this moonlit road and black plantation, and Cleberg rising far into the silent heavens. Then there arose in his heart a wild resolve, that whatever this thing might portend, he must instantly make way for the South, to seek out Flora Campbell herself. She had something to say to him, surely, though those mournful eyes conveyed no intelligible message. Hey, if she were dead, if this were but a mute farewell, must he not know? Dazed, bewildered, filled with terrible misgivings of he knew not what, he slowly went back to the inn. He had some vague instinct that he must ask Mr. Murray for the loan of a stick if he were to set out now to cross the leagues of wild and mountainous country that lie between Invermoodal and the sea. Mr. Murray, as a chance, was at the door. God sakes, Hector, what is the matter with you? He exclaimed in alarm, for there was a strange look in his face. I have seen something this night, was the answer, spoken slowly and in an undertone. Nonsense, nonsense, the innkeeper said. The heads of the young people are filled with foolishness on Halloween, as every one knows. 
but you, you are not to be frightened by their stories. It has not to do with Halloween, said Hector, still with his eyes fixed on the ground, as if seeking to recall something. Do you know what I have seen this night? I have seen the wraith of Flora Campbell, aye, as clear as daylight. I do not believe it, Hector, said Mr. Murray. You have been hearing all those stories of the witches and fairies and Halloween until your own head has been turned. Why, where did you see the wraith? Up there in the road, and as clear as daylight, for that is the truth. It was Flora herself. The tall forester made answer, not argumentatively, but as merely stating a fact that he knew. And did she come forward to you, or did she go away from you? Mr. Murray asked curiously. I, I am not sure, Hector said, after a little hesitation. No, I could not say. Perhaps I was not thinking of her. But all at once I saw her between me and the plantation in the middle of the road, and for a moment I was not frightened. I thought it was Flora herself. And she was gone. For you know what they say, Hector, Mr. Murray continued. When a wraith appears, it is to tell you of a great danger, and if it comes forward to you, then the danger is over. But if it goes away from you, the person is dead. Ay, ay, I've heard that too, Hector murmured, as if in sombre reverie. Then he looked up and said, I am going away to the south. Well, now, that is unfortunate, Hector, the good-natured innkeeper said to him, for tomorrow the mail comes north, and you will have to wait till the next day for the mail going south to take you to the lair to catch the train. I will not wait for the mail, answered the forester, who indeed knew little about travelling by railway. Tomorrow is Wednesday. It is the day the big steamer starts from Loch Inver. Perhaps I may be in time. Loch Inver? the other exclaimed. And how are you going to get to Loch Inver from here, Hector? Across the forest, was the simple reply. Across the Ray forest and down by Loch Assynt. That will be a fearful journey through the night. I cannot rest here, Hector said. You will make some excuse for me to the lads and lasses. I will leave my pipes. Long Murdoch will do very well with them. And I will thank you to lend me a stick, Mr. Murray, for it will be a rough walk before I have done. Mr. Murray did more than that. He got his wife to make up a little packet of food, to which he added a flask of whiskey, and these he took out for the young man, along with a shepherd's staff of stout hazel. Goodbye, Hector, said he. I hope you will find all well in the south. I do not know about that, the forester answered, in an absent sort of fashion. But I must go and see. There will be no peace of mind for me. There would not be one moment's space for me. Otherwise, for who knows what Flora wanted to say to me. 3. It was an arduous task he had set before him. For nine men out of ten it would have been an impossible one. But this young forester's limbs knew not what fatigue was and in his heart there burned a longing that could not be assuaged. Nor in ordinary circumstances would the loneliness of this night journey have mattered to him, but his nerves had been unstrung by the strange thing that had happened, and now, as he followed the shepherd's track that led away into the higher moorlands south of the Mudal River, he was conscious of some mysterious influence surrounding him that was of far more immediate concern than the mere number of miles, some forty or fifty, he had to accomplish before noon of the next day. Those vast solitudes into which he was penetrating were apparently quite voiceless and lifeless, and yet he felt as if they knew of his presence and were regarding him. A white stone on a dark heather-covered knoll would suddenly look like a human face, or again he would be startled by the moonlight shining on a small turn set among the black peat hogs. There was no moaning of the wind, but there was a distant murmuring of water. The rills were whispering to each other in the silence. As for the mountains, those lone sentinels, Ben Loyal and Ben Hope and Ben He, they also appeared to be looking down upon the desolate plain. But he did not hate them. They were too far away. It was the objects near him that seemed to know he was here, and to take sudden shapes as he went by. Soon he was without even a shepherd's track to guide him. But he knew the lay of the land, and he held on in a line that would avoid the locks, the deeper burns, and the steep heights of Miel and Amer. The moonlight was of great help. Indeed, at this period of his long through the night tramp, he was chiefly engaged in trying to recall how it was he first became sensible that Flora Campbell's wraith appeared before him. He saw again, surely he would never forget to his dying day, the most insignificant feature of the scene, the stone wall of the garden, the white road, the wire fence of the other side, and the black plantation of spruce and pine. 
What had he been thinking about? Not about Nellie. She was some distance in another direction, busy with her charms and incantations. No, he could not tell. The sudden apparition had startled him out of all memory. But what he was most anxious to convince himself was that the phantom had come toward him, rather than gone away from him ere it disappeared. Mr. Murray's words had sunk deep, though he himself had been aware of the familiar superstition. But now all his endeavours to summon up an accurate recollection of what had taken place were of no avail. He knew not how he first became conscious that the wraith was there, Flora Campbell herself, as it seemed to him, nor how it was he suddenly found himself alone again. He had been terrified out of his senses. He had no power of observation left. This phantasm that looked so like a human being, that regarded him with pathetic eyes, that had some mysterious message to communicate, and yet was silent, had vanished as it had appeared. He could not tell how. The hours went by. The moon was sinking toward the western hills, and still he toiled on through his pathless waste, sometimes getting into treacherous swamps, again having to ford burns swollen by the recent rains. He was soaked through to the waste, but little he heeded that. His thoughts were of his steamer that was to leave Loch Inver the next day. With the moon going down, darkness was slowly resuming her reign, and it became more difficult to make out the landmarks. But, at all events, the heavens remained clear, and he had the guidance of the stars. And still steadily and patiently and manfully he held on, getting across the streams that fed Loch Fiodag without much serious trouble, until eventually he struck the highway running northward from Loch Llyn, and knew that so far at least he was in the right direction. Leaving the Cory Kinloch road again, he had once more to plunge into the trackless wilderness of rock and swamp and moorland, and the further he went through the black night, the less familiar was he with the country, for he had a general knowledge, and what matters half a dozen miles one way or the other. If only the dawn could show him Ben Moore on his left, and always before him the silver-grey waters of Loch Ascent. He was less conscious now of the sinister influences of the lonely solitudes. His nervous apprehensions had given way before this dogged resolve to get out of the western shores in time to catch the steamer. All his attention was given to determining his course by the vague outlines of the higher hills. A wind had arisen, a cold, raw wind it was, but he cared nothing for that, unless indeed it should bring a smore of rain and obliterate the landmarks altogether. How anxiously he prayed for the dawn, if this wind were to bring driving mists of rain, blotting out both earth and heaven, and limiting his visions to the space of moorland immediately surrounding him, where would be his guidance then? He could not grope his way along the slopes that lie beneath Loch Manscarer, nor yet across the streams that fall into Loch Fion. So all the more resolutely he held on, while as yet he could make out something of the land, dark against the tremulous stars. Again and again he turned his head and scanned the east with a curious mingling of impatience and hope and longing, and at last, to his unspeakable joy, he was able to convince himself that the horizon there was giving a faint signs of the coming dawn. He went forward with a new confidence, with a lighter step. The horror of these awful solitudes would disappear with the declaring day. Surely, surely, when the world had grown white again, he would behold before him not this terrible black loneliness of mountains and mere, but the pleasant abodes of men and trees in the western ocean, and the red funnel steamer with its welcome smoke. The grey light in the east increased. He began to make out the features of the ground near him. He could tell a patch of heather from a deep hole, and could choose his way. The world seemed to broaden out. Everything, it is true, was as yet wan and spectral and ill-defined. But the silence was no longer awful. He had no further fear of the mists coming along to isolate him in the dark. By slow degrees, under the widening light of the sky, the various features of this wild country began to take more definite shape. Down there in the south lay the mighty mass of Ben Moore. On his right rose the sterile altitudes of Ben Uid. And at last, and quite suddenly, he came in view of the ruffled silvery surface of Loch Ascent, and the cottages of Inqua Damf, and the grey ruins of the Adro Castle on the promontory jutting out into the lake. The worst of the sore fight with solitude and the night was over. He gained the road, and his long swinging stride now stood him in good stead. Loch Ascent was soon left behind. He followed the windings of the river inward. Finally he came in sight of the scattered little hamlet facing the western sea, with its bridge and its church and its pleasant woods and slopes, looking all so cheerful and homelike. And there also was the red funnel Klausmann that was to carry him away to the south. 4. 
that long and difficult struggle to get out to the western coast in time had so far demanded all his energy and attention. But now, in enforced idleness, as a heavy steamer ploughed her way through the blue waters of the mink, his mind could go back upon what had happened the preceding night, and could also look forward with all sorts of dark and indefinite forebodings. He began to recall his first association with Flora Campbell, when she came to Ochnaver Lodge to help the old housekeeper there. He remembered how neat and trim she looked when she walked into the straightly free church of a Sunday morning, and how shy she was when he got to know her well enough to talk a little with her when they met in their native tongue. Their courtship and engagement had the entire approval of Flora's master and mistress, for the old housekeeper at the lodge was now past work, and they proposed to install Hector's wife in her place and give her a permanent situation. The wedding was to be in February or March. In April, the young wife was to move into the lodge to get it ready for the gentleman coming up for the salmon fishing. When the fishing and shooting of the year was over, Flora could return to her husband's cottage and merely look in at the lodge from time to time to light a fire or two and keep the place aired. Meanwhile, for this present winter, she had taken a situation in Oban. She was a West Highland girl and had remained there until summoned away to Grenock by the serious illness of her sister. Such was the situation. But who could tell now what was to become of all those fair prospects and plans? Was it to bid a last farewell to them and to him that the young Highland girl had appeared, saying good-bye with such mournful eyes? The small parlour in his cottage. Was she never to see the little adornments he had placed there, all for her sake? Well then, if what he feared had come true, no other woman should enter and take possession. There were dreams of Canada, of Cape Colony, of Australia in his brain, as he sat there with bent brow and heavy heart, taking hardly any heed of the new shores they were now nearing. This anguish of brooding became at length insupportable. In despair, he went to the stevedore and said he would be glad to lend a hand with a cargo as soon as the steamer was alongside the quay in Stornoway Harbour, and right hard he worked to, hour after hour, feeding the steam crane that was swinging crates and boxes over and down into the hold. The time passed more easily in this fashion. His chum was a good-natured young fellow who seemed rather proud of his voice. At times he sang snatches of Gaelic songs, Myri Bhin, Meol, Shuliach, Mary of the Bewitching Eyes, or Eit in Kaidil and Ribbin, Where Sleepest Thou, Dear Maiden. They were familiar songs, but there was one still more familiar that woke strange echoes in his heart, for Flora Campbell was a West Country girl, and of course her favourite was the well-known Fierabata. I climb the mountains and scan the ocean, for thee, my boatman with fond devotion. When shall I see thee? Today, tomorrow. Oh, do not leave me in lonely sorrow. Oh, my boatman, ma horo ailia. Oh, my boatman, na horo ailia. Oh, my boatman, na horo ailia. Oh, my boatman, na horo ailia. A hundred farewells to you, wherever you may be going. That is how it begins in the English but it was the Gaelic phrases that haunted his brain and brought him remembrance of Flora's crooning voice and of a certain autumn evening when he and she and some others went all the way down Loch Navar to Invermudal, Flora and he sitting together in the stern of the boat and all of them singing the Fiera Bata. The clansmen left Storm away that same night, groaning and thundering through the darkness on a way to sky. Hector did not go below into the fore cabin. He remained on deck, watching the solitary ray of some distant lighthouse, or perhaps turning his gaze upon the great throbbing vault overhead, where Cassiopeia sat, throned upon her silver chair. More than once an aerolite shot swiftly across the clear heavens, leaving a faint radiance for a second or so in its wake. But he took no heed of these portents now. In other circumstances they might mean something, but now a more direct summons had come to him from the unknown world. The message had been delivered, though he had been unable to understand it, and he knew that what was to happen had now happened in that far town of Grenock. And all the slow hours went by, his impatience and longing increasing almost to despair. The dark loom of land in the south appeared to come no nearer. The monotonous throbbing of the screws seemed as if it were to go on forever, and as yet there was no sign of the dawn. But the new day, which promised to be quite insupportable in its tedium and in its fears, in reality brought him some distraction, and that was welcome enough. At Portree there came on board a middle-aged man of rather mean aspect, with broken nose, long upper lip, and curiously set small grey eyes, 
He carried a big bag, which apparently held all his belongings, and that he threw on to the luggage on the forward deck. "'Where's this going to?' called the stevedore. "'Sure, tis bound for the same place as myself,' said the newcomer facetiously. "'And that's Philadelphia, big gob.' "'We don't call there,' retorted the stevedore dryly. "'And you'd better stick to your bundle if you want to say it at Greenock. And very soon it became apparent that the advent of this excited and voluble Irishman had brought new life into the steerage portion of the ship. He had had a glass or two of whiskey. He talked to everybody within hearing about himself, his plans, his former experiences of the United States. And when graveled for lack of matter, he would fall back on one invariable refrain. Oh, big gob! The Americans are the boys! And in especial were his confidences bestowed on Hector McIntyre, the shy and reserved Highlander, listening passively and without protest to Parry's wild asseverations. Oh, the Americans are the devils, and no mistake! he exclaimed. But let me tell you this, sir, that there's one there's cleverer than them, and that's the Irish boy, big gob. Sure, they talk about the German vote, ah, oh, blather shine. Tis the Irish vote, sir, that's the master, and we've got the newspapers. And where would the Republicans or the Democrats be without us? Tell me that I've ye place. In this old country, the Irishman is a slave. In America, he's the master, and every mother's son of them knows it. Ah, by gob, sir, that's the place for a man. This old country isn't fit for a pig to live in. America is the place. You might bet your life on it, sir. And suddenly it occurred to Hector that he might gain some information, even from this blathering foe. His thoughts had been running much on emigration during those lonely hours he had passed. If what he dreaded had really taken place, he would return no more to the lone moorlands and hills and lakes of Sutherlandshire. He would put the wide Atlantic between himself and certain memories. For him it would be Sorait Slan, Litier Mograith, a long farewell to Finnery. But at present the Irishman would not be questioned. The outflowing of his eloquence was not to be stopped. He was now dealing with the various classes and various institutions of Great Britain, on each of which he bestowed the same epithet, that of bloody. The government, the newspaper editors, the House of Lords, the House of Commons, the clergy, the judges, the employers of labour, all were of the same ensanguined hue, and all were equally doomed to perdition as soon as Ireland had taken up a proper and inevitable position in America. Moreover, the tall and silent Highlander, as he sat and gazed upon the frothing creature, as if he were some strange phenomenon, some incomprehensible freak of nature, could not but say that the man was perfectly in earnest. Look what they did to John Mitchell. Look at that now, John Mitchell. Hector had unfortunately never heard of John Mitchell, so he could not say anything. Dying by the roadside, John Mitchell, to be left to die by the roadside. Oh, think of that now. What do you say to that now? John Mitchell being left to die by the roadside. There were sudden tears in the deep sunken grey eyes, and the Irishman made no concealment as he wiped them away with his red cotton handkerchief. Well, I'm very sorry, Hector McIntyre replied in answer to this appeal, whoever he was. But what could they have done for the poor man? They could have given him a place, the other retorted with a sudden blaze of anger. All that John Mitchell wanted was a place. But they, ensanguined, government, would they do it? Oh, sir, they let him die by the roadside, John Mitchell. To die by the roadside. Well, I am thinking, said the forester slowly, as was his way when he had to talk in English, that if the government was to give places to all them that would like a place, why the whole country would be in the public service, and there would be no one left to till the land. And do they give you a place when you go to America? Ah, be gobbed, sir, said the Irishman with a shrewd twinkle in his eye. We get our share. Hector could not make out whether his new acquaintance had been to Portray to say goodbye to some friends before he crossed the Atlantic, or whether he had been engaged in the Crofter agitation, which was then attracting attention in Sky. On this latter subject, Parry discoursed with a vehement volubility and a gay and audacious ignorance, but here Hector was on his own ground and had to interfere. I am thinking you will not be knowing much about it, he observed with a calm frankness. 
the great highland clearances, they were not made for deer at all. They were not made for sportsmen at all. They were made for sheep, as many a landlord knows to cost this day, when he has the sheep farms on his lands and cannot get them let. And the deer forests, they are the worst land in a country where the best land is poor. And if they were to be cut up into crofts tomorrow, there is not one crofter in twenty would be able to earn his living, even if he was to get the crop for no rent at all. Oh, yes, I am as sorry as any one for the poor people when they increase in their families on such poor land. But what would be the use of giving them more peat hogs and rocks? Can a man live whether neither deer nor sheep nor black cattle can live? And even the deer come down in the winter and go wandering for miles in search of a blade of bent grass. However, the Irishman could not accept these representations in any wise. He suspected this grave, brown-bearded Highlander of being an accomplice and hireling of the ensanguined landlords, and he might have gone on to denounce him, or even to provoke an appeal to fisticuffs, which would have been manifestly imprudent, had it not suddenly occurred to him that they might go down below and have a glass of whiskey together. Hector saw him disappear into the fore cabin by himself, and was perhaps glad to be left alone. Steadily, the great steamer clove her way upward by the islands of Rasay and Scalpa, through the narrows of Kyle Akane and Kyle Hlea, past the lighthouse and opening to Isle Orsney, and down toward the wooded shores of Armadale. The day was fair and still. The sea was of an almost summer-like blue, save for long swaths of silver calm. The sun shone on the lower green slopes that seemed so strangely voiceless, and on the higher peaks and shoulders of the hills, where every quarry and watercourse was a thread of azure among the ethereal rose greys of the far-reaching summits. Even the wild Ardnamurehan, the headland of the great waves, had not a flake of cloud clinging to its beetle cliffs, and the long smooth roll that came in from the outer ocean was almost imperceptible. Toward evening the clansmen sailed into Oban Bay. The world seemed all on fire, so far as sea and sky were concerned, but Carrera lay in shadow a cold and livid green, while between the crimson water and crimson heavens stood the distant mountains of Mole, and they had grown to be of a pale, clear, transparent rose purple, so that they seemed a mere film thinner than any icing glass. 5. There was abundance of time for him to go ashore and make inquiries, but nothing had been heard of Flora Campbell since she had left. However, he managed to get the address of her sister, Mary Campbell, and with that in his possession he returned on board. Thereafter, the monotonous voyage was resumed, away down by the long peninsula of Kentire, and round the mole, up again through the estuary of the Clyde, until at four o'clock on the Friday afternoon, the clansmen drew into Grinnock Quay, and Hector McIntyre knew that within a few minutes he would learn what fate had in store for him for good or irretrievable ill. He found his way to the address that had been given him, a temperance hotel at which Mary Campbell was head laundry maid. But Mary Campbell's was no longer there. She had been removed when she was taken ill, and, as she would not go into a hospital, according to familiar prejudice amongst many of her class, lodgings had been found for her. Thither Hector went forthwith, to a slummy little by-street, where after many inquiries he found the land and the clothes that he sought. He ascended the grimy and dusky stone stairs. When he had nearly reached the top floor, he was met by a stout, stout elderly man who had just shut a door behind him. Is there one Mary Campbell living here? He made bold to ask in English. Aye, that there is, said the stranger, fixing keen eyes on him. Are you come for news of her? I am the doctor. Yes, yes, Hector said, but could say no more. His heart was beating like to choke him. He fixed his eyes on the doctor's face. You'll be one of her highland cousins, eh? You dinna look like a town bred lad said the brusque and burly doctor, with a sort of facetious good humour. Well, well, Mary is getting on right enough. You might as well go in and cheer her up a bit. The two lasses didn't seem to have many friends. But, but Flora, said the forester, with his hungry, haggard eyes, still watching every expression of the doctor's face. The other one? Indeed, she has had the fever worse than her sister. I was not sure one night but that she would go. McIntyre seemed to hear no more. Flora was alive, was within a few yards of him. He stood there quite dazed. His eyes were averted. He was breathing heavily. The doctor looked at him for a moment or two. 
Maybe it's the sister you're anxious about, said he bluntly. Well, she is no out of the wood yet, but she has a fair chance. What, man, what's the matter with ye? It's not such ill news. No, no, it's very good news, Hector said in an undertone as if to himself. I was fearing something. Can I see the lass? I was not hearing from her for a while. But he could not explain what had brought him hither. He instinctively knew that this south countryman would laugh at his highland superstition, would say that his head had been stuffed full of Halloween nonsense, or that at most what he had imagined he had seen, and the fact that Flora Campbell had fallen seriously ill formed but a mere coincidence. Oh, yes, you can see her, the doctor said with rough good nature. But I'll just go in beforehand to give her a bit of warning. You can talk to her sister for a minute or two. She's sitting up now, and soon she'll have to begin and nurse her sister, as her sister did her until she took the fever. Come away, lad. What's your name, did you say? Hector McIntyre. Flora will know very well where I am from. The doctor knocked at the door, which was presently opened by a young girl, and while he left Hector to talk to the elder sister, who was lying propped up on a rude couch in a rather shabby little apartment, he himself went into an inner room. When he came out, he again looked at Hector curiously. "'Now I understand why you were so anxious,' said he with a familiar smile. "'Thou came ye to hear she was ill. She says she did not want ye to ken anything about it until she was on the high road to getting better.' Hector did not answer him. He only looked toward the door that had been partially left open. "'Go in, then,' said the doctor. "'And did not stay over long, my lad, for she had little strength to waste in talking as yet.' Timidly, like a schoolboy, this big strong man entered the sick room, and it was gently and on tiptoe, lest his heavily nailed boots should make any noise. That he went forward to the bedside. Flora lay there, pale and emaciated, but there was a smile of surprise and a welcome in the dark blue highland eyes, and she tried to lift her wasted hand to meet us. What they had to say to each other was said in the Gaelic tongue. "'It is sorry I am to say you like this,' said he setting down and keeping her hand in his own. But the doctor says you are now in a fair way to get better, and it is not from this town I am going until I take you with me, Flora, girl of my heart. The Sutherland air will be better for you than the Grenach air, and your sister Mary will come with you for a while, and both of you will take my little cottage, and Mrs. Matheson will give me a bed at Achnava Lodge. I am sure Mr. Lennox would not object to that. But Hector, how did he know that I was ill? The sick girl said and her eyes did not leave his eyes for a moment. I was not wishing you to know I was ill, to give you trouble, till I could write to you that I was better. How did I know? he answered gravely. It was you yourself who came to tell me. What is it that you say, Hector? she said, in some vague alarm. On Halloween night, he continued, in the same serious, simple tones, I was at Invermoodal. Perhaps I was not caring much for the diversions of the lads and lasses. I walked up the road by myself, and there your wraith appeared to me as clear as I see you now. When I went back and told Mr. Moray, he said, Did she come forward to you, Hector, or did she go away? She is in great danger. It is a warning, and if she went away from you, you will see her no more. But if she came forward, she is getting better. You will see Flora again. I knew that myself, but I could not answer him, and my heart said to me that I must find out for myself that I must go to seek you, and I set out that night and walk across the Ray Forest to Loch Inver and caught the steamer there. What I have been thinking since I left Loch Inver until this hour, I cannot tell you or to any one living. Hector, she asked, what night was Halloween night? I have not been thinking of such things. It was the night of Tuesday, he answered. And that, she said in a low voice, was the night that my fever took the turn. Mary told me they did not expect me to be alive in the morning. We will never speak of it again, Flora, said he, for there are things that we do not understand. And then he added, but now that I am in Krenak, it is in Krenak I mean to remain until I can take you away with me, and Mary too, for Sutherland air is better than Krenak air for a highland lass. Ain't sure I am that Mr. Lennox will not grudge me having a bed at Achnava Lodge, and you will get familiar with the cottage, Flora where I hope you will soon be mistress, and then there will be no more occasion for a great distance between you and me, 
or for the strange things that sometimes happen when people are separated the one from the other. End of The Halloween Wraith by William Black Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama An Account of Some Strange Disturbances in Angier Street by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. An Account of Some Disturbances in Angier Street. It is not worth telling the story of mine, at least not worth writing told indeed as i have sometimes been called upon to tell it to a circle of intelligent and eager faces lighted up by a good after-dinner fire on a winter's evening with a cold wind rising and wailing outside and all snug and cosy within it has gone off though i say it who should not indifferent well but it is a venture to do as you would have me pen ink and paper are cold vehicles for the marvellous and a reader decidedly a more critical animal than a listener if however you can induce your friends to read it after nightfall and when the fireside talk has run for a while on thrilling tales of shapeless terror in short if you will secure me the molia tempora fundi i will go to my work and say my say with better heart well then these conditions presupposed i shall waste no more words but tell you simply how it all happened my cousin tom ludlow and i studied medicine together i think he would have succeeded had he stuck to the profession but he preferred the church for a fellow and died early a sacrifice to contagion contracted in the noble discharge of his duties for my present purpose i say enough of his character when i mention that he was of a sedate but frank and cheerful nature very exact in his observance of truth and not by any means like myself of an excitable or nervous temperament my uncle ludlow tom's father while we were attending lectures purchased three or four old houses in angier street one of which was unoccupied he resided in the country and tom proposed that we should take up our abode in the untenanted house so long as it should continue unlet a move which would accomplish the double end of settling us nearer alike to our lecture rooms and to our amusements and of relieving us from the weekly charge of rent for our lodgings our furniture was very scant our whole equipage remarkably modest and primitive and in short our arrangements pretty nearly as simple as those of a bivouac our new plan was therefore executed almost as soon as conceived the front drawing-room was our sitting-room i had the bedroom over it and tom the back bedroom on the same floor which nothing could have induced me to occupy the house to begin with was a very old one it had been i believe newly fronted about fifty years before but this exception it had nothing modern about it the agent who bought it and looked into the titles for my uncle told me that it was sold along with much other forfeited property at chichester house i think in seventeen o two and had belonged to sir thomas hackett who was lord mayor of dublin in james the second's time how old it was then i can't say but at all events it had seen years and changes enough to have contracted all that mysterious and saddened air at once exciting and depressing which belongs to most old mansions there had been very little done in the way of modernizing details and perhaps it was better so for there was something queer and bygone in the very walls and ceilings in the shape of doors and windows in the odd diagonal sight of the chimney pieces in the beams and ponderous cornices not to mention the singular solidity of all the woodwork from the banisters to the window frames which hopelessly defied disguise and would have emphatically proclaimed their antiquity through any conceivable amount of modern finery and varnish an effort had indeed been made to the extent of papering the drawing-rooms but somehow the paper looked raw and out of keeping and the old woman who kept a little dirt pie of a shop in the lane and whose daughter a girl of two-and-fifty was our solitary handmaid coming in at sunrise and chastely receding again as soon as she had made all ready for tea in our state apartment this woman i say remembered it when old judge horrocks who having earned the reputation of a particularly hanging judge ended by hanging himself as a coroner's jury found under an impulse of temporary insanity with a child skipping rope 
over the massive old banisters, resided there, entertaining good company with fine venison and rare old port. In those halcyon days the drawing-rooms were hung with gilded leather, and, I dare say, cut a good figure, for they were really spacious rooms. The bedrooms were wainscoted, but the front room was not gloomy, and in it the coziness of antiquity quite overcome its sombre associations. But the back bedroom, with its two queerly placed melancholy windows, staring vacantly at the foot of the bed, and with the shadowy recess to be found in most old houses in Dublin, like a large ghostly closet, which, from congeniality of temperament, had amalgamated with the bedchamber and dissolved the partition. At night-time this alcove, as our maid was wont to call it, had in my eyes a specially sinister and suggestive character. Tom's distant and solitary candle glimmered vainly into its darkness. There it was always overlooking him, always itself impenetrable. But this was only part of the effect. The whole room was, I can't tell how, repulsive to me. There was, I suppose, in its proportions and features, a latent discord, a certain mysterious and indescribable relation which jarred indistinctly upon some secret sense of the fitting and the safe, and raised indefinable suspicions and apprehensions of the imagination. On the whole, as I began by saying, nothing could have induced me to pass a night alone in it. I had never pretended to conceal from poor Tom my superstitious weakness, and he, on the other hand, most unaffectedly ridiculed my tremors. The sceptic was, however, destined to receive a lesson, as you shall hear. We had not been very long in occupation of our respective dormitories when I began to complain of uneasy nights and disturbed sleep. I was, I suppose, the more impatient under this annoyance, as I was usually a sound sleeper and by no means prone to nightmares. It was now, however, my destiny, instead of enjoying my customary repose, every night to sup full of horrors. After a preliminary course of disagreeable and frightful dreams, my troubles took a definite form, and the same vision, without an appreciable variation in a single detail, visited me at least on an average every second night in the week. Now this dream, nightmare or infernal illusion, which you please, of which I was the miserable sport, was on this wise. I saw, or thought I saw, with the most abominable distinctness, although at the time in profound darkness, every article of furniture and accidental arrangement of the chamber in which I lay. This, as you know, is incidental to ordinary nightmare. Well, while in this clairvoyant condition, which seemed by the lighting up of the theatre, in which was to be exhibited the monotonous tableau of horror, which made my nights insupportable, my attention invariably became, I know not why, fixed upon the windows opposite the foot of my bed and, uniformly with the same effect, a sense of dreadful anticipation always took slow but sure possession of me. I became somehow conscious of a sort of horrid but undefined preparation going forward in some unknown quarter, and by some unknown agency, for my torment. And after an interval, which always seemed to me of the same length, a picture suddenly flew up to the window, where it remained fixed, as if by an electrical attraction, and my discipline of horror then commenced, to last perhaps for hours. The picture, thus mysteriously glued to the window panes, was the portrait of an old man, in a crimson-flowered silk dressing gown, the folds of which I could now describe, with a countenance embodying a strange mixture of intellect, sensuality, and power, but withal sinister and full of malignant omen. His nose was hooked, like the beak of a vulture, his eyes large, grey, and prominent, and lighted up with a more than mortal cruelty and coldness. These features were surmounted by a crimson velvet cap, the hair that peeped from under which was white with age, while the eyebrows retained their original blackness. Well, I remember every line, hue, and shadow of that stony countenance, and, well, I may. The gaze of this hellish visage was fixed upon me, and mine returned it with the inexplicable fascination of nightmare, for what appeared to me to be hours of agony. At last, the cock he crew, away then flew. The fiend who had enslaved me through the awful watches of the night, and harassed and nervous, I rose to the duties of the day. I had, I can't say exactly why, but it may have been from the exquisite anguish and profound impressions of unearthly horror with which the strange phantasmagoria was associated, an insurmountable antipathy to describing the exact nature of my nightly troubles to my friend and comrade. Generally, however, I told him that I was haunted by abominable dreams, and true to the imputed materialism of medicine, 
we put our heads together to dispel my horrors, not by exorcism, but by a tonic. I will do this tonic justice and frankly admit that the accursed portrait began to intermit its visits under its influence. What of that? Was the singular apparition as full of character as of terror, therefore the creature of my fancy, or the invention of my poor stomach? Was it, in short, subjective, to borrow the technical slang of the day, and not the palpable aggression and intrusion of an external agent? That, good friend, as we will both admit, by no means follows. The evil spirit who enthralled my senses in the shape of that portrait may have been just as near me, just as energetic, just as malignant, though I saw him not. What means the whole moral code of revealed religion regarding the due keeping of our bodies, soberness, temperance, etc.? Here is an obvious connection between the material and the invisible. The healthy tone of the system, and its unimpaired energy, may for aught we can tell, guard us against influences which would otherwise render life itself terrific. The mesmerist and the electrobiologist will fail upon an average with nine patients out of ten. So may the evil spirit. Special conditions of the corporeal system are indispensable to the production of certain spiritual phenomena. The operation succeeds sometimes, sometimes fails, that is all. I found afterwards that my would-be sceptical companion had his troubles too. But of these I knew nothing yet. One night, for a wonder, I was sleeping soundly when I was roused by a step on the lobby outside my room, followed by the loud clang of what turned out to be a large brass candlestick, flung with all his force by poor Tom Ludlow over the banisters, and rattling with a rebound down the second flight of stairs, and almost concurrently with this, Tom burst open my door and bounced into my room backwards in a state of extraordinary agitation. I had jumped out of bed and clutched him by the arm before I had any distinct idea of my own whereabouts. There we were, in our shirts, standing before the open door, staring through the great old banister opposite at the lobby window, through which the sickly light of a clouded moon was gleaming. "'What's the matter, Tom? What's the matter with you? What the devil's the matter with you, Tom?' I demanded, shaking him with nervous impatience. He took a long breath before he answered me, and then it was not very coherently. "'It's nothing, nothing at all. Did I speak? What did I say? Where's the candle, Richard? It's dark. I—' I had a candle. Yes, dark enough, I said. But what's the matter? What is it? Why don't you speak, Tom? Have you lost your wits? What is the matter? The matter? Oh, it is all over. It must have been a dream. Nothing at all but a dream. Don't you think so? It could not be anything more than a dream. Of course, said I, feeling uncommonly nervous. It was a dream. I thought, he said, there was a man in my room, and and I jumped out of bed, and, and where's the candle? In your room, most likely, I said. Shall I go and bring it? No, stay here. Don't go. It's no matter. Don't, I tell you. It was all a dream. Bolt the door, Dick. I'll stay here with you. I feel nervous. So, Dick, like a good fellow, light your candle and open the window. I'm in a shocking state. I did as he asked me and robing himself like Grenouille in one of my blankets, he seated himself close beside my bed. Everyone knows how contagious is fear of all sorts, but more especially that particular kind of fear under which poor Tom was at that moment labouring. I would not have heard, nor I believe would he have recapitulated, just at that moment, for half the world the details of the hideous vision which had so unmanned him. "'Don't mind telling me anything about your nonsensical dream, Tom.' said I, affecting contempt, really in a panic, let us talk about something else. But it is quite plain that this dirty old house disagrees with us both. And hang me if I stay here longer to be pestered with indigestion and bad nights, so we may as well look out for lodgings, don't you think so, at once? Tom agreed, and after an interval said, I have been thinking, Richard, that it is a long time since I saw my father, and I have made up my mind to go down tomorrow and return in a day or two, and you can take rooms for us in the meantime. I fancy that this resolution, obviously the result of the vision which had so profoundly scared him, would probably vanish next morning with the damps and shadows of night. But I was mistaken. Off went Tom at peep of day to the country, having agreed that so soon as I had secured suitable lodgings, I was to recall him by letter from his visit to my Uncle Ludlow. Now, anxious as I was to change my quarters, it so happened, owing to a series of petty procrastinations and accidents, that nearly a week elapsed before my bargain was made, 
and my letter of recall on the wing to Tom, and in the meantime a trifling adventure or two had occurred to your humble servant, which, absurd as they now appear, diminished by distance, did certainly at the time serve to whet my appetite for change considerably. A night or two after the departure of my comrade, I was sitting by my bedroom fire, the door locked, and the ingredients of a tumbler of hot whisky punch upon the crazy spider table for as the best mode of keeping the black spirits white and blue spirits in grey with which i was environed at bay i had adopted the practice recommended by the wisdom of my ancestors and kept my spirits up by pouring spirits down i had thrown aside my volume of anatomy and was treating myself by way of a tonic preparatory to my punch and bed to a half dozen pages of the spectator when i heard a step on the flight of stairs descending from the attics it was two o'clock and the streets were as silent as a churchyard. The sounds were therefore perfectly distinct. There was a slow heavy tread, characterized by the emphasis and deliberation of age, descending by the narrow staircase from above. And what made the sound most singular, it was plain that the feet which produced it were perfectly bare, measuring the descent with something between a pound and a flop, very ugly to hear. I knew well that my attendant had gone away many hours before, and that nobody but myself had any business in the house. It was quite plain also that the person who was coming downstairs had no intention whatever of concealing his movements, but, on the contrary, appeared disposed to make even more noise, and proceed even more deliberately, than was at all necessary. When the step reached the foot of the stairs outside my room, it seemed to stop, and I expected every moment to see my door open spontaneously, and give admission to the original of my detested portrait. I was, however, relieved in a few seconds by hearing the descent renewed just in the same manner, upon the staircase leading down to the drawing-rooms, and thence, after another pause, down the next flight, and so on to the hall, whence I heard no more. Now, by the time the sound had ceased, I was wound up, as they say, to a very unpleasant pitch of excitement. I listened, but there was not a stir. I screwed up my courage to a decisive experiment, opened my door, and in a centurion voice boiled over the banisters. "'Who's there?' There was no answer but the ringing of my own voice through the empty old house, no renewal of movement, nothing, in short, to give my unpleasant sensations a definite direction. There is, I think, something most disagreeably disenchanting in the sound of one's own voice under such circumstances, exerted in solitude and in vain. It redoubled my sense of isolation, and my misgivings increased in perceiving that the door, which I certainly thought I had left open, was closed behind me. In a vague alarm, lest my retreat should be cut off, I got again into my room as quickly as I could, where I remained in a state of imaginary blockade, and very uncomfortable indeed, till morning. Next night brought no return of my barefooted fellow lodger, but the night following, being in my bed and in the dark, somewhere, I suppose, about the same hour as before, I distinctly heard the old fellow again descending from the garrets. This time I had had my punch, and the morale of the garrison was consequently excellent jumped out of bed, clutched the poker as I passed the expiring fire, and in a moment was upon the lobby. The sound had ceased by this time. The dark and chill were discouraging. And guess my horror when I saw, or thought I saw, a black monster, whether in the shape of a man or a bear I could not say, standing with its back to the wall on the lobby, facing me, with a pair of great greenish eyes shining dimly out. Now I must be frank and confess that the cupboard which displayed our plates and cups stood just there, though at the moment I did not recollect it. At the same time, I must honestly say that making every allowance for an excited imagination, I never could satisfy myself that I was made the dupe of my own fancy in this matter. For this apparition, after one or two shiftings of shape, as if in the act of incipient transformation, began, as it seemed on second thoughts, to advance upon me in its original form. From an instinct of terror rather than of courage, I hurled the poker with all my force at its head, and to the music of a horrid crash made my way into my room and double-locked the door. Then in a minute more I heard the horrid bare feet walk down the stairs, till the sound ceased in the hall as on the former occasion. If the apparition of the night before was an ocular delusion of my fancy sporting with the dark outlines of our cupboard, and if its horrid eyes were nothing but a pair of inverted teacups, I had at all events the satisfaction of having launched the poker with admirable effect, and in true fancy phrase knocked its two daylights into one, as the commingled fragments of my tea service testified. I did my best to gather comfort and courage from these evidences, but it would not do. And then what could I say of those horrid bare feet and the regular tramp, 
tramp, tramp, which measured the distance of the entire staircase through the solitude of my haunted dwelling, and an hour when no good influence was stirring. Confound it! The whole affair was abominable. I was out of spirits and dreaded the approach of night. It came, ushered ominously in with a thunderstorm and dull torrents of depressing rain. Earlier than usual the streets grew silent, and by twelve o'clock nothing but the comfortless pattering of the rain was to be heard. I made myself as snug as I could. I lighted two candles instead of one. I forswore bed, and held myself in readiness for a sally, candle in hand, for coot ki coot I was resolved to see the baying, if visible at all, who troubled the nightly stillness of my mansion. I was fidgety and nervous, and tried in vain to interest myself with my books. I walked up and down my room, whistling in turn martial and hilarious music, and listening ever and anon for the dreaded noise. I sat down and stared at the square label on the solemn and reserved-looking black bottle until Flanagan and Company's best old malt whisky grew into a sort of subdued accompaniment to all the fantastic and horrible speculations which chased one another through my brain. Silence, meanwhile, grew more silent, and darkness darker. I listened in vain for the rumble of a vehicle or the dull clamour of a distant drow. There was nothing but the sound of a rising wind, which had succeeded the thunderstorm that had travelled over the Dublin mountains quite out of hearing. In the middle of this great city, I began to feel myself alone with nature, and heaven knows what beside. My courage was ebbing. Punch, however, which makes beasts of so many, made a man of me again, just in time to hear with tolerable nerve and firmness the lumpy, flabby, naked feet deliberately descending the stairs again. I took a candle, not without a tremor. As I crossed the floor, I tried to extemporize a prayer, but stopped short to listen, and never finished it. The steps continued. I confess I hesitated for some seconds at the door before I took heart of grace and opened it. When I peeped out, the lobby was perfectly empty. There was no monster standing on the staircase, and as the detested sound ceased, I was reassured enough to venture forward nearly to the banisters. Horror of horrors! Within a stair or two beneath the spot where I stood, the unearthly treads smote the floor. My eye caught something in motion. It was about the size of Goliath's foot. It was grey, heavy, and flapped with a dead weight from one step to another. As I am alive, it was the most monstrous grey rat I ever beheld or imagined. Shakespeare says, Some men here cannot abide a gaping pig, and some that are mad if they behold a cat. I went well nigh out of my wits when I beheld this rat. For laugh at me as you may, it fixed upon me, I thought, a perfectly human expression of malice. And, as it shuffled about and looked up into my face almost from beneath my feet, I saw I could swear it, I felt it then, and know it now, the infernal gaze in the accursed countenance of my old friend in the portrait, transfused into the visage of the bloated vermin before me. I bounced into my room again with a feeling of loathing and horror I cannot describe, and locked and bolted my door as if a lion had been on the other side. Damn him or it! Curse the portrait and its original! I felt in my soul that the rat, yes, the rat, the rat I had just seen, was that evil being in masquerade, and rambling through the house upon some infernal night lark. Next morning I was early, trudging through the miry streets, and among other transactions posted a peremptory note recalling Tom. On my return, however, I found a note from my absent chum announcing his intended return next day. I was doubly rejoiced at this, because I had succeeded in getting rooms and because the change of scene and return of my comrade were rendered specially pleasant by the last night's half-ridiculous, half-horrible adventure. I slept extemporaneously in my new quarters in Diggs's Street that night, and next morning returned for breakfast to the haunted mansion, where I was certain Tom would call immediately on his arrival. I was quite right. He came, and almost his first question referred to the primary object of our change of residence. "'Thank God,' he said with genuine fervour, on hearing that all was arranged. On your account I am delighted. As to myself, I assure you that no earthly consideration could have induced me ever again to pass a night in this disastrous old house. Confound the house, I ejaculated with a genuine mixture of fear and detestation. We have not had a pleasant hour since we came to live here. And so I went on, and related incidentally, my adventure with the plethoric old rat. Well, if that were all, said my cousin, affecting to make light of the matter, I don't think I should have minded it very much. 
"'Aye, but it's I. It's countenance, my dear Tom,' urged I. "'If you had seen that, you would have felt it might be anything but what it seemed.' "'I incline to think the best conjurer in such a case would be an able-bodied cat,' he said with a provoking chuckle. "'But let us hear of your own adventure,' I said tartly. At this challenge he looked uneasily round him. I had poked up a very unpleasant recollection. "'You shall hear it, Dick. I'll tell it to you,' he said. "'Be gad, sir. I should feel quite queer, though, telling it here, though we are too strong a body for ghosts to meddle with just now.' Though he spoke this like a joke, I think it was serious calculation. Our heave was in a corner of the room, packing our cracked delft tea and dinner services in a basket. She soon suspended operations, and with mouth and eyes wide open became an absorbed listener. Tom's experiences were told nearly in these words. I saw it three times, Dick, three distinct times, and I am perfectly certain it meant me some infernal harm. I was, I say, in danger, in extreme danger. For if nothing else had happened, my reason would most certainly have failed me, unless I had escaped so soon. Thank God, I did escape. The first night of this hateful disturbance, I was lying in the attitude of sleep in that lumbering old bed. I hate to think of it. I was really wide awake, though I had put out my candle and was lying as quietly as I had been asleep. But although accidentally restless, my thoughts were running in a cheerful and agreeable channel. I think it must have been two o'clock at least when I thought I heard a sound in that, that odious dark recess at the far end of the bedroom. It was as if someone was drawing a piece of cord slowly along the floor, lifting it up, and dropping it softly down again in coils. I sat up once or twice in my bed, but could see nothing, so I concluded it must be mice in the wainscot. I felt no emotion graver than curiosity, and after a few minutes ceased to observe it. While lying in this state, strange to say, without at first a suspicion of anything supernatural, on a sudden I saw an old man, rather stout and square, in a sort of roan red dressing gown and with a black cap on his head, moving swiftly and slowly in a diagonal direction, from the recess across the floor of the bedroom, passing my bed at the foot and entering the lumber closet at the left. He had something under his arm, his head hung a little to one side, and merciful God! when I saw his face. Tom stopped for a while and then said, That awful countenance, which, living or dying, I never can forget, disclosed what he was. Without turning to the right or left, he passed beside me and entered the closet by the bed's head. While this fearful and indescribable type of death and guilt was passing, I felt that I had no more power to speak or stir than if I had been myself a corpse. For hours after it had disappeared, I was too terrified and weak to move. As soon as daylight came, I took courage and examined the room, and especially the course which the frightful intruder had seemed to take. But there was not a vestige to indicate anybody's having passed there, no signs of any disturbing agency visible among the lumber that strewed the floor of the closet. I now began to recover a little. I was fagged and exhausted, and at last overpowered by a feverish sleep. I came down late and finding you out of spirits on account of your dreams about the portrait whose original I am now certain disclosed himself to me, I did not care to talk about the infernal vision. In fact, I was trying to persuade myself that the whole thing was an illusion, and I did not like to revive in their intensity the hated impressions of the past night, or to risk the constancy of my scepticism by recounting the tale of my sufferings. It required some nerve, I can tell you, to go to my haunted chamber next night and lie down quietly in the same bed, continued Tom. I did so with a degree of trepidation, which, I am not ashamed to say, a very little matter would have sufficed to stimulate to downright panic. This night, however, passed off quietly enough, as also the next, and so too did two or three more. I grew more confident, and began to fancy that I believed in the theories of spectral illusions with which I had first vainly tried to impose upon my convictions. The apparition had been indeed altogether anomalous. It had crossed the room without any recognition of my presence. I had not disturbed it, and it had no mission to me. What then was the imaginable use of its crossing the room in a visible shape at all? Of course, if it had been in the closet instead of going there, as easily as it introduced itself into the recess without entering the chamber in a shape discernible by the senses. Besides, how the deuce had I seen it? It was a dark night. I had no candle, there was no fire, 
and yet I saw it as distinctly and colouring in outline as ever I beheld a human form. A cataleptic dream would explain it all, and I was determined that a dream it should be. One of the most remarkable phenomena connected with the practice of mendacity is the vast number of deliberate lies we tell ourselves, whom, of all persons, we can least expect to deceive. In all this, I need hardly tell you, Dick, I was simply lying to myself and did not believe one word of the wretched humbug. Yet I went on, as men will do, like persevering charlatans and impostors, who tire people into credulity by the mere force of reiteration. So I hoped to win myself over at last to a comfortable scepticism about the ghost. Had he not appeared a second time, that certainly was a comfort. And what, after all, did I care for him and his queer old tuggery and strange looks? Not a fig. I was nothing the worse for having seen him, and a good story the better. So I tumbled into bed, put out my candle, and cheered by a loud drunken quarrel in the back lane, went fast asleep. From this slumber I awoke with a start. I knew I had had a horrible dream, but what it was I could not remember. My heart was thumping furiously. I felt bewildered and feverish. I sat up in the bed and looked about the room. A broad flood of moonlight came in through the curtainless window. Everything was as I had last seen it, and though the domestic squabble in the back lane was, unhappily for me, allayed, I yet could hear a pleasant fellow singing on his way home, the then popular comic ditty called Murphy Delaney. Taking advantage of this diversion, I lay down again, with my face towards the fireplace, and, closing my eyes, did my best to think of nothing else but the song, which was every moment growing fainter in the distance. "'Twas Murphy Delaney, so funny and frisky, stepped into a shaven shop to get a skin full. He reeled out again pretty well lined with whiskey, as fresh as a shamrock, as blind as a bull. A singer, whose condition I dare say resembled that of his hero, was soon too far off to regale my ears any more, and as this music died away, I myself sank into a doze, neither sound nor refreshing. Somehow the song had gotten to my head, and I went meandering on through the adventures of my respectable fellow countryman, who on emerging from the she-bean shop, fell into a river, from which he was fished up to be, sat upon by a coroner's jury, who having learned from a horse-doctor that he was dead as a doornail, so there was no end. Returned their verdict accordingly, just as he returned to his senses, when an angry altercation and a pitched battle between the body and the coroner winds up the lay with due spirit and pleasantry. Through this ballad I continued with a weary monotony to plod down to the very last line, and then da capo, and so on in my uncomfortable half-sleep for how long I can't conjecture. I found myself at last, however, muttering, "'Dead as a doornail,' So there was an end, and something like another voice within me seemed to say, very faintly but sharply, Dead, 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 and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. And instantaneously I was wide awake and staring right before me from the pillow. Now, will you believe it, Dick? I saw the same accursed figure standing full front and gazing at me with its stony and fiendish countenance, not two yards from the bedside. Tom stopped here and wiped the perspiration from his face. I felt very queer. The girl was as pale as Tom, and assembled as we were in the very scene of these adventures, we were all, I dare say, equally grateful for the clear daylight and the resuming bustle out of doors. For about three seconds only I saw it plainly. Then it grew indistinct. But for a long time there was something like a column of dark vapour where it had been standing, between me and the wall, and I felt sure that he was still there. After a good while, this appearance went too. I took my clothes downstairs to the hall, and dressed there with the door half open, then went out into the street and walked about the town till morning. When I came back in a miserable state of nervousness and exhaustion, I was such a fool, Dick, as to be ashamed to tell you how I came to be so upset. I thought you would laugh at me, especially as I'd always talked philosophy and treated your ghosts with contempt. I concluded you would give me no quarter. So kept a tale of horror to myself. Now, Dick, you will hardly believe me when I assure you that for many nights after this last experience I did not go to my room at all. I used to sit up for a while in the drawing-room after you had gone to your bed, and then steal down softly to the hall door, let myself out, and sit in the Robin Hood tavern until the last guest went off, and then I got through the night like a sentry, pacing the streets till morning. 
For more than a week I never slept in bed. I sometimes had a snooze on a form in the Robin Hood, and sometimes a nap in a chair during the day. But regular sleep I had absolutely none. I was quite resolved that we should get into another house. But I could not bring myself to tell you the reason. I somehow put it off from day to day, although my life was, during every hour of this procrastination, rendered as miserable as that of a felon with the constables on his track. I was growing absolutely ill from this wretched mode of life. One afternoon I determined to enjoy an hour's sleep upon your bed. I hated mine, so that I had never, except in a stealthy visit every day to unmake it, lest Martha should discover the secret of my nightly absence, enter the ill-omened chamber. As ill luck would have it, you had locked your bedroom and taken away the key. I went into my own to unsettle the bedclothes, as usual, and give the bed the appearance of having been slept in. Now, a variety of circumstances occurred to bring about the dreadful scene through which I was that night to pass. In the first place, I was literally overpowered with fatigue and longing for sleep. In the next place, the effect of this extreme exhaustion upon my nerves resembled that of a narcotic, and rendered me less susceptible than perhaps I should in any other condition have been of the exciting fears which had become habitual to me. Then again, a little bit of the window was open, a pleasant freshness pervaded the room, and to crown all the cheerful sun of day was making the room quite pleasant. What was to prevent my enjoying an hour's nap here? The whole air was resonant with the cheerful hum of life, and the broad matter-of-fact light of day filled every corner of the room. I yielded, stifling my qualms to the almost overpowering temptation, and merely throwing off my coat and loosening my cravat, I lay down, limiting myself to half an hour's doze, and the unwanted enjoyment of a feather bed, a coverlet, and a bolster. It was horribly insidious, and the demon no doubt marked my infatuated preparations. Dolt that I was, I fancied with mind and body worn out for want of sleep, and an arrear of a full week's rest to my credit, that such measures as half an hour's sleep in such a situation was possible. My sleep was death-like, long and dreamless. Without start or fearful sensation of any kind, I waked gently, but completely. It was, as you have good reason to remember, long past midnight, I believe about two o'clock, when sleep had been deep and long enough to satisfy nature thoroughly. One often wakens in this way, suddenly, tranquilly, and completely. There was a figure seated in that lumbering old sofa chair near the fireplace. Its back was rather towards me, but I could not be mistaken. It turned slowly round, and, merciful heavens, there was a stony face with its infernal lineaments of malignity and despair gloating on me. There was now no doubt as to its consciousness of my presence and the hellish malice with which it was animated, for it arose and drew close to the bedside. There was a rope about its neck, and the other end, coiled up, it held stiffly in its hand. My good angel nerved me for this horrible crisis. I remained for some seconds transfixed by the gaze of this tremendous phantom. He came close to the bed, and appeared on the point of mounting upon it. The next instant I was upon the floor at the far side, and in a moment was, I don't know how, upon the lobby. But the spell was not yet broken. The valley of the shadow of death was not yet traversed. The abhorred phantom stood before me there. It was standing near the banister, stooping a little, and with one end of the rope round its neck was poising a noose at the other, as if to throw it over mine, and while engaged in this baleful pantomime, it wore a smile so sensual, so unspeakably dreadful that my senses were nearly overpowered. I saw and remember nothing more until I found myself in your room. I had a wonderful escape, Dick. There is no disputing that. An escape for which, while I live, I shall bless the mercy of heaven. No one can conceive or imagine what it is for flesh and blood to stand in the presence of such a thing. But one who has had the terrific experience. Dick, Dick, a shadow has passed over me. A chill has crossed my blood and marrow. And I will never be the same again. Never, Dick, never. Our handmaid, a mature girl of two and fifty, as I have said, stayed her hand, as Tom's story proceeded, and by little and little drew near to us, with open mouth, and her brows contracted over her little beady black eyes, till, stealing a glance over her shoulder now and then, she established herself close behind us. 
During the relation she had made various earnest comments in an undertone, but these and her ejaculations, for the sake of brevity and simplicity, I have omitted in my narration. "'It's often I heard tell of it,' she now said. "'But I never believed it rightly till now. Though, indeed, why should not I? Does not my mother, down here in the lane, know queer stories? God bless us, beyond telling about it. But you ought not to have slept in the back room.' She was loath to let me be going in and out of that room, even in the daytime, let alone for any Christian to spend the night in it. For sure, she says it was his own bedroom. Whose own bedroom? we asked in a breath. Why, his, the old judge's, Judge Horrocks, to be sure. God rest his soul. And she looked fearfully round. Amen, I muttered. But did he die there? Die there? No, not quite there, she said. "'Sure, was it not over the banisters he hung himself, the old sinner? God be merciful to us all. And was not it in the alcove they found the handles of the skipping rope cut off, and the knife where he was settling the cord, God bless us, to hang himself with? It was his housekeeper's daughter who owned the rope, my mother often told me, and the child never throve after, and used to be starting up out of his sleep and screeching in the night-time, with dreams and frights that come on her.' and they said how it was the spirit of the old judge that was tormenting her, and she used to be roaring and yelling out to hold back the big old fellow with the crooked neck, and then she'd screech, Oh, the master, the master, he's stamping at me and beckoning to me, Mother darling, don't let me go. And so the poor creature died at last, and the doctors said it was rather on the brain, for it was all they could say. How long ago was all this? I asked. "'Oh, then, how would I know?' she answered. "'But it must be a wonderful long time ago, "'for the housekeeper was an old woman with a pipe in her mouth "'and not a tooth left, and better not eighty years old "'when my mother was first married. "'And they said she was a real buxom fine dress woman "'when the old judge come to his end. "'And indeed, my mother's not far from eighty years old herself this day, "'and what made it worse for the unnatural old villain, "'God rest her soul, to frighten the little girl out of the world the way he did.' was what was mostly thought and believed by every one. My mother says how the poor little creature was his own child, for he was by all accounts an old villain every way, and the hangingest judge that ever was known in Ireland's ground. "'From what you said about the danger of sleeping in that room,' said I, "'I suppose there were stories about the ghost having appeared there to others.' "'Well, there was things, and queer things, surely,' she answered, as it seemed with some reluctance. "'And why would not there?' Sure was it not up in that same room he slept for more than twenty years? And was it not in the alcove he got the rope ready that done his own business at last, the way he'd done many a better man in his lifetime? And was not the body lying in the same bed after death, and put in the coffin there too, and carried out to his grave from it in Peter's churchyard, after the coroner was done? But there were queer stories. My mother has them all. About how one Nicholas Pate got into trouble on the head of it. "'And what did they say of this Nicholas Pate?' I asked. "'Oh, for that matter, it's soon told,' she answered. And she certainly did relate a very strange story, which so piqued my curiosity, that I took occasion to visit the ancient lady, her mother, from whom I learned many very curious particulars. Indeed, I was tempted to tell the tale, but my fingers are weary, and I must defer it. But if you wish to hear it another time, I shall do my best.' When we had heard the strange tale I have not told you, we put one or two further questions to her about the alleged spectral visitations to which the house had, ever since the death of the wicked old judge, been subjected. No one ever had luck in it, she told us. There was always cross accidents, sudden deaths, and short times in it. The first took it was a family. I forget their name. But at any rate, there were two young ladies and their papa. He was about sixty and a stout, healthy gentleman, as you'd wish to see at that age. Well, he slept in that unlucky back bedroom, and God between us and harm, sure enough he was found dead one morning, half out of his bed, with his head as black as a shoe, and swelled like a puddin' hanging down near the floor. It was a fit, they said. He was as dead as a mackerel, and so he could not say what it was. But the old people were all sure that it was nothing at all but the old judge. God bless us! that frightened him out of his senses and his life together. Some time after, there was a rich old maiden lady took the house. I don't know which room she slept in, but she lived alone, 
and at any rate one morning the servants going down early to their work found her sitting on the passage stairs shivering and talking to herself quite mad and never a word more could any of them of her friends get from her ever afterwards but don't ask me to go for i promised to wait for him they never made out from her who it was she meant by him but of course those that knew all about the old house were at no loss for the meaning of all that happened to her then afterwards when the house was let out in lodgings there was mickey byrne that took the same room with his wife and three children and sure i heard mrs byrne myself telling how the children used to be lifted up in the bed at night she could not see by what means and how they were starting and screeching every hour just all as one as the housekeeper's little girl that died till at last one night poor mickey had a drop in him the way he used now and again and what do you think in the middle of the night she thought he heard a noise on the stairs and being in liquor nothing less i do him but out he must go himself to see what was wrong well after that all she ever heard of him was him saying oh god and a tumble that shook the very house and there sure enough he was lying on the lower stairs under the lobby with his neck smashed double under him where he was flung over the banisters then the handmaiden added i'll go down to the lane and send up joe garvey to pack up the rest of the tay things and bring all the things across to your new lodgings and so we sallied out together each of us breathing more freely i have no doubt as we crossed that ill omen threshold for the last time now i may add thus much in compliance with the immemorial usage of the realm of fiction which sees the hero not only through his adventures but fairly out of the world you must have perceived that what the flesh blood and bone hero of romance proper is to the regular compounder of fiction this old house of brick wood and mortar is to the humble recorder of this true tale i therefore relate as is duty bound the catastrophe which ultimately befell it which was simply this that about two years subsequently to my story it was taken by a quack doctor who called himself baron dulsturf and filled the parlour windows with bottles of indescribable horrors preserved in brandy and the newspapers with the usual grandiloquent and mendacious advertisements this gentleman among his virtues did not reckon sobriety and one night being overcome with much wine he set fire to his curtains partially burned himself and totally consumed the house it was afterwards rebuilt and for a time an undertaker established himself in the premises i have now told you my own and tom's adventures together with some valuable collateral particulars and having acquitted myself of my engagement i wish you a very good night and pleasant dreams end of an account of some strange disturbances in angier street by joseph sheridan le fanu read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama To the Dead in the Graveyard Under My Window by Adelaide Crapsey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout to the dead in the graveyard under my window by adelaide crapsey written in a moment of exasperation how can you lie so still all day i watch and never a blade of all the green sod moves to show where restlessly you toss and turn and fling a desperate arm or draw up knees stiffened and aching from their long disuse i watch all night and not one ghost comes forth to take its freedom of the midnight hour oh have you no rebellion in your bones the very worms must scorn you where you lie a pallid mouldering acquiescent folk meek inhabitants of unresented graves why are you there in your straight row on row 
where I must ever see you from my bed, that in your mere dumb presence iterate the text so weary in my ears. Lie still and rest. Be patient and lie still and rest. I'll not be patient. I will not lie still. There is a brown road runs between the pines, and further on the purple woodlands lie, and still beyond blue mountains lift and loom. And I would walk the road, and I would be deep in the wooded shade, and I would reach the windy mountain tops that touch the clouds. My eyes may follow, but my feet are held, recumbent as you others. Must I too submit, be mimic of your movelessness, with pillow and counterpane for stone and sod? And if the many sayings of the wise teach of submission, I will not submit. But with a spirit all unreconciled, Flash an unquenched defiance to the stars. Better it is to walk, to run, to dance. Better it is to laugh and leap and sing, To know the open skies of dawn and night, To move untrammeled down the flaming noon. And I will clamor it through weary days, Keeping the edge of deprivation sharp, nor with the pliant speaking on my lips of resignation, sister to defeat. I'll not be patient. I will not lie still. And in ironic quietude, who is the despot of our days and lord of dust needs but scarce heeding, wait to drop grim, casual comment? on rebellion's end. Yes, yes, willful and petulant, but now is dead and quiet as the other are. And this each body and ghost of you hath heard, that in your graves do therefore Lie so still. End of To the Dead in the Graveyard Under My Window Beyond the Wall by Ambrose Bierce This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Beyond the Wall Many years ago, on my way from Hong Kong to New York, I passed a week in San Francisco. A long time had gone by since I had been in that city, during which my ventures in the Orient had prospered beyond my hope. I was rich and could afford to revisit my own country, to renew my friendship with such of the companions of my youth as still lived and remembered me with the old affection. Chief of these, I hoped, was Mohan Dampier, an old schoolmate with whom I had held a desultory correspondence which had long ceased, as is the way of correspondence between men. You may have observed that the indisposition to write a merely social letter is in the ratio of the square of the distance between you and your correspondent. It is a law. I remember Dampier as a handsome, strong young fellow of scholarly tastes, with an aversion to work and a marked indifference to many of the things that the world cares for, including wealth, of which, however, he had inherited enough to put him beyond the reach of want. In his family, one of the oldest and most aristocratic in the country, it was, I think, a matter of pride that no member of it had ever been in trade nor politics, nor suffered any kind of distinction. Mohan was a trifle sentimental. 
and add in him a singular element of superstition, which led him to the study of all manner of occult subjects, although his sane mental health safeguarded him against fantastic and perilous fates. He made daring incursions into the realm of the unreal without renouncing his residence in the partly surveyed and charted region of what we are pleased to call certitude. The night of my visit to him was stormy. The Californian winter was on, and the incessant rain splashed in the deserted streets, or, lifted by irregular gusts of wind, was hurled against the houses with incredible fury. With no small difficulty, my cabman found the right place, away out toward the ocean beach in a sparsely populated suburb. The dwelling, a rather ugly one, apparently, stood in the centre of its grounds, which, as nearly as I could make out in the gloom, were destitute of either flowers or grass. Three or four trees, writhing and moaning in the torment of the tempest, appeared to be trying to escape from their dismal environment and take the chance of finding a better one out at sea. The house was a two-story brick structure with a tower, a story higher, at one corner. In the window of that was the only visible light. Something in the appearance of the place made me shudder, a performance that may have been assisted by a rill of rainwater down my back as I scuttled to cover in the doorway. In answer to my note apprising him of my wish to call, Dampier had written, Don't ring. Open the door and come up. I did so. The staircase was dimly lighted by a single gas jet at the top of the second flight. I managed to reach the landing without disaster and entered by an open door into the lighted square room of the tower. Dampier came forward in gown and slippers to receive me giving me the greeting that I wished, and if I had held a thought that it might more fitly have accorded me at the front door, the first look at him dispelled any sense of his inhospitality. He was not the same. Hardly past middle age, he had gone grey and had acquired a pronounced stoop. His figure was thin and angular, his face deeply lined, his complexion dead white, without a touch of colour. His eyes, unnaturally large, glowed with a fire that was almost uncanny. He seated me, proffered a cigar, and with grave and obvious sincerity assured me of the pleasure that it gave him to meet me. Some unimportant conversation followed. But all the while I was dominated by a melancholy sense of the great change in him. This he must have perceived, for he suddenly said with a bright enough smile, You are disappointed in me, non sum qualis eram. I hardly knew what to reply, but managed to say, why, really, I don't know. Your Latin is about the same. He brightened again. Oh, he said, being a dead language, it grows in appropriateness. But please have the patience to wait. Where I am going, there is perhaps a better tongue. Will you care to have a message in it? The smile faded as he spoke, and as he concluded, he was looking into my eyes with a gravity that distressed me. Yet I would not surrender myself to his mood, nor permit me to see how deeply his prescience of death affected me. I fancy that it will be long, I said, before human speech will cease to serve our need, and then the need, with its possibilities of service, will have passed. He made no reply, and I too was silent, for the talk had taken a dispiriting turn. Yet I knew not how to give it a more agreeable character. Suddenly, in a pause of the storm, where the dead silence was almost startling by contrast with the previous uproar, I heard a gentle tapping, which appeared to come from the wall behind my chair. The sound was such as might have been made by a human hand, not as upon a door by one asking admittance, but rather, I thought, as an agreed signal, an assurance of someone's presence in an adjoining room. Most of us, I fancy, have had more experience of such communications than we should care to relate. I glanced at Dampier. If possibly there was something of amusement in the look, he did not observe it. He appeared to have forgotten my presence and was staring at the wall behind me with an expression in his eyes that I am unable to name, although my memory of it is as vivid today as was my sense of it then. The situation was embarrassing. I rose to take my leave. At this he seemed to recover himself. Please be seated, he said. It is nothing. No one is there. But the tapping was repeated, and with the same gentle, slow insistence as before. Pardon me, I said. It is late. May I call tomorrow? He smiled, 
a little mechanically, I thought. "'It is very delicate of you,' said he, "'but quite needless. Really, this is the only room in the tower, and no one is there, at least.' He left the sentence incomplete, rose and threw up a window, the only opening in the wall from which the sound seemed to come. See. Not clearly knowing what else to do, I followed him to the window and looked out. A street lamp some little distance away gave enough light through the murk of the rain that was again falling in torrents to make it entirely plain that no one was there. In truth, there was nothing but the sheer blank wall of the tower. Dampier closed the window and, signing me to my seat, resumed his own. The incident was not in itself particularly mysterious. Any one of a dozen explanations was possible, though none had occurred to me. Yet it impressed me strangely, the more, perhaps, from my friend's efforts to reassure me, which seemed to dignify it with a certain significance and importance. He had proved that no one was there. But in that fact lay all the interest, and he proffered no explanation. His silence was irritating and made me resentful. My good friend, I said, somewhat ironically, I fear. I am not disposed to question your right to harbour as many spooks as you find agreeable to your taste and consistent with your notions of companionship. That is no business of mine. But being just a plain man of affairs, mostly of this world, I find spooks needless to my peace and comfort. I am going to my hotel, where my fellow guests are still in the flesh. It was not a very civil speech, but he manifested no feeling about it. Kindly remain, he said. I am grateful for your presence here. What you have heard tonight, I believe myself to have heard twice before. Now, I know it was no illusion. That is much to me, more than you know. Have a fresh cigar and a good stock of patience while I tell you the story. The rain was now falling more steadily with a low, monotonous susurration, interrupted at long intervals by the sudden slashing of the boughs of the trees as the wind rose and failed. The night was well advanced, but both sympathy and curiosity held me a willing listener to my friend's monologue, which I did not interrupt by a single word from beginning to end. Ten years ago, he said, I occupied a ground-floor apartment in one of a row of houses all alike, away at the other end of the town, on what we call Rincon Hill. This had been the best quarter of San Francisco, but had fallen into neglect and decay, partly because of the primitive character of its domestic architecture no longer suited the maturing taste of our wealthy citizens, partly because certain public improvements had made a wreck of it. The row of dwellings, in one of which I lived, stood a little way back from the street, each having a miniature garden, separated from its neighbours by low iron fences, and bisected with mathematical precision by a box-bordered gravel walk from gate to door. One morning, as I was leaving my lodging, I observed a young girl entering the adjoining garden on the left. It was a warm day in June, and she was lightly gowned in white. From her shoulders hung a broad straw hat profusely decorated with flowers and wonderfully be-ribboned in the fashion of the time. My attention was not long held by the exquisite simplicity of her costume, for no one could look at her face and think of anything earthly. Do not fear, I shall not profane it by description. It was beautiful exceedingly. All that I had ever seen or dreamed of loveliness was in that matchless living picture by the hand of the divine artist. So deeply did it move me that, without a thought of the impropriety of the act, I unconsciously bared my head as a devout Catholic or well-bred Protestant uncovers before an image of the Blessed Virgin. The maiden showed no displeasure. She merely turned her glorious dark eyes upon me with a look that made me catch my breath, and without other recognition of my act passed into the house. For a moment I stood motionless, hat in hand, painfully conscious of my rudeness, yet so dominated by the emotion inspired by that vision of incomparable beauty, that my penitence was less poignant than it should have been. Then I went my way, leaving my heart behind. In the natural course of things I should probably have remained away until nightfall. But by the middle of the afternoon I was back in the little garden, affecting an interest in the new foolish flowers that I had never before observed. My hope was vain. She did not appear. To a night of unrest succeeded a day of expectation and disappointment. 
But on the day after, as I wandered aimlessly about the neighbourhood, I met her. Of course I did not repeat my folly of uncovering, nor venture by even so much as too long a look to manifest an interest in her. Yet my heart was beating audibly. I trembled and consciously coloured as she turned her big black eyes upon me with a look of obvious recognition, entirely devoid of boldness or coquetry. I will not weary you with particulars. Many times afterward I met the maiden, yet never either addressed her or sought to fix her attention. Nor did I take any action toward making her acquaintance. Perhaps my forbearance, requiring so supreme an effort of self-denial, will not be entirely clear to you. That I was head over heels in love is true, but who can overcome his habit of thought or reconstruct his character? I was what some foolish persons are pleased to call, and others more foolish are pleased to be called, an aristocrat. And despite her beauty, her charms and graces, the girl was not of my class. I had learned her name, which it is needless to speak, and something of her family. She was an orphan, a dependent niece of the impossible elderly fat woman in whose lodging house she lived. My income was small, and I lacked the talent for marrying. It is perhaps a gift. An alliance with that family would condemn me to its manner of life, part me from my books and studies, and in a social sense reduce me to the ranks. It is easy to deprecate such considerations as these, as I have not retained myself for the defence. Let judgment be entered against me. But in strict justice all my ancestors for generations should be made co-defendants, and I be permitted to plead in mitigation of punishment the imperious mandate of heredity. To a mesalliance of that kind, every globule of my ancestral blood spoke in opposition. In brief, my tastes, habits, instinct, with whatever of reason my love had left me, all fought against it. Moreover, I was an irreclaimable sentimentalist, and found a subtle charm in an impersonal and spiritual relation with which acquaintance might vulgarize and marriage would certainly dispel. No woman, I argued, is what this lovely creature seems. Love is a delicious dream. Why should I bring about my own awakening? The course dictated by all this sense and sentiment was obvious. Honour, pride, prudence, preservation of my ideals all commanded me to go away. But for that I was too weak. The utmost that I could do by a mighty effort of will was to cease meeting the girl. And that I did. I even avoided the chance encounters of the garden leaving my lodging only when I knew that she had gone to her music lessons and returning after nightfall. Yet all the while I was as one in a trance, indulging the most fascinating fancies and ordering my entire intellectual life in accordance with the dream. Ah, my friend, as one whose actions have a traceable relation to reason, you cannot know the fool's paradise in which I lived. One evening the devil put it into my head to be an unspeakable idiot. By apparent careless and purposeless questioning, I learned from my gossipy landlady that the young woman's bedroom adjoined my own. A party wall between. Yielding to a sudden and coarse impulse, I gently rapped on the wall. There was no response, naturally, but I was in no mood to accept a rebuke. A madness was upon me, and I repeated the folly, the offence, but again ineffectually, and I had the decency to desist. An hour later, while absorbed in some of my infernal studies, I heard, or thought I heard, my signal answered. Flinging down my books, I sprang to the wall, and as steadily as my beating heart would permit, gave three slow taps upon it. This time the response was distinct, unmistakable. One, two, three. An exact repetition of my signal. That was all I could elicit. But it was enough. Too much. The next evening, and for many evenings afterward, that folly went on, I always having the last word. During the whole period I was deliriously happy, but with the perversity of my nature I persevered in my resolution not to see her. Then, as I should have expected, I got no further answers. She is disgusted, I said to myself, with what she thinks my timidity in making no more definite advances. And I resolved to seek her and make her acquaintance, and what? I did not know, nor do I now know what might have come of it. I know only that I passed days and days trying to meet her, and all in vain. She was invisible as well as inaudible. I haunted the streets where we had met, but she did not come. 
from my window i watched the garden in front of her house but she passed neither in nor out i fell into the deepest dejection believing that she had gone away yet took no steps to resolve my doubt by inquiry of my landlady to whom indeed i had taken an unconquerable aversion from her having once spoken of the girl with less of reverence than i thought befitting there came a fateful night worn out with emotion irresolution and despondency i had retired early and fallen into such a sleep as was still possible to me in the middle of the night something some malign power bent upon the wrecking of my peace forever caused me to open my eyes and sit up wide awake and listening intently for i knew not what then i thought i heard a faint tapping on the wall the mere ghost of the familiar signal in a few moments it was repeated one two three no louder than before but addressing a sense alert and strained to receive it i was about to reply when the adversary of peace again intervened in my affairs with a rascally suggestion of retaliation she had long and cruelly ignored me now i would ignore her incredible fatuity may god forgive it all the rest of the night i lay awake fortifying my obstinacy with shameless justifications and listening late the next morning as i was leaving the house i met my landlady entering good morning mr dampier she said have you heard the news i replied in words that i had heard no news in manner that i did not care to hear any the manner escaped her observation about the sick young lady next door she babbled on what you did not know why she has been ill for weeks and now i almost sprang upon her and now i cried now what she is dead that is not the whole story in the middle of the night as i learned later the patient awakening from a long stupor after a week of delirium had asked it was a last utterance that her bed be moved to the opposite side of the room those in attendance had thought the request a vagary of a delirium but had complied and there the poor passing soul had exerted its failing will to restore a broken connection a golden thread of sentiment between its innocence and a monstrous baseness owing a blind brutal allegiance to the law of self what reparations could i make are there masses that can be said for the repose of souls that are abroad such nights as this spirits blown about by the viewless winds coming in the storm and darkness with signs and potents hints of memory and presages of doom this is the third visitation on the first occasion i was too skeptical to do more than verify by natural methods the character of the incident on the second i responded to the signal after it had been several times repeated but without result tonight's recurrence completes the fatal triad expounded by perpelius necromantius there is no more to tell when dampier had finished his story i could think of nothing relevant that i cared to say and to question him would have been a hideous impertinence i rose and bade him good night in a way to convey to him a sense of my sympathy which he silently acknowledged by a pressure of the hand that night alone with his sorrow and remorse he passed into the unknown end of beyond the wall by ambrose beers read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama the room of mirrors by arthur kula couch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by chiquito crasto the room of mirrors by arthur quilla couch a late hansom came swinging round the corner into lennox gardens cutting it so fine that the near wheel ground against the curb and jolted the driver in his little seat the jingle of bells might have warned me but the horse's hoofs came noiselessly over the half frozen snow which lay just deep enough to hide where the pavement ended and the road began and moreover i was listening to the violins behind the first floor windows of the house opposite they were playing the wiener blut as it was i had time enough and no more to skip back and get my toes out of the way the cabby cursed me i cursed him back so promptly and effectively 
that he had to turn in his seat for another shot. The windows of the house opposite let fall their light across his red and astonished face. I laughed and gave him another volley. My head was hot, though my feet and hands were cold, and I felt equal to cursing down any cabman within the four-mile radius. That second volley finished him. He turned to his reins again and was borne away defeated, the red eyes of his lamps peering back at me like an angry ferret's. Up in the lighted room shadows of men and women crossed the blinds, and still the wiener blot went forward. The devil was in that waltz. He had hold of the violins and was weaving the air with scents and visions, visions of Ascot and Henley, green lawns, gay sunshades, midsummer heat, cool rivers flowing, muslins rippled by light breezes, running horses and silken jackets, white tables heaped with roses and set with silver and crystal, jeweled fingers moving in the soft candle light, bare necks bending, diamonds, odors, bubbles in the wine, blue water and white foam beneath the leaning shadow of sails, hot air flickering over stretches of moorland, blue again, Mediterranean blue, long facades, the din of bands and King Carnival parading beneath showers of blossom. And all this noise and warmth and scent and dazzle flung out into the frozen street for a beggar's portion. I had gone under. The door of the house opposite had been free to me once, and not six months ago, freer to me perhaps than to any other. Did I long to pass behind it again? I thrust both hands into my pocket for warmth, and my right hand knocked against something hard. Yes, just once. Suddenly the door opened. A man stood on the threshold for a moment while the butler behind him arranged the collar of his fur overcoat. A high light in the portico flung the shadows of both down the crimson-laid carpet on the entrance steps. Snow had fallen and covered the edges of the carpet, which divided it like a cascade of blood pouring from the hall into the street. And still overhead the wiener blot went forward. The man paused in the bright portico, his patent leather boots twinkling under the lamp's rays on that comfortable carpet. I waited, expecting him to whistle for a hansom. But he turned gave an order to the butler, and stepping briskly down into the street, made off eastwards. The door closed behind him. He was the man I most hated in the world. If I had longed to cross the threshold a while back, it was to seek him, and for no other reason. I started to follow him, my hands still in my pockets. The snow muffled our footfalls completely, for as yet the slight northeast wind had frozen but the thinnest crust of it. He was walking briskly, as men do in such weather, but with no appearance of hurry. At the corner of Sloan Street he halted under a lamp, pulled out his watch, consulted it, and lit a cigarette, then set off again up the street towards Knightsbridge. This halt of his had let me up within twenty paces of him. He never turned his head, but went on presenting me his back, a target not to be missed. Why not do it now? Better now and here than in a crowded thoroughfare. My right hand gripped the revolver more tightly. No, there was plenty of time, and I was curious to know what had brought Gervaise out at this hour, why he had left his guests or his wife's guests to take care of themselves, why he chose to be trudging afoot through this infernally unpleasant snow. The roadway in Sloane Street was churned into a brown mass like chocolate but the last bus had rolled home and left it to freeze in peace. Halfway up the street I saw Gervais meet and pass a policeman, and altered my own pace to a lagging walk. Even so, the fellow eyed me suspiciously as I went by, or so I thought, and guessing that he kept a watch on me, I dropped still further behind my man. But the lamps were bright at the end of the street, and I saw him turn to the right by the great drapery shop at the corner. Once past this corner, I was able to put on a spurt. He crossed the roadway by the Albert Gate, and by the time he reached the park railings, the old distance separated us once more. Halfway up the slope, he came to a halt by the stone drinking trough, and, flattening myself against the railings, I saw him try the thin ice in the trough with his fingertips, but in a hesitating way, as if his thoughts ran on something else, and he scarcely knew what he did or why he did it. 
It must have been half a minute before he recovered himself with a shrug of his shoulders, and plunging both hands deep in his pockets, resumed his pace. As we passed Hyde Park Corner, I glanced up at the clock there. The time was between a quarter and ten minutes to one. At the entrance of Down Street he turned aside again, and began to lead me a zigzag dance to the quiet thoroughfare, and I followed, still to the tune of the Wiener Blut. But now, at the corner of Charles Street, I blundered against another policeman who flashed his lantern in my face, stared after Gervais, and asked me what my game was. I demanded innocently enough to be shown the nearest way to Oxford Street, and the fellow, after pausing a moment to chew his suspicions, walked with me slowly to the southwest corner of Berkeley Square, and pointed northwards. "'As you rode,' he growled, "'straight on, and don't you forget it.' He stood and watched me on my way. Nor did I dare to turn aside until well clear of the square. At the crossing of Davies and Grosvenor streets, however, I supposed myself safe, and halted for a moment. From the shadow of a porch at my elbow, a thin voice accosted me. "'Kind gentleman.' "'Eh?' Hey? I spun around on her sharply, for it was a woman, stretching out one skinny hand and gathering her rags together with the other. "'Kind gentleman, spare a copper. Of no better days, I have indeed.' Well, said I, as it happens, I'm in the same case, and they couldn't be much worse, could they? She drew a shuddering breath back through her teeth, but still held out her hand. I felt for my last coin, and her fingers closed on it so sharply that their long nails scraped the back of mine. Kind gentlemen. Aye, they are kind, are they not? She stared at me, and in a nerveless tone let one horrible oath escape her. "'There'll be one less before morning,' said I. "'If that's any consolation to you, good night.' Setting off at a shuffling run, I doubled back along Grosvenor Street and Bond Street to the point where I hoped to pick up the trail again. And just there, at the issue of Brutton Street, two constables stood ready for me. "'I thought as much.' said the one who set me on my way. Aye, you! Wait a moment, please. Then to the other. Best turn his pockets out, Jim. If you dare to try, I began with my hand in my pocket. The next moment I found myself sprawling face downward on the sharp crust of snow. Hello, constables, said a voice. What's the row? It was Gervais. He had turned leisurely back from the slope of Conduit Street and came strolling down the road with his hands in his pockets. This fellow, sir, we have reason to think he was following you. Quite right, Gervais answered cheerfully. Of course he was. Oh, if you knew it, sir. Certainly I knew it. In fact, he was following at my invitation. What for did he tell me a lie, then? grumbled the constable, chapfallen. I had picked myself up by this time and was wiping my face. Look here, I put in. I asked you the way to Oxford Street, that and nothing else. And I went on to summarize my opinion of him. Oh, it's you can swear a bit, he growled. I heard you just now. Yes, Gervais interposed suavely drawing the glove from his right hand and letting flash a diamond finger-ring in the lamplight. He is a bit of a beast, policeman, and it's not for the pleasure of it that I want his company. A sovereign passed from hand to hand. The other constable had discreetly drawn off a pace or two. All the same, it's a room go. Yes, isn't it? Gervaise assented in his heartiest tone. Here is my card, in case you're not satisfied. If you're satisfied, sir. Quite so. Good night. Gervais thrust both hands into his pockets again and strode off. I followed him with a heart hotter than ever. Followed him like a whipped cur, as they say. Yes, that was just it. He who had already robbed me of everything else had now kicked even the pedestal from under me as a figure of tragedy. Five minutes ago I had been the implacable avenger tracking my unconscious victim across the city. 
Heaven knows how small an excuse it was for self-respect. But one who has lost character may yet chance to catch a dignity from circumstances. And to tell the truth, for all my desperate earnestness, I had allowed my vanity to take some artistic satisfaction in the sinister chase. It had struck me, shall I say, as an effective ending, nor had I failed to note that the snow lent it a romantic touch. And behold, the unconscious victim knew all about it and had politely interfered with a couple of unromantic bobbies threatening the performance by tumbling the stocking avenger into the gutter. They had knocked my tragedy into harlequinade as easily as you might bash in a hat. And my enemy had refined the cruelty of it by coming to the rescue and ironically restarting the poor play on lines of comedy. I saw too late that I ought to have refused his help, to have assaulted the constable and been hauled to the police station. Not an impressive wind-up, to be sure, but less humiliating than this. Even so, Gervais might have trumped the poor card by allowing with a gracious offer to bail me out. As it was, I had put the whip into his hand and must follow him like a cur. The distance he kept assured me that the similitude had not escaped him. He strode on without deigning a single glance behind, still in cold derision presenting me his broad back and silently challenging me to shoot. And I followed, hating him worse than ever swearing that the last five minutes should not be forgotten, but charged for royally when the reckoning came to be paid. I followed thus up Conduit Street, up Regent Street, and across the circus. The frost had deepened, and the mud in the roadway crackled under our feet. At the circus I began to guess, and when Gervais struck off into Great Portland Street, and thence by half a dozen turnings northward by east, I knew to what house he was leading me. At the entrance of the side street in which it stood, he halted and motioned me to come close. "'I forget,' he said with a jerk of his thumb, "'if you still have entry. These people are not particular, to be sure.' "'I have not,' I answered, and felt my cheeks burning. He could not see this, nor could I see the lift of his eyebrows as he answered. "'Ah, I hadn't heard of it. You'd better step round by the mews, then.' You know the window, the one which opens into the passage leading to Pollock Street. Wait there. It may be ten minutes before I can open. I nodded. The house was a corner one, between the street and a by-lane tenanted mostly by cabmen, and at the back of it ran the mews where they stabled their horses. Halfway down this mews a narrow alley cut across it at right angles, a passage unfrequented by traffic, known only to the stablemen, and in the daytime used only by their children, who played hopscotch on the flagged pavement, where no one interrupted them. You wondered at its survival. From end to end it must have measured a good fifty yards, in a district where every square foot of ground fetched money, until you learned that the house had belonged in the twenties to a nobleman who left a name for eccentric profligacy, and who, as owner of the land, could afford to indulge his humours. The estate, since his death, was in no position to afford money for alterations, and the present tenants of the house found the passage convenient enough. My footsteps disturbed no one in the sleeping mews, and doubling back noiselessly through the passage, I took up my station beside the one low window which opened upon it from the blank back premises of the house. Even with the glimmer of snow to help me, I had to grope for the window sill to make sure of my bearings. The minutes crawled by, and the only sound came from a stall where one of the horses had kicked through his thin straw bedding and was shuffling an uneasy hoof upon the cobbles. Then, just as I too had begun to shuffle my frozen feet, I heard a scratching sound, the unbolting of a shutter, and Gervaise drew up the sash softly. "'Nip inside,' he whispered. "'No more noise than you can help. I have sent off the night porter. He tells me the bank is still going in front of the house. Half a dozen plating, perhaps.' I hoisted myself over the sill and dropped inside. The wall of this annex, which had no upper floor and invited you to mistake it for a harmless studio, was merely a sheath, so to speak. Within, a corridor divided it from the true wall of the room, and this room had no window or top light, though a handsome one in the roof. A dummy beguiled the eyes of its neighbours. There was but one room, an apartment of really fine proportions, never used by the tenants of the house, and known but to a few curious ones among its frequenters. 
The story went that the late owner, Earl C., had reason to believe himself persistently cheated at cards by his best friends, and in particular by a duke of the blood royal, who could hardly be accused to his face. The Earl's sense of honour forbade him to accuse any meaner man while the big culprit went unrebuked. Therefore, he continued to lose magnificently while he devised a new room for play, the room in which I now followed Gervaise. I had stood in it once before and admired the courtly and costly thoroughness of the Earl's rebuke. I had imagined him conducting his expectant guests to the door, ushering them in with a wave of the hand, and taking his seat tranquilly amid the dead, embarrassed silence, had imagined him facing the royal duke and asking, Shall we cut? with a voice of the politest inflection. For the room was a sheet of mirrors. Mirrors panelled the walls, the doors, the very backs of the shutters. The tables had mirrors for tops. The whole ceiling was one vast mirror. From it depended three great candelabra of cut glass set with reflectors here, there, and everywhere. I had heard that even the floor was originally of polished brass. If so, later owners must have ripped up the plates and sold them, for now a few cheap oriental rugs carpeted the unpolished boards. The place was abominably dusty. The striped yellow curtains had lost half their rings and drooped askew from their soiled valances. Across one of the wall panels ran an ugly scar. A smell of rat pervaded the air. The present occupiers had no use for a room so obviously unsuitable to games of chance, as they understood chance, and I doubt if a servant entered it once a month. Gervaise had ordered candles and a fire, but the chimney was out of practice, and the smoke wreathed itself slowly about us as we stood surrounded by the ghostly company of our reflected selves. "'We shall not be disturbed,' said Gervaise. "'I told the man I was expecting a friend, that our business was private, and that until he called I wished to be alone. I did not explain by what entrance I expected him. The people in the front cannot hear us. Have a cigar.' He pushed the open case towards me. Then, as I drew back, You've no need to be scrupulous, he added, seeing that they were bought with your money. If that's so, I will, said I. Having chosen one, struck a match. Glancing round, I saw a hundred small flames spurt up, and a hundred men hold them to a hundred glowing cigar tips. After you with the match. Gervaise took it from me with a steady hand. He, too, glanced about him while he puffed. Ugh! He blew a long cloud and shivered with his furred overcoat. What a gang! It takes all sorts to make a world, said I, fatuously, for lacking of anything better. Don't be an infernal idiot, he answered, flicking the dust of one of the gilt chairs and afterwards cleaning a space for his elbow on the looking-glass table. It takes only two sorts to make the world we've lived in, and that's you and I. He gazed slowly round the walls. You and I and a few fellows like us, not to mention the women who don't count. Well, said I, as far as the world goes, if you must discuss it, I always found it a good enough place. Because you started as an unconsidering fool, and because afterwards, when we came to grips, you were the underdog and I gave you no time. My word, how I have hustled you. I yawned. All right, I can wait. Only if you suppose I came here to listen to your moral reflections. He pulled a cigar from between his teeth and looked at me along it. I know perfectly well why you came here, he said, slowly, and paused. Hadn't we better have it out, with the cards on the table? He drew a small revolver from his pocket and laid it with a light clink on the table before him. I hesitated for a moment, then followed his example and the silent men around us did the same. A smile curled his thin lips as he observed this multiplied gesture. Yes, he said as if to himself, that is what it all comes to. And now, said I, since you know my purpose here, perhaps you will tell me yours. That is just what I am trying to explain, only you are so impatient, and it, well, it's a trifle complicated. He puffed for a moment in silence. Roughly, it might be enough to say that I saw you standing outside my house a while ago, that I needed a talk with you alone in some private place, that I guessed if you saw me you would follow me with no more invitation, and that, so reasoning, I led you here, 
where no one is likely to interrupt us. Well, I admitted, all that seems plain sailing. Quite so. But it's at this point the thing grows complicated. He rose, and walking to the fireplace, turned his back on me and spread his palms to the blaze. Well, he asked, after a moment, gazing into the mirror before him. Why don't you shoot? I thrust my hands into my trouser pockets and leaned back staring. I dare say sulkily enough at the two revolvers within grasp. I've got my code, I muttered. The code of these mirrors. You won't do the thing because it's not the thing to do. Because these fellows. He waved a hand, and the ghosts waved back at him. Don't do such things. And you haven't the nerve to sin off your own bat. Come. He strolled back to his seat and leaned towards me across the table. It's not much of a boast off, but at this eleventh hour we must snatch what poor credit we can. You are, I suppose, a most decent fellow for not having fired, and I... By the way, did you feel the temptation? I nodded. You may put your money on that. I never see you without wanting to kill you. What's more, I'm going to do it. And I, he said, knew the temptation and risked it. No, let's be honest about it. There is no risk, because, my good sir, I know you to a hair. There was, I growled. Pardon me, there was none. I came here having a word to say to you, and these mirrors have taught me how to say it. Take a look at them. The world we are leaving, that's it, and a cursed second-hand, second-class one at that. He paced slowly round on it, slowing his body in the chair. I say a second-class one, he resumed. Because, my dear Cherry, when all said and done, we are second-class, the pair of us, and pretty bad second-class. I met you first at Harrow. Our fathers had money. They wished us to be gentlemen without well understanding what it meant. And with unlimited pocket money and his wits about him, any boy can make himself a power in a big school. That is what we did. Towards the end, we even set the fashion for a certain set. And a rank bad fashion it was. But in truth, we have no business there. On every point of breeding, we were outsiders. I suspect it was a glimmering consciousness of this that made us hate each other from the first. We understood one another too well. Oh, there's no mistaking it. Whatever we've missed in life, you and I have hated. He paused, eyeing me queerly. I kept my hands in my pockets. Go on, I said. From Harrow we went to college. The same business over again. We drifted, of course, into the same set, for already we had become necessary to each other. We set the pace of that set, were its apparent leaders. But in truth we were alone, you and I, as utterly alone as two shipwrecked men on a raft. The others were shadows to us. We followed their code because we had to be gentlemen. But we did not understand it in the least. For, after all, the roots of that code lay in the breeding and tradition of honour, with which we had no concern. To each other you and I were intelligible and real. But as concerned that code and the men who followed it by right of birth and nature, we were looking-glass men, imitating, imitating, imitating. We set the pace, I said. You allowed that. To be sure we did. We even modified the code a bit, to its hurt. Though as conscious outsiders, we would dare very little. For instance, the talk of our associates about women, and no doubt their thoughts too, grew sensibly baser. The sanctity of gambling debts, on the other hand, we did nothing to impair because we had money. I recall your virtuous indignation at the amount of paper floated by poor W towards the end of the great Baccarat term. Poor devil, he paid up, or his father did, and took his name off the books. He's in Ceylon now, I believe. At length you have earned a partial right to sympathize, or would have if you only had paid up. Take care, Gervais. My good sir, don't miss my point. Wasn't I just as indignant with W? If I had been warned of Newmarket Heath, if I had been shown the door of the hell we are sitting in, shouldn't I feel just as you are feeling? Try to understand. You forget Elaine, I think. No, I do not forget Elaine. We left college. I to add money to money in my father's office, you to display your accomplishments in spending what your father had earned. 
that was the extent of the difference to both of us money and the indulgence it buys meant everything in life all i can boast of is the longer sight the office hours were a nuisance i admit but i was clever enough to keep my hold on the old set and then after office hours i met you constantly and studied and hated you studied you because i hated you elaine came between us you fell in love with her that i too should fall in love with her was no coincidence but the severest of logic given such a woman and two such men no other course of fate is conceivable she made it necessary for me to put hate into practice if she had not offered herself why then it would have been somebody else that's all good lord he rapped the table and his voice rose for the first time above its level of exposition you don't suppose all my study all my years of education were to be wasted he checked himself eyed me again and resumed in his old voice you wanted money by this time i was a solicitor your old college friend and you came to me i knew you would come as surely as i knew you would not fire that pistol just now for years i had trained myself to look into your mind and anticipate its working didn't i tell you from the first you were the only real creature this world held for me you were my only book and i had to learn you at first without fixed purpose then deliberately and when the time came i put into practice what i knew just that and no more my dear reggie you never had a chance elaine i muttered again elaine was the girl for you or for me just that again and no more by george i said letting out a laugh if i thought that what why that after ruining me you have missed being happy he sighed impatiently and his eyes though he kept them fastened on mine seemed to be tiring i thought he said i could time your intelligence over any fence but tonight there's something wrong either i'm out of practice or your brain has been going to the deuce what man you're shying at every bank is it drink eh or hunger it might be a little bit of both i answered but stay a moment let me get things straight i stood between you and elaine no give me time between you and your aims whatever they were very well you trod over me or rather you pulled me up by the roots and pitched me into outer darkness to rot and now it seems that after all you are not content in the devil's name why why oh cannot you see take a look at these mirrors again our world i tell you see you and i you and i always you and i man i pitched you into the darkness as you say and then i woke and knew the truth that you were necessary to me hey i can't do without you it broke from him in a cry so help me god reggie it is the truth i stared in his face for half a minute maybe and broke out laughing jeshurun waxed fat and turned sentimental a nice copybook job you make of it too oh send my brother back to me i cannot play alone perhaps you'd like me to buy a broom and hire the crossing in lennox gardens then you'd be able to contemplate me all day long and nourish your fine fat soul with delicate eating bah you make me sick it's the truth said he quietly it may be to me it looks a sight more like foie gras can't do without me can't you well i can jolly well do without you and i'm going to i warn you he said i have done you an injury or two in my time but by george if i stand up and let you shoot me well i hate you badly enough but i won't let you do it without fair warning i'll risk it anyway said i very well he stood up and folded his arms shoot then and be hanged i put out my hand to the revolver hesitated and withdrew it that's not the way i said i've got my code as i told you before does the code forbid suicide he asked that's a different thing not at all the man who commits suicide kills an unarmed man but the unarmed man happens to be himself suppose that in this instance your distinction won't work look here he went on as i pushed back my chair impatiently 
I have one truth more for you. I swear I believe that what we have hated, we too, is not each other, but ourselves and our own likeness. I swear I believe we too have so shared natures and hate that no power can untwist and separate them to render each his own. But I swear also, I believe that if you lift that revolver to kill, you will take aim not at me, but by instinct at a worse enemy, yourself, vital in my heart. You have some pretty theories tonight, I sneered. Perhaps you'll go on to tell me which of us two has been Elaine's husband, feeding daintily in Lennox Gardens, clothed in purple and fine linen, while the other— He interrupted me by picking up the revolver and striding to the fireplace again. So be it, since you will have it so kill me, he added with a queer look, and perhaps you may go back to Lennox Gardens and enjoy all these things in my place. I took my station. Both revolvers were levelled now. I took sight along mine at his detested face. It was white, but curiously eager, hopeful even. I lowered my arm, scanning his face still, and still scanning it set my weapon down on the table. I believe you are mad, said I. But one thing I see, that mad or not, you're in earnest. For some reason you want me to kill you. Therefore, that shall wait. For some reason it is torture to you to live and do without me. Well, I'll try you with that. It will do me good to hurt you a bit. I slipped the revolver into my pocket and tapped it. No, I don't understand them. I won't quarrel with your sentiments so long as you suffer from them. When that fails, I'll find another opportunity for this. Good night. I stepped to the door. Reggie! I shut the door on his cry, crossed the corridor, and, climbing out through the window, let myself drop into the lane. As my feet touched the snow, a revolver shot rang out in the room behind me. I caught at the frozen sill to steady myself, and crouching there I listened. Surely the report must have alarmed the house. I waited for the sound of footsteps, waited for three minutes, perhaps longer. None came. To be sure, the room stood well apart from the house, but it was incredible that the report should have awakened no one. My own ears still rang with it. Still no footsteps came. The horse in the stable close by was still shuffling his hoof on the cobbles. No other sound. Very stealthily I hoisted myself up on the sill again, listened, dropped inside, and tiptoed my way to the door. The candles were still burning in the room of mirrors, and by the light of them as I entered, Jouvet stepped to meet me. Ah, it's you, I stammered. I heard, that is, I thought. And with that I saw, recognized with a catch of the breath, that the figure I spoke to was not Gervais, but my own reflected image, stepping forward with pale face and ghastly from a mirror. Yet a moment before I could have sworn it was Gervais. Gervais lay stretched on the hearth rug with his hand towards the fire. I caught up a candle and bent over him. His features were not to be recognized. As I straightened myself up with a candle in my hand, for an instant those features, obliterated in the flesh, gazed at me in a ring, a hundred times repeated behind a hundred candles. And again, at a second glance, I saw that the face was not Gervais's, but my own. I set down the candle and made off, closing the door behind me. The horror of it held me by the hair, but I flung it off and pelted down the lane and through the mews. Once in the street I breathed again, pulled myself together, and set off at a rapid walk southwards, but not clearly knowing whither. As a matter of fact, I took the line by which I had come, with a single difference that I made straight to Berkeley Square through Brutton Street. I had, I say, no clear purpose in following this line rather than another. I had none for taking Lennox Gardens on the way to my squalid lodgings in Chelsea. I had a purpose, no doubt, but will swear it only grew definite as I came in sight of the lamp still burning beneath Gervais's portico. There was a figure, too, under the lamp, the butler, bending there and rolling up the strip of red carpet. As he pulled its edges from the frozen snow, I came on him suddenly. Oh, it's you, sir. He stood erect, and with the air of a man infinitely relieved. 
Gervais? The door opened wide, and there stood Elaine in her ball gown, a glitter with diamonds. Gervais, dear, where have you been? We've been terribly anxious. She said it, looking straight down on me, who stood in my tattered clothes in the full glare of the lamp. And then I heard the butler catch his breath, and suddenly her voice trailed off in wonder and pitiful disappointment. It's not Gervais. It's Red. Mr. Travers. I beg your pardon. I thought. But I passed up the steps and stood before her, and said as she drew back, There has been an accident. Gervais has shot himself. I turned to the butler. You had better run to the police station. Stay, take this revolver. It won't count anything as evidence, but I ask you to examine it and make sure all the chambers are loaded. A thud in the hall interrupted me. I ran in and knelt beside Elaine, and as I stooped to lift her, as my hand touched her hair, this was a jealous question on my lips. What has she to do with it? It is I who cannot do without him, who must miss him always. End of The Room of Mirrors by Arthur Quiller Couch Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Magic Shop by H. G. Wells this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic Shop by H. G. Wells I had seen the Magic Shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice, a shop window of alluring little objects, magic balls, magic hens, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls, the material of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing, but never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Gip hauled me by my fingers right up to the window, and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth. A modest-sized frontage in Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of patent incubators, but there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus, or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn. Always over the way, and a little inaccessible it had been, was something of the mirage in its position. But here it was, now quite indisputably, and the fat end of Gipp's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. "'If I was rich,' said Gipp, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, "'I'd buy myself that.' and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery and called, so a neat card asserted, buy one and astonish your friends. Anything, said Gip, will disappear under one of those cones. I have read about it in a book. And there, Dada, is the vanishing halfpenny. Only they put it this way up so as we can't see how it's done. Gip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding, and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way. Only, you know, quite unconsciously he lugged my fingers doorward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jessie, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Gibbles, I said, and laid my hand on the door handle. Gip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing precedence Gip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burthen of the conversation to me. It was a little, narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so we were alone and could glance about us. There was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter, a grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in various sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, 
want to draw you out long and thin, want to swell your head and banish your legs, and want to make you short and fat like a draft. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was behind the counter, a curious, sallow, dark man, with one ear larger than the other and a chin like the toe cap of a boot. "'What can we have the pleasure?' he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so, with a start, we were aware of him. "'I want,' I said, "'to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. "'Ledger domain?' he asked. "'Mechanical? Domestic? "'Anything amusing?' said I. "'Um,' said the shopman, "'and scratched his head for a moment as if thinking. "'Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. "'Something in this way,' he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I had seen the trick done at entertainment endless times before. It's part of the common stock of conjurers, but I had not expected it here. That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it? said the shopman. Gip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman, and there it was. How much will that be? I asked. We make no charge for glass balls, said the shopman politely. We get them, he picked one out of his elbow as he spoke, free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Gip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter, and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman, who smiled. You may have those too, said the shopman, and if you don't mind, one from my mouth, so. Gip counseled me mutely for a moment, and then in a profound silence put away the four balls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. We get all our smaller tricks in that way, the shopman remarked. I laughed in the manner of one who subscribes to a jest. Instead of going to the wholesale shop, I said, of course it's cheaper. In a way, the shopman said, though we pay in the end but not so heavily as people suppose. Our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, we get out of that hat. And you know, sir, if you'll excuse my saying it, there isn't a wholesale shop, not for genuine magic goods, sir. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his cheek and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, with his finger on the word, and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. He seemed to be carrying out the joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. He turned to Gip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, are the right sort of boy. I was surprised at his knowing that, because in the interests of discipline, we keep it rather a secret even at home. But Gip received it in unflinching silence, keeping a steadfast eye on him. It's only the right sort of boy gets through that doorway. And, as if by way of illustration, there came a rattling at the door, and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard. Nyar, I want to go in there, Dada. I want to go in there. Nya! And then the accents of a downtrodden parent, urging consolations and propitiations. It's locked, Edward, he said. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shopman, always, for that sort of child. And as he spoke, we had a glimpse of the other youngster, a little, white face, pallid from sweet eating and over-sapid food, and distorted by evil passions, a ruthless little egotist, pawing at the enchanted pane. It's no good, sir, said the shopman, as I moved, with my natural helpfulness, doorward, and presently the spoilt child was carried off howling. How do you manage that? I said, breathing a little more freely. Magic, said the shopman, with a careless wave of the hand, and behold, sparks of colored fire flew out of his fingers and vanished into the shadows of the shop. You were saying, he said, addressing himself to Gip, before you came in, that you would like one of our buy one and astonish your friends boxes. Gip, after a gallant effort, said, Yes, it's in your pocket and leaning over the counter, he really had an extraordinarily long body, this amazing person produced the article in the customary conjurer's manner. Paper, he said, and took a sheet out of the empty hat with the springs. String, and behold, his mouth was a string box, 
from which he drew an unending thread, which when he had tied his parcel he bit off, and it seemed to me swallowed the ball of string, and then he lit a candle at the nose of one of the ventriloquist's dummies, stuck one of his fingers, which had become sealing wax red, into the flame, and so sealed the parcel. Then there was the disappearing egg, he remarked, and produced one from within my coat breast, and packed it, and also the crying baby very human. I handed each parcel to Gip as it was ready, and he clasped them to his chest. He said very little, but his eyes were eloquent. The clutch of his arms was eloquent. He was the playground of unspeakable emotions. These, you know, were real magics. Then, with a start, I discovered something moving about in my hat, something soft and jumpy. I whipped it off, and a ruffled pigeon, no doubt a confederate, dropped out and ran on the counter, and went, I fancy, into a cardboard box behind the papier-mâché tiger. Tut, tut, said the shopman, dexterously relieving me of my headdress. Careless bird, and, as I live, nesting. He shook my hat, and shook out into his extended hand two or three eggs, a large marble, a watch, about half a dozen of the inevitable glass balls, and then crumpled, crinkled paper, more and more and more, talking all the time of the way in which people neglect to brush their hats inside as well as out, politely, of course, but with a certain personal application. All sorts of things accumulate, sir. Not you, of course, in particular. Nearly every customer. Astonishing what they carry about with them. Their crumpled paper rose and billowed on the counter more and more and more, until he was nearly hidden from us, until he was altogether hidden, and still his voice went on and on. We none of us know what the fair semblance of a human being may conceal, sir. Are we all then no better than brushed exteriors, whited sepulchres? His voice stopped, exactly like when you hit a neighbor's gramophone with a well-aimed brick. The same instant silence and the rustle of the paper stopped, and everything was still. Have you done with my hat? I said, after an interval. There was no answer. I stared at Gip, and Gip stared at me, and there were our distortions in the magic mirrors, looking very rum and grave and quiet. I think we'll go now, I said. Will you tell me how much all this comes to? I say, I said on a rather louder note, I want the bill and my hat, please. It might have been a sniff from behind the paper pile. Let's look behind the counter, Gip, I said. He's making fun of us. I led Gip round the head-wagging tiger, and what do you think there was behind the counter? No one at all, only my hat on the floor, and a common conjurer's lop-eared white rabbit lost in meditation, and looking as stupid and crumpled as only a conjurer's rabbit can do. I resumed my hat, and the rabbit lolloped a lollop or so out of my way. Dada, said Gip in a guilty whisper. What is it, Gip, said I. I do like this shop, Dada. So should I, I said to myself if the counter wouldn't suddenly extend itself to shut one off from the door. But I didn't call Gip's attention to that. Pussy, he said, with a hand out to the rabbit as it came lolloping past us. Pussy, do Gip a magic. And his eyes followed it as it squeezed through a door I had certainly not remarked a moment before. Then this door opened wider, and the man with one ear larger than the other appeared again. He was smiling still, but his eyes met mine with something between amusement and defiance. You'd like to see our showroom, sir, he said with an innocent suavity. Gip tugged my finger forward. I glanced at the counter and met the shopman's eyes again. I was beginning to think the magic just a little too genuine. We haven't very much time, I said, but somehow we were inside the showroom before I could finish that. All goods of the same quality, said the shopman, rubbing his flexible hands together and that is the best nothing in the place that isn't genuine magic and warranted thoroughly rum. Excuse me, sir. I felt him pull at something that clung to my coat sleeve, and then I saw he held a little wriggling red demon by the tail. The little creature bit and fought and tried to get at his hand, and in a moment he tossed it carelessly behind a counter. No doubt the thing was only an image of twisted India rubber, but for the moment and his gesture was exactly that of a man who handles some petty, biting bit of vermin. I glanced at Gip, but Gip was looking at a magic rocking horse. I was glad he hadn't seen the thing. 
I say, I said, in an undertone and indicating Gip and the red demon with my eyes, you haven't many things like that about, have you? None of ours. Probably brought it with you, said the shopman, also in an undertone, and with a more dazzling smile than ever. Astonishing what people will carry about with them, unawares. And then to Gip, do you see anything you fancy here? There were many things that Gip fancied there. He turned to this astonishing tradesman with mingled confidence and respect. Is that a magic sword, he said? A magic toy sword. It neither bends, breaks, nor cuts the fingers. It renders the bearer invincible in battle against anyone under eighteen. Half a crown to seven and sixpence, according to size. These panoplies on cards are for juvenile knights errant and very useful. Shield of safety, sandals of swiftness, helmet of invisibility. Oh, Daddy, gasped Gip. I tried to find out what they cost, but the shopman did not heed me. He had got Gip now. He had got him away from my finger. He had embarked upon the exposition of all his confounded stock, and nothing was going to stop him. Presently I saw, with a qualm of distrust and something very like jealousy, that Gip had hold of this person's finger, as usually he has hold of mine. No doubt the fellow was interesting, I thought, and had an interestingly faked lot of stuff, really good fake stuff. Still, I wandered after them, saying very little, but keeping an eye on this prestidigital fellow. After all, Gip was enjoying it, and no doubt when the time came to go we should be able to go quite easily. It was a long rambling place, that showroom, a gallery broken up by stands and stalls and pillars, with archways leading off to other departments in which the queerest-looking assistants loafed and stared at one, and with perplexing mirrors and curtains. So perplexing, indeed, were these that I was presently unable to make out the door by which we had come. The shopman showed Gip magic trains that ran without steam or clockwork, just as you set the signals, and then some very, very valuable boxes of soldiers that all came alive directly you took off the lid and said, I myself haven't a very quick ear, and it was a tongue-twisting sound, but Gip, he has his mother's ear, got it in no time. Bravo, said the shopman, putting the men back into the box unceremoniously and handing it to Gip. Now, said the shopman, and in a moment Gip had made them all alive again. You'll take that box? asked the shopman. We'll take that box, said I, unless you charge its full value, in which case it would need a trust magnate. Dear heart, no! And the shopman swept the little men back again, shut the lid, waved the box in the air, and there it was, in brown paper, tied up, and with Gip's full name and address on the paper. The shopman laughed at my amazement. This is the genuine magic, he said, the real thing. It's a little too genuine for my taste, I said again. After that he fell to showing Gip tricks, odd tricks, and still odder the way they were done. He explained them, he turned them inside out, and there was the dear little chap nodding his busy bit of a head in the sagest manner. I did not attend as well as I might. Hey, presto, said the magic shopman, and then would come the clear, small, hey, presto, of the boy. But I was distracted by other things. It was being borne in upon me just how tremendously rum this place was. It was, so to speak, inundated by a sense of rumness. There was something a little rum about the fixtures, even, about the ceiling, about the floor, about the casually distributed chairs. I had a queer feeling that, whenever I wasn't looking at them straight, they went askew, and moved about, and played a noiseless puss in the corner behind my back, and the cornice had a serpentine design with masks, mask altogether too expressive for proper plaster. Then abruptly my attention was caught by one of the odd-looking assistants. He was some way off and evidently unaware of my presence. I saw a sort of three-quarter length of him over a pile of toys and through an arch, and, you know... He was leaning against a pillar in an idle sort of way, doing the most horrid things with his features. The particular horrid thing he did was with his nose. He did it just as though he was idle and wanted to amuse himself. First of all, it was a short, blobby nose, and then suddenly he shot it out like a telescope, and then out it flew and became thinner and thinner until it was like a long, red, flexible whip, like a thing in a nightmare it was, he flourished it about and flung it forth as a fly-fisher flings his line. My instant thought was that Gip mustn't see him. I turned about, and there was Gip quite preoccupied with the shopman, and thinking no evil. 
They were whispering together and looking at me. Gip was standing on a little stool, and the shopman was holding a sort of big drum in his hand. Hide and seek, Dada, cried Gip. You're he. And before I could do anything to prevent it, the shopman had clapped the big drum over him. I saw what was up directly. Take that off, I cried. This instant. You'll frighten the boy. Take it off. The shopman with the unequal ears did so without a word, and held the big cylinder towards me to show its emptiness. And the little stool was vacant. In that instant my boy had utterly disappeared. You know, perhaps, that sinister something that comes like a hand out of the unseen and grips your heart about? You know it takes your common self away and leaves you tense and deliberate, neither slow nor hasty, neither angry nor afraid. So it was with me. I came up to this grinning shopman and kicked his stool aside. Stop this folly, I said. Where is my boy? You see, he said, still displaying the drum's interior, there is no deception. I put out my hand to grip him, and he eluded me by a dexterous movement. I snatched again, and he turned from me and pushed open a door to escape. Stop, I said, and he laughed, receding. I leaped after him into utter darkness. Thud! Lord bless my heart. I didn't see you coming, sir. I was in Regent Street, and I had collided with a decent-looking working man, and a yard away, perhaps, and looking a little perplexed with himself, was Gip. There was some sort of apology, and then Gip had turned and come to me with a bright little smile, as though for a moment he had missed me, and he was carrying four parcels in his arm. He secured immediate possession of my finger. For the second I was rather at a loss. I stared round to see the door of the magic shop, and behold, it was not there. There was no door, no shop, nothing, only the common pilaster between the shop where they sell pictures and the window with the chicks. I did the only thing possible in that mental tumult. I walked straight to the curbstone and held up my umbrella for a cab. Ansoms, said Gip, in a note of culminating exultation. I helped him in, recalled my address with an effort, and got in also. Something unusual proclaimed itself in my tailcoat pocket, and I felt and discovered a glass ball. With a petulant expression, I flung it into the street. Gip said nothing. For a space, neither of us spoke. Dada, said Gip at last, that was a proper shop. I came round with that to the problem of just how the whole thing had seemed to him. He looked completely undamaged. So far, good. He was neither scared nor unhinged. He was simply tremendously satisfied with the afternoon's entertainment, and there in his arms were the four parcels. Confound it, what could be in them? Um, I said, little boys can't go to shops like that every day. He received this with his usual stoicism, and for a moment I was sorry I was his father and not his mother, and so couldn't suddenly there, quorum publico, in our handsome, kiss him. After all, I thought, the thing wasn't so very bad. But it was only when we opened the parcels that I really began to be reassured. Three of them contained boxes of soldiers, quite ordinary lead soldiers, but of so good a quality as to make Gip altogether forget that originally these parcels had been magic tricks of the only genuine sort, and the fourth contained a kitten, a little living white kitten, in excellent health and appetite and temper. I saw this unpacking with a sort of provisional relief. I hung about in the nursery for quite an unconscionable time. That happened six months ago, and now I am beginning to believe it is all right. The kitten had only the magic natural to all kittens, and the soldiers seem as steady a company as any colonel could desire. And Gip? The intelligent parent will understand that I have to go cautiously with Gip. But I went so far as this one day. I said, how would you like your soldiers to come alive, Gip, and march about by themselves? Mine do, said Gip. I just have to say a word I know before I open the lid. Then they march about alone? Oh, quite, Dada. I shouldn't like them if they didn't do that. I displayed no unbecoming surprise, and since then I have taken occasion to drop in upon him once or twice unannounced, when the soldiers were about, but so far I have never discovered them performing in anything like a magical manner. It's so difficult to tell. There's also a question of finance. I have an incurable habit of paying bills. I have been up and down Regent Street several times, looking for that shop. 
I am inclined to think, indeed, that in that matter honor is satisfied, and that, since Gipp's name and address are known to them, I may very well leave it to these people, whoever they may be, to send in their bill in their own time. End of The Magic Shop The Woman's Ghost Story by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato The Woman's Ghost Story by Algernon Blackwood Yes, she said from her seat in the dark corner, I'll tell you an experience if you care to listen. And what's more, I'll tell it briefly, without trimmings. I mean, without unessentials. That's a thing storytellers never do, you know, she laughed. They drag in all the unessentials and leave their listeners to disentangle. But I'll give you just the essentials, and you can make of it what you please. But on one condition. That at the end you ask no questions, because I can't explain it and have no wish to. We agreed. We were all serious. After listening to a dozen prolix stories from people who merely wished to talk but had nothing to tell, we wanted essentials. In those days, she began, feeling from the quality of our silence that we were with her, in those days I was interested in psychic things and had arranged to sit up alone in a haunted house in the middle of London. It was a cheap and dingy lodging house in a mean street, unfurnished. I had already made a preliminary examination in daylight that afternoon, and the keys from the caretaker, who lived next door, were in my pocket. The story was a good one, satisfied me at any rate that it was worth investigating, and I won't weary you with details as to the woman's murder and all the tiresome elaboration as to why the place was alive enough that it was. I was a good deal bored, therefore, to see a man whom I took to be the talkative old caretaker waiting for me on the steps when I went in at 11 p.m., for I'd sufficiently explained that I wished to be there alone for the night. I wish to show you the room, he mumbled, and of course I couldn't exactly refuse, having tipped him for the temporary loan of a chair and table. "'Come in, then, and let's be quick,' I said. We went in, he shuffling after me through the unlighted hall, up to the first floor where the murder had taken place, and I prepared myself to hear his inevitable account before turning him out with the half-crown his persistence had earned. After lighting the gas, I sat down in the armchair he'd provided, a faded brown plush armchair, and turned for the first time to face him and get through with the performance as quickly as possible. And it was in that instant I got my first shock. The man was not the caretaker. It was not the old fool, Carrie, I had interviewed earlier in the day and made my plans with. My heart gave a horrid jump. Now who are you, I pray, I said. You're not Carrie, the man I arranged with this afternoon. Who are you? I felt uncomfortable, as you may imagine. I was a psychical researcher and a young woman of new tendencies and proud of my liberty, but I did not care to find myself in an empty house with a stranger. Something of my confidence left me. Confidence with women, you know, is all humbug after a certain point, or perhaps you don't know for most of you are men, but anyhow my pluck ebbed in a quick rush and I felt afraid. "'Who are you?' I repeated quickly and nervously. The fellow was well-dressed, youngish and good-looking, but with a face of great sadness. I myself was barely thirty. I am giving you essentials, or I would not mention it. Out of quite ordinary things comes this story. I think that's why it has value.' "'No,' he said. "'I am the man who was frightened to death.' His voice and his words ran through me like a knife, and I felt ready to drop. In my pocket was the book I had bought to make notes in. I felt the pencil sticking in the socket. 
I felt, too, the extra warm things I'd put on to sit up in as no better sofa was available. A hundred things dashed through my mind, foolishly and without sequence or meaning, as the way is when one is really frightened. Unessentials leaped up and puzzled me, and I thought of what the papers might say if it came out, and what my smart brother-in-law would think, and whether it would be told that I had cigarettes in my pocket and was a free thinker. The man who was frightened to death, I repeated, aghast. That's me, he said stupidly. I stared at him, just as you would have done, any one of you men now listening to me, and felt my life ebbing and flowing like a sort of hot fluid. You needn't laugh, that's how I felt. Small things, you know, touch the mind with great earnestness when terror is there, real terror, but I might have been at a middle-class tea party for all the ideas I had. They were so ordinary. But I thought you were the caretaker I tipped this afternoon to let me sleep here, I gasped. Did, did Carrie send you to meet me? No, he replied in a voice that touched my boots somehow. I'm the man who was frightened to death. And what's more, I am frightened now. So am I, I managed to utter, speaking instinctively. I'm simply terrified. Yes, he replied in that same odd voice that seemed to sound within me. But you are still in the flesh, and I am not... I felt the need for vigorous self-assertion. I stood up in that empty, unfurnished room, digging the nails into my palms and clenching my teeth. I was determined to assert my individuality and my courage as a new woman and a free soul. "'You mean to say you are not in the flesh?' I gasped. "'What in the world are you talking about?' The silence of the night swallowed up my voice. For the first time I realized that darkness was over the city, that dust lay upon the stairs, that the floor above was untenanted and the floor below empty. I was alone, in an unoccupied and haunted house, unprotected, and a woman. I chilled. I heard the wind round the house and knew the stars were hidden. My thoughts rushed to policemen and omnibuses and everything that was useful and comforting. I suddenly realized what a fool I was to come to such a house alone. I was icily afraid. I thought the end of my life had come. I was an utter fool to go in for psychical research when I had not the necessary nerve. Good God, I gasped. If you're not Carrie, the man I arranged with, who are you? I was really stiff with terror. The man moved slowly towards me across the empty room. I held out my arm to stop him, getting up out of my chair at the same moment, and he came to halt just opposite to me, a smile on his worn, sad face. I told you who I am, he repeated quietly with a sigh, looking at me with the saddest eyes I've ever seen and I am frightened still. By this time I was convinced that I was entertaining either a rogue or a madman, and I cursed my stupidity in bringing the man in without having seen his face. My mind was quickly made up, and I knew what to do. Ghosts and psychic phenomena flew to the winds. If I angered the creature, my life might pay the price. I must humor him till I got to the door, and then race for the street. I stood bolt upright and faced him. We were about of a height, and I was a strong, athletic woman who played hockey in winter and climbed Alps in summer. My hand itched for a stick, but I had none. Now, of course, I remember, I said with a sort of stiff smile that was very hard to force, now I remember your case and the wonderful way you behaved. The man stared at me stupidly turning his head to watch me as I backed more and more quickly to the door. But when his face broke into a smile, I could control myself no longer. I reached the door in a run and shot out onto the landing. 
Like a fool, I turned the wrong way and stumbled over the stairs leading to the next story, but it was too late to change. The man was after me, I was sure, though no sound of footsteps came, and I dashed up the next flight, tearing my skirt and banging my ribs in the darkness, and rushed headlong into the first room I came to. Luckily the door stood ajar, and still more fortunate there was a key in the lock. In a second I had slammed the door, flung my whole weight against it, and turned the key. I was safe, but my heart was beating like a drum. A second later it seemed to stop altogether, for I saw that there was someone else in the room besides myself. A man's figure stood between me and the windows where the street lamps gave just enough light to outline his shape against the glass. I'm a plucky woman, you know, for even then I didn't give up hope, but I may tell you that I've never felt so vilely frightened in all my born days. I had locked myself in with him. The man leaned against the window, watching me where I lay in a collapsed heap on the floor. So there were two men in the house with me, I reflected. Perhaps other rooms were occupied, too. What could it all mean? But as I stared, something changed in the room, or in me, hard to say which, and I realized my mistake, so that my fear, which had so far been physical, at once altered its character and became psychical. I became afraid of my soul instead of in my heart, and I knew immediately who this man was. How in the world did you get up here? I stammered to him across the empty room, amazement momentarily stemming my fear. Now let me tell you, he began in that odd, faraway voice of his that went down my spine like a knife. I'm in different space, for one thing, and you'd find me in any room you went into. For according to your way of measuring, I'm all over the house. Space is a bodily condition, but I am out of the body and am not affected by space. It's my condition that keeps me here. I want something to change my condition for me, for then I could get away. What I want is sympathy, or really more than sympathy. I want affection. I want love. While he was speaking, I gathered myself slowly upon my feet. I wanted to scream and cry and laugh all at once, but I only succeeded in sighing, for my emotion was exhausted and a numbness was coming over me. I felt for the matches in my pocket and made a movement toward the gas jet. I should be much happier if you didn't light the gas, he said at once, for the vibrations of your light hurt me a good deal. You need not be afraid that I shall injure you. I can't touch your body to begin with, for there is a great gulf fixed, you know, and really this half-light suits me best. Now let me continue what I was trying to say before. You know, so many people have come to this house to see me, and most of them have seen me, and one and all have been terrified. If only, oh, if only someone would be not terrified, but kind and loving to me, then, you see, I might be able to change my condition and get away. His voice was so sad that I felt tears start somewhere at the back of my eyes, but fear kept all else in check, and I stood shaking and cold as I listened to him. Who are you, then? Of course Carrie didn't send you. I know now, I managed to utter. My thoughts scattered dreadfully, and I could think of nothing to say. I was afraid of a stroke. I know nothing about Carrie or who he is, continued the man quietly, and the name my body had I have forgotten, thank God. But I am the man who was frightened to death in this house ten years ago, and I have been frightened ever since, and am frightened still. For the succession of cruel and curious people who come to this house to see the ghost and thus keep alive its atmosphere of terror only helps to render my condition worse. If only someone would be kind to me, laugh, speak gently and rationally with me, cry if they like, pity, comfort, soothe me, 
anything but come here in curiosity and tremble as you are now doing in that corner. Now, madam, won't you take pity on me? His voice rose to a dreadful cry. Won't you step out into the middle of the room and try to love me a little? A horrible laughter came gurgling up in my throat as I heard him, but the sense of pity was stronger than the laughter, and I found myself actually leaving the support of the wall and approaching the center of the floor. By God, he cried, at once straightening up against the window, you have done a kind act. That's the first attempt at sympathy that's been shown me since I died, and I feel better already. In life, you know, I was a misanthrope. Everything went wrong with me, and I came to hate my fellow men so much that I couldn't bear to see them even. Of course, like begets like, and this hate was returned. Finally, I suffered from horrible delusions, and my room became haunted with demons that laughed and grimaced. And one night I ran into a whole cluster of them near the bed, and the fright stopped my heart and killed me. It's hate and remorse as much as terror that clogs me so thickly and keeps me here. If only someone could feel pity and sympathy and perhaps a little love for me, I could get away and be happy. When you came this afternoon to see over the house, I watched you, and a little hope came to me for the first time. I saw you had courage, originality, resource, love. If only I could touch your heart without frightening you. I knew I could perhaps tap that love you've stored up in your being there, and thus borrow the wings for my escape. Now I must confess my heart began to ache a little, as fear left me and the man's words sank their sad meaning into me. Still the whole affair was so incredible and so touched with unholy quality, and the story of a woman's murder I had come to investigate had so obviously nothing to do with this thing that I felt myself in a kind of wild dream that seemed likely to stop at any moment and leave me somewhere in bed after a nightmare. Moreover, his words possessed me to such an extent that I found it impossible to reflect upon anything else at all or to consider adequately any ways or means of action or escape. I moved a little nearer to him in the gloom, horribly frightened, of course, but with the beginnings of a strange determination in my heart. You women, he continued, his voice plainly thrilling at my approach, you wonderful women to whom life often brings no opportunity of spending your great love. Oh, if you only could know how many of us simply yearn for it. It would save our souls if but you knew. Few might find the chance that you now have. But if you only spent your love freely, without definite object, just letting it flow openly for all who need, you would reach hundreds and thousands of souls like me and release us. Oh, madam, I ask you again to feel with me, to be kind and gentle, and if you can, to love me a little. My heart did leap within me, and this time the tears did come for I could not restrain them. I laughed, too, for the way he called me madam sounded so odd here in this empty room at midnight in a London street. But my laughter stopped dead and merged with a flood of weeping when I saw how my change of feeling affected him. He had left his place by the window and was kneeling on the floor at my feet, his hands stretched out towards me, and the first signs of a kind of glory about his head. Put your arms around me and kiss me for the love of God, he cried. Kiss me, oh, kiss me, and I shall be freed. You've done so much already. Now do this. I stuck there, hesitating, shaking, my determination on the verge of action, yet not quite able to compass it. But the terror had almost gone. Forget that I'm a man and you're a woman, he continued, in the most beseeching voice I ever heard. Forget that I'm a ghost 
and come out boldly and press me to you with a great kiss and let your love flow into me. Forget yourself for just one minute and do a brave thing. Oh, love me, love me, love me, and I shall be free. The words or the deep force they somehow released in the center of my being stirred me profoundly, and an emotion infinitely greater than fear surged up over me and carried me with it across the edge of action. Without hesitation I took two steps forwards towards him where he knelt and held out my arms. Pity and love were in my heart at that moment, genuine pity, I swear, and genuine love. I forgot myself and my little tremblings in a great desire to help another soul. I love you, poor, aching, unhappy thing. I love you, I cried through hot tears, and I'm not the least bit afraid in the world. The man uttered a curious sound like laughter, yet not laughter, and turned his face up to me. The light from the street below fell on it, but there was another light, too, shining all around it that seemed to come from the eyes and skin. He rose to his feet and met me, and in that second I folded him to my breast and kissed him full on the lips, again and again. All our pipes had gone out, and not even a skirt rustled in that dark studio as the storyteller paused a moment to steady her voice and put a hand softly up to her eyes before going on again. Now, what can I say, and how can I describe to you, all you skeptical men sitting there with pipes in your mouths, the amazing sensation I experienced of holding an intangible, impalpable thing so closely to my heart that it touched my body with equal pressure all the way down, and then melted away somewhere into my very being? for it was like seizing a rush of cool wind and feeling a touch of burning fire the moment it had struck its swift blow and passed on. A series of shocks ran all over and all through me. A momentary ecstasy of flaming sweetness and wonder thrilled down into me. My heart gave another great leap, and then I was alone. The room was empty. I turned on the gas and struck a match to prove it. All fear had left me, and something was singing round me in the air and in my heart like the joy of a spring morning in youth. Not all the devils or shadows or hauntings in the world could then have caused me a single tremor. I unlocked the door and went all over the dark house, even into the kitchen and cellar and up among the ghostly attics, but the house was empty. Something had left it. I lingered a short hour, analyzing, thinking, wondering. You can guess what and how, perhaps, but I won't detail, for I promised only essentials, remember? And then went out to sleep the remainder of the night in my own flat, locking the door behind me upon a house no longer haunted. But my uncle, Sir Henry, the owner of the house, required an account of my adventure, and, of course, I was in duty bound to give him some kind of a true story. Before I could begin, however, he held up his hand to stop me. First, he said, I wish to tell you a little deception I ventured to practice on you. So many people have been to that house and seen the ghosts that I came to think the story acted on their imaginations, and I wish to make a better test. So I invented for their benefit another story with the idea that if he did see anything, I could be sure it was not due merely to an excited imagination. But then what you told me about a woman having been murdered and all that was not the true story of the haunting? It was not. The true story is that a cousin of mine went mad in that house and killed himself in a fit of morbid terror, following upon years of miserable hypochondriasis. It is his figure that investigators see. That explains, then, I gasped. Explains what? I thought of that poor struggling soul longing all these years for escape and determined to keep my story for the present to myself. 
Explains, I mean, why I did not see the ghost of the murdered woman, I concluded. Precisely, said Sir Henry, and why, if you had seen anything, it would have had value, inasmuch as it could not have been caused by the imagination working upon a story you already knew. End of The Woman's Ghost Story by Algernon Blackwood Memory by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Reese Harrison. Memory by H. P. Lovecraft. In the valley of mist, the accursed waning moon shines thinly tearing a patch for its light with feeble horns through the lethal foliage of the great upas tree and within the depths of the valley where the light reaches not new forms not meant to be beheld rank is the herbage on each slope where evil vines and creeping plants crawl amidst the stones of ruined palaces twining tightly about broken columns and strange monoliths and heaving up marble pavements laid by forgotten hands. And in trees that grow gigantic in crumbling courtyards leap little apes, while in and out of deep treasure vaults writhe poison serpents, and scaly things without a name. Vast are the stones which sleep beneath coverlets of dank moss, and mighty were the walls from which they fell. For all time did their builders erect them, and in sooth they yet serve nobly beneath them the grey toad makes his habitation. At the very bottom of the valley lies the river Pan, whose waters are slimy and filled with weeds. From hidden springs it rises, and to subterranean grottoes it flows, so that the demon of the valley knows not why its waters are red, nor whither they are bound. The genie that haunts the moonbeam spake to the demon of the valley, saying, I am old and forget much. Tell me the deeds and aspect and name of them who built these things of stone. And the demon replied, I am memory, and am wise in lore of the past, but I too am old. These beings were like the waters of the river Van, not to be understood. Their deeds I recall not, for they were but of the moment. Their aspect I recall dimly. It was like to that of the lapes and trees, the name I recall clearly, for it rhymed with that of the river. These beings of yesterday were called man. So the genie flew back to the thin horned moon, and the demon looked intently at a little ape in a tree that grew in a crumbling courtyard. End of memory. Back from that born by Edward Page Mitchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tommy Howell. Back from that born by Edward Page Mitchell. Practical Working of Materialization in Maine. A strange story from Pocock Island, a materialized spirit that will not go back. The first glimpse of what may yet cause very extensive trouble in the world. We are permitted to make extracts from a private letter which bears the signature of a gentleman well known in business circles, and whose veracity we have never heard called in question. Ill's statements are startling and well nigh incredible, but if true, they are susceptible of easy verification. Yet the thoughtful mind will hesitate about accepting them without the fullest proof, for they spring upon the world a social problem of stupendous importance. The dangers apprehended by Mr. Malthus and his followers uh, become remote and commonplace by the side of this new and terrible issue. The letter is dated at Pocock Island, a small township in Washington County, Maine, about seventeen miles from the mainland, and nearly midway between Mount Desert and the Grand Marion. The last state census accords to Pocock Island a population of 311, mostly engaged in the porgy fisheries. 
At the presidential election of 1872, the island gave Grant a majority of three. These two facts are all that we are able to learn of the locality, from sources outside of the letter already referred to. The letter, omitting certain passages which refer solely to private matters, reads as follows. But enough of the disagreeable business that brought me here to this bleak island in the month of November. I have a singular story to tell you. After our experience together at Chittenden, I know you will not reject statements because they are startling. My friend, there is upon Pocock Island a materialized spirit which, or who, refuses to be dematerialized. At this moment, and within a quarter of a mile from me as I write, a man who died and was buried four years ago, and who has exploited the mysteries beyond the grave, walks, talks, and holds intercourse with the inhabitants of the island, and is to all appearances determined to remain permanently upon this side of the river. I will relate the circumstances as briefly as I can. John Newbegin In April 1870, John Newbegin died and was buried in the little cemetery on the landward side of the island. Newbegin was a man of about forty-eight, without family or near connections, and eccentric to a degree that sometimes inspired questions as to his sanity. What money he had earned by many seasons fishing upon the banks was invested in quarters of two small mackerel schooners, the remainder of which belonged to John Hodgden, the richest man on Pocock, who was estimated by good authorities to be worth thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. Newbegin was not without a certain kind of culture. He had read a good deal of the odds and ends of literature, and as a simple-minded islander expressed it in my hearing, knew more bookfuls than anybody else on Pocock. He was naturally an intelligent man, and he might have attained influence in the community had it not been for his utter aimlessness of character, his indifference of fortune, and his consuming thirst for rum. Many yachtsmen's who have had occasion to stop at Pocock for water or harbor shelter during eastern cruises will remember a long, listless figure, astonishingly attired in blue army pants, rubber boots, loose toga made of some bright chintz material, and very bad hat, staggering through the little settlement, followed by the rabble of jeering brats, and pausing to strike uncertain blows at those within the reach of the dead sculpin which he usually carried around by the tail. This was John Newbegin. His sudden death. As I have already remarked, he died four years ago last April. The Mary Emmeline, one of the little schooners in which he owned, had returned from the eastward and had smuggled, or run in, a quantity of St. John brandy. Newbegin had a solitary and protracted debauch. He was missed from his accustomed walks for several days, and when the islanders broke into the hovel where he lived, close down to the seaweed, and almost within reach of the incoming tide, they found him dead on the floor, with an emptied demijohn hard by his head. After the primitive custom of the island, they interred John Newbegin's remains without coroner's inquest, burial certificate, or funeral services, and in the excitement of a large catch of porgies that summer, soon forgot him in his friendless life. His interest in the Mary Emmeline and the putty boat recurred to John Hodgton, and as nobody came forward to demand an administration of the estate, it was never administered. The forms of the law are but loosely followed in some of these marginal localities. His reappearance at Pocock. Well, my dear, four years and four months had brought their quota of varying seasons to Pocock Island when John Newbegin reappeared under the following circumstances. In the latter part of last August, as you may remember, there was a heavy gale all along our Atlantic coast. During this storm, the squadron of the Naugatuck Yacht Club, which was returning from a summer cruise as far as Campobello, was forced to take shelter in the harbor of the leeward of Pocock Island. The gentlemen of the club spent three days at the little settlement ashore. Among the party was Mr. R. Blank E. Blank, in which name you will recognize a medium of celebrity, 
and one who had been particularly successful in materializations. At the desire of his companions, and to relieve the tedium of their detention, Mr. E. improvised a cabinet in the little schoolhouse at Pocock, and gave a seance, to the delight of his fellow yachtsmen, and the utter bewilderment of such natives as were permitted to witness the manifestations. The conditions seemed unusually favorable to spirit appearances, and the seance was, upon the whole, perhaps the most remarkable that Mr. E. ever held. It was all the more remarkable because the surroundings were such that the prejudiced skeptic could discover no possibility of trickery. The first form to issue from the wood closet which constituted the cabinet, when Mr. E. had been tied therein by a committee of old sailors from the yachts, was that of an Indian chief who announced himself as Hockamock, and who retired after dancing a harvest moon passeul, and declared himself, in very emphatic terms, opposed to the present Indian policy of the administration. Hockamock was succeeded by the aunt of one of the yachtsmen, who identified herself beyond question by allusion to family matters, and by displaying the scar of a burn upon her left arm, received while making tomato ketchup upon earth. Then came successively a child whom no one present recognized, a French-Canadian who could not talk English, and a portly gentleman who introduced himself as William King, first governor of Maine. These in turn re-entered the cabinet, and were seen no more. It was some time before another spirit manifested itself, and Mr. E. gave directions that the light be turned down still further. Then the door of the wood closet was slowly opened, and a singular figure in rubber boots and a species of Dolly Varden garment emerged, bringing a dead fish in his right hand. His determination to remain. The city men who were present, I am told, thought that the medium was masquerading in grotesque habiliments for the more complete astonishment of the islanders, but these latter rose from their seats and exclaimed with one consent, It is John Newbegin, it is Johnny for certain. And then, in not unnatural terror at the apparition, they turned and fled from the schoolroom, uttering dismal cries. John Newbegin came calmly forward and turned up the solitary kerosene lamp that shed uncertain light over the proceedings. He then sat down in the teacher's chair, folded his arms, and looked complacently around him. You might as well untie the medium, he at length remarked. I propose to remain in the materialized condition. And he did remain. When the party left the schoolhouse, among them walked John Newbegin, as truly a being of flesh and blood as any man of them. From that day to this he has been a living inhabitant of Pocock Island, eating, drinking, water only and sleeping after the manner of men. The yachtsman who made sail for Bar Harbor the very next morning probably believe that he was a fraud hired for the occasion by Mr. E., but the people of Pocock who laid him out, dug his grave, and put him into it four years ago, know that John Newbegin has come back to them from a land they know not of. A Singular Member of Society the idea of having a ghost somewhat more condensed, it is true, than the traditional ghost, as a member, was not at first over-pleasing to the 311 inhabitants of Pocock Island. To this day they are a little sensitive upon the subject, feeling evidently that if the matter got abroad it might injure the sale of the really excellent porgy oil which is the product of their sole manufacturing interest. This reluctance to advertise the skeleton in their closet superadded to the slowness of these obtuse, fishy, matter-of-fact people to recognize the transcendent importance of the case, must be accepted as an explanation of the fact that John Newbegin's spirit has been on earth between three and four months, and yet the singular circumstance is not known to the whole country. But the Pocockians have at last come to see that a spirit is not necessarily a malevolent spirit, and accepting his presence as fact in their stolid, unreasoning way, they are quite neighborly and sociable with Mr. Newbegin. I know that your first question will be, is there sufficient proof of his ever having been dead? To this I answer unhesitatingly yes. 
He was too well known a character, and too many people saw the corpse to admit of any mistake on this point. I may here add that it was at one time proposed to disinter the original remains, but the project was abandoned in deference to the wishes of Mr. Newbegin, who feels a natural delicacy about having his first set of bones disturbed from motives of mere curiosity. An Interview with a Dead Man You will readily believe that I took occasion to see and converse with John Newbegin. I found him affable and even communicative. He is perfectly well aware of his doubtful status as a being, but is in hopes that at some future time there may be legislation which shall correctly define his position and the position of any spirit who may follow him into the material world. The only point upon which he is reticent is his experience during the four years that elapsed between his death and his reappearance at Pocock. It is to be presumed that the memory is not a pleasant one. At least he never speaks of this period. He candidly admits, however, that he is glad to get back to earth, and that he embraced the very first opportunity to be materialized. Mr. Newbegin says that he is consumed with remorse for the wasted days of his previous existence. Indeed, his course during the past three months would show that this regret is genuine. He has discarded his eccentric costume and dresses like a reasonable spirit. He has not touched liquor since his reappearance. He has embarked in the porgy oil business, and his operations already rival those of Hodgton, his old partner in the Mary Emmeline and the Putty Boat. By the way, Newbegin threatens to sue Hodgton for his undivided quarter in each of these vessels, and this interesting case therefore bids fair to be thoroughly investigated in the courts. As a businessman, he is generally esteemed on the island, although there is a noticeable reluctance to discount his paper at long dates. In short, Mr. John Newbegin is a most respectable citizen, if a dead man can be a citizen, and has announced his intention of running for the next legislature. In conclusion, And now, my dear, I have told you the substance of all I know respecting this strange, strange case. Yet, after all, why so strange? We accepted materialization at Chittenden. Is this any more than the logical issue of that admission? If the spirit may return to earth clothed in flesh and blood and all the physical attributes of humanity, why may it not remain on earth as long as it sees fit? Thinking of it from whatever standpoint, I cannot but regard John Newbegin as the pioneer of a possibly large immigration from the spirit world. The bars once down, a whole flock will come trooping back to earth. Death will lose its significance altogether. And when I think of the disturbance which will result in our social relations of the overthrow of all accepted institutions, and of the nullification of all principles of political economy, law, and religion, I am lost in perplexity and apprehension. End of Back from That Born At Crichton Abbey by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. At Crichton Abbey by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. The Crichtons were very great people in that part of the country where my childhood and youth were spent. To speak of Squire Crichton was to speak of a power in that remote western region of England. Crichton Abbey had belonged to the family ever since the reign of Stephen, and there was a curious old wing and a cloistered quadrangle still remaining of the original edifice and in excellent preservation. The rooms at this end of the house were low and somewhat darksome and gloomy, it is true, but though rarely used they were perfectly habitable and were in service on great occasion when the abbey was crowded with guests. The central portion of the abbey had been rebuilt in the reign of Elizabeth, and was of noble and palatial proportions. The south wing and a long music room with eight tall narrow windows added on to it were as modern as the time of Anne, 
Altogether, the abbey was a very splendid mansion and one of the chief glories of our county. All the land in Crichton Parish, and for a long way beyond its boundaries, belonged to the great squire. The parish church was within the park walls, and the living in the squire's gift, and not a very valuable benefice, but a useful thing, to bestow upon a younger son's youngest son, once in a way, or sometimes on a tutor or dependent of the wealthy house. I was a Crichton, and my father, a distant cousin of the reigning squire, had been rector of Crichton Parish. His death left me utterly unprovided for, and I was fain to go out into the bleak unknown world and earn my living in a position of dependence, a dreadful thing for a Crichton to be obliged to do. Out of respect for the traditions and prejudices of my race, I made it my business to seek employment abroad, where the degradation of one solitary Crichton was not so likely to inflict shame upon the ancient house to which I belonged. Happily for myself, I had been carefully educated and had industriously cultivated the usual modern accomplishments in the calm retirement of the vicarage. I was so fortunate as to obtain a situation at Vienna, in a German family of high rank, and here I remained seven years, laying aside year by year a considerable portion of my liberal salary. When my pupils had grown up, my kind mistress procured me a still more profitable position at St. Petersburg, where I remained for five more years, at the end of which time I yielded to a yearning that had been long growing upon me, an ardent desire to see my dear old country home once more. I had no very near relations in England. My mother had died some years before my father. My only brother was far away in the Indian civil service. Sister, I had none. But I was a Crichton, and I loved the soil from which I had sprung. I was sure, moreover, of a warm welcome from friends who had loved and honoured my father and mother, and I was still further encouraged to treat myself to this holiday by the very cordial letters I had from time to time received from the squire's wife, a noble, warm-hearted woman who fully approved the independent course I had taken, and who had ever shown herself my friend. In all her letters for some time past, Mrs. Crichton begged that, whenever I felt myself justified in coming home, I would pay a long visit to the Abbey. "'I wish you could come at Christmas,' she wrote in the autumn of the year of which I am speaking. We shall be very gay, and I expect all kinds of pleasant people at the Abbey. Edward is to be married early in the spring, much to his father's satisfaction, for the match is good and appropriate one. His fiancée is to be among our guests. She is a very beautiful girl. Perhaps I should say handsome rather than beautiful. Julia Tremaine, one of the Tremaines of old coat near Hayswell, a very old family, as I dare say you remember. She has several brothers and sisters, and will have little, perhaps nothing, from her father. But she has a considerable fortune left her by an aunt, and is thought quite an heiress in the county. Not, of course, that this latter fact had any influence with Edward. He fell in love with her at an assize ball in his usual impulsive fashion, and proposed to her in something less than a fortnight. It is, I hope and believe, a thorough love-match on both sides. After this followed a cordial repetition of the invitation to myself. I was to go straight to the Abbey when I went to England, and was to take up my abode there as long as ever I pleased. The letter decided me. The wish to look on the dear scenes of my happy childhood had grown almost into a pain. I was free to take a holiday without detriment to my prospects. So, early in December, regardless of the bleak, dreary weather, I turned my face homewards and made the long journey from St. Petersburg to London under the kind escort of Major Manson, a Queen's messenger, who was a friend of my late employer, the Baron Freufdorf, and whose courtesy had been enlisted for me by that gentleman. I was thirty and three years of age. Youth was quite gone. Beauty I had never possessed, and I was content to think of myself as a confirmed old maid, a quiet spectator of life's great drama, disturbed by no feverish desire for an active part in the play. I had a disposition to which the kind of passive existence is easy. There was no wasting fire in my veins. Simple duties, rare and simple pleasures, filled up my sum of life. The dear ones who had given a special charm and brightness to my existence were gone. Nothing could recall them, and without them actual happiness seemed impossible to me. Everything had a subdued and neutral tint. Life at its best was calm and colourless, like a grey sunless day in early autumn, 
serene, but joyless. The old abbey was in its glory when I arrived there at about nine o'clock on a clear, starlit night. A light frost whitened the broad sweep of grass that stretched away from the long stone terrace in front of the house to a semicircle of grand old oaks and beeches. From the music room at the end of the southern wing to the heavily framed Gothic windows of the old room on the north, there shone one blaze of light. The scene reminded me of some weird palace in a German legend, and I half expected to see the lights fade out all in a moment, and the long stone façade wrapped in sudden darkness. The old butler, whom I remembered from my very infancy, and who did not seem to have grown a day older during my twelve years' exile, came out of the dining-room as the footman opened the hall door for me, and gave me cordial welcome, nay, insisted upon helping to bring my portmanteau with his own hands, an act of unusual condescension, the full force of which was felt by his subordinates. "'It's a real treat to see your pleasant face once more, Miss Sarah said this faithful retainer, as he assisted me to take off my travelling cloak and took my dressing bag from my hand. You look a trifle older than when you used to live at the vicarage twelve years ago, but you're looking uncommon well for all that, and Lord love your heart, miss, how pleased they all will be to see you. Mrs. told me with her own lips about your coming. You'd like to take off your bonnet before you go to the drawing room, I dare say. The house is full of company. Call cool, Mrs. Marjoram, James, will you? The footman disappeared into the back region and presently reappeared with Mrs. Marjoram, a portly dame, who, like a true foe the butler, had been a fixture at the abbey in time of the present squire's father. From her I received the same cordial greeting, and by her I was led off up the staircases and along corridor, till I wondered where I was being taken. We arrived at last at a very comfortable room, a square tapestry chamber with a low ceiling supported by a great oaken beam. The room looked cheery enough with a bright fire roaring in the wide chimney, but it had a somewhat ancient aspect, which the superstitiously inclined might have associated with possible ghosts. I was fortunately of a matter-of-fact disposition, utterly sceptical upon the ghost subject, and the old-fashioned appearance of the room took my fancy. "'We are in King Stephen's swing, are we not, Mrs. Marjoram?' I asked. "'This room seems quite strange to me. I doubt if I have ever been in it before.' "'Very likely not, miss. Yes, this is the old wing. Your window looks out into the old stable-yard, where the kennel used to be at the time of your squire's grandfather. When the abbey was even a finer place than it is now, I have heard say. We are so full of company this winter, you see, miss, that we are obliged to make use of all these rooms. You will have no need to feel lonesome.' There's Captain and Mrs. Cranwick in the next room to this, and the two Miss Newports in the blue room opposite. My dear good Marjoram, I like my quarters excessively, and I quite enjoy the idea of sleeping in a room that was extant at the time of Stephen, when the abbey really was an abbey. I dare say some grave old monk had worn these boats with his devout knees. The old woman stared dubiously with the air of a person who had small sympathy with monkish times and begged to be excused for leaving me. She had so much on her hands just now. There was coffee to be sent in, and she doubted if the still room maid would manage matters properly if she and Mrs. Marjoram were not at hand to see that things were right. "'You've only to ring your bell, miss, and Susan will attend to you. She's used to help waiting on our young lady sometimes, and she's very handy. Mrs. has given particular orders that she should always be at your service. Mrs. Crichton is very kind, I assure you, Marjoram. I don't require the help of a maid once in a month.' I'm accustomed to do everything for myself. There, run along, Mrs. Marjoram, and see after your coffee, and I'll be down in the drawing-room in ten minutes. Are there many people there, by the by? A good many. There's Miss Tremaine, and her mamma, and young sister. Of course you've heard all about the marriage. Such a handsome young lady. Rather too proud for my liking. But the Tremaines were always a proud family, and this one's an heiress. Mr. Edward is so fond of her. Thinks the ground is scarcely good enough for her to walk upon, I do believe, and somehow I can't help wishing he'd chosen someone else, someone who could have thought more of him, and who would not take all his attention in such a cool off-hand way. But of course it isn't my business to say such things, and I wouldn't venture upon it to any one but you, Miss Sarah. She told me that I would find dinner ready for me in the breakfast-room, and then bustled off, leaving me to my toilet. This ceremony I performed as rapidly as I could, admiring the perfect comfort of my chamber as I dressed. Every modern appliance had been added to the sombre and ponderous furniture of an age gone by, 
and the combination produced a very pleasant effect. Perfume bottles of ruby-coloured bohemian glass, china brush trays and ring stands brightened the massive oak dressing table. A low, luxurious, chintz-covered easy chair of the Victorian era stood before the hearth. A dear little writing table of polished maple was placed conveniently near it, and in the background the tapestried walls loomed duskily, as they had once done hundreds of years before my time. I had no leisure for dreamy musings in the past, however provocative though the chamber might be of such thoughts. I arranged my hair in its usual simple fashion, and put on a dark grey silk dress trimmed with some fine old black lace that had been given to me by the baroness, an unobtrusive demi-toilette adapted to any occasion. I tied a massive gold cross, an ornament that had belonged to my dear mother, round my neck with a scarlet ribbon, and my costume was complete. One glance at the looking-glass convinced me that there was nothing dowdy in my appearance, and then I hurried along the corridor and down the staircase to the hall, where Truffaut received me and conducted me to the breakfast-room, in which an excellent dinner awaited me. I did not waste much time over this repast, although I had eaten nothing all day, for I was anxious to make my way to the drawing-room. Just as I had finished, the door opened and Mrs. Crichton sailed in, looking superb in a dark green velvet dress richly trimmed with old point lace. She had been a beauty in her youth, and as a matron was still remarkably handsome. She had, above all, a charm of expression which to me was rarer and more delightful than her beauty of feature and complexion. She put her arms around me and kissed me affectionately. "'I have only this moment been told of your arrival, my dear Sarah,' she said, "'and I find you have been in the house half an hour. What must you have thought of me?' "'What can I think of you except that you are all goodness, my dear Fanny?' I did not expect you to leave your guests to receive me, and I am really sorry that you have done so. I need no ceremony to convince me of your kindness. But, my dear child, it is not a question of ceremony. I have been looking forward so anxiously to your coming, and I should not have liked to see you for the first time before all those people. Give me another kiss. That's darling. Welcome to Crichton. Remember, Sarah, this house is always to be your home whenever you have need of one. My dear kind cousin, and you are not ashamed of me who have eaten the bread of strangers. Ashamed of you? No, my love. I admire your industry and spirit. And now come to the drawing-room. The girls will be so pleased to see you. And I to see them. They were quite little things when I went away, romping in the hay-fields in their short white frocks, and now I suppose they are handsome young women. They are very nice-looking, not as handsome as their brother. Edward is really a magnificent young man. I do not think my maternal pride is guilty of any gross exaggeration when I say that. And Miss Tremaine, I said, I am very curious to see her. I fancied a faint shadow come over my cousin's face as I mentioned this name. Miss Tremaine, uh, yes, uh, you cannot fail to admire her, she said rather thoughtfully. She drew my hand through her arm and led me to the drawing-room, a very large room with a fireplace at each end, brilliantly lighted tonight, and containing about twenty people scattered about in little groups, and all seeming to be talking and laughing merrily. Mrs. Crichton took me straight to one of the fireplaces, beside which two girls were sitting on a low sofa, while a young man of something more than six feet stood near them, with his arm resting on the broad marble slab of the mantelpiece. A glance told me that this young man with the dark eyes and crisp waving brown hair was Edward Crichton. His likeness to his mother was in itself enough to tell me who he was, but I remembered the boyish face and bright eyes which had so often looked up to mine in the days when the heir of the Abbey was one of the most juvenile scholars at Eton. The lady seated nearest Edward Crichton attracted my chief attention, for I felt sure that this lady was Miss Tremaine. She was tall and slim and carried her head and neck with a stately air which struck me more than anything in that first glance. Yes, she was handsome, undeniably handsome, and my cousin had been right when she said I could not fail to admire her. But to me the dazzlingly fair face with its perfect features, the marked aquiline nose, the sharp upper lip expressive of unmitigated pride, the full cold blue eyes, penciled brows, and an aureole of pale gold hair, was the very reverse of sympathetic. That Miss Tremaine must needs be universally admired, it was impossible to doubt, but I could not understand how any man could fall in love with such a woman. She was dressed in white muslin, and her only ornament was a superb diamond locket, heart-shaped, tied around her long white throat with a broad black ribbon. Her hair, of which she seemed to have a great quantity, 
was arranged in a massive coronet of plaits which surmounted the small head as proudly as an imperial crown. To this young lady Mrs. Crichton introduced me. "'I have another cousin to present to you, Julia,' she said, smiling. "'Miss Sarah Crichton, just arrived from St. Petersburg.' "'From St. Petersburg? What an awful journey! How do you do, Miss Crichton? It was really very courageous of you to come so far. Did you travel alone?' No, I had a companion as far as London, and a very kind one. I came on to the Abbey by myself. The young lady had given me her hand, with rather a languid air, I thought. I saw the cold blue eyes surveying me curiously from head to foot, and it seemed to me as if I could read the condemnatory summing up. A frump and a poor relation, in Miss Tremaine's face. I had not much time to think about her just now, for Edward Crichton suddenly seized both my hands, and gave me so hearty and loving a welcome that he almost brought the tears up from my heart into my eyes. Two pretty girls in blue crepe came running forward from different parts of the room and gaily saluted me as Cousin Sarah, and the three surrounded me in a little cluster and assailed me with a string of questions. Whether I had remembered this and whether I had forgotten that, the battle in the hayfield, the charity school tea party in the vicarage orchard, our picnics in Horsley Combe, our botanical and entomological excursions in Shorewell Common, and all the simple pleasures of their childhood and my youth. While this catechism was going on, Miss Tremaine watched us with a disdainful expression, which she evidently did not care to hide. "'I should not have thought you capable of such Arcadian simplicity, Mr. Crichton,' she said at last. "'Pray continue your recollections. These juvenile experiences are most interesting.' "'I don't expect you to be interested in them, Julia,' Edward answered, with a tone that sounded rather too bitter for a lover. I know what a contempt you have for trifling rustic pleasures. Were you ever a child yourself, I wonder, by the way? I don't believe you ever ran after a butterfly in your life. Her speech put an end to our talk of the past somehow. I saw that Edward was vexed, and that all the pleasant memories of his boyhood had fled before that cold, scornful face. A young lady in pink, who had been sitting next Julia Tremaine, vacated the sofa, and Edward slipped into her place, and devoted himself for the rest of the evening to his betrothed. I glanced at his bright expressive face now and then as he talked to her, and could not help wondering what charm he could discover in one who seemed to me so unworthy of him. It was midnight when I went back to my room in the North Wing, thoroughly happy in the cordial welcome that had been given me. I rose early next morning, for early rising had long been habitual to me, and drawing back the damask curtain that sheltered my window, looked out at the scene below. I saw a stable yard, a spacious quadrangle surrounded by the closed doors of stables and dog kennels, low massive buildings of grey stone, with the ivy creeping over them here and there, and with an ancient moss-grown look that gave them a weird kind of interest in my eyes. This range of stabling must have been disused for a long time, I fancied. The stables now in use were a pile of handsome red-brick buildings at the other extremity of the house, to the rear of the music room and forming a striking feature in the back view of the abbey. I had often heard how the present squire's grandfather had kept a pack of hounds, which had been sold immediately after his death, and I knew that my cousin, the present Mr. Crichton, had been more than once requested to follow his ancestor's good example, for there were no hounds now within twenty miles of the abbey, though it was a fine country for fox-hunting. George Crichton, however, the reigning lord of the abbey, was not a hunting man. He had indeed a secret horror of the sport, for more than one scion of the house had perished untimely in the hunting field. The family had not been altogether a lucky one, in spite of its wealth and prosperity. It was not often that the goodly heritage had descended to the eldest son. Death in some form or other on too many occasions, a violent death, had come between the heir and his inheritance. And when I pondered on the dark pages in the story of the house, I used to wonder whether my cousin Fanny was ever troubled by morbid forebodings about her only and fondly loved son. Was there a ghost at Crichton, that spectral visitant without which the state and splendour of a grand old house seemed scarcely complete? Yes, I had heard of vague hints of some shadowy presence that had been seen on rare occasions within the precincts of the abbey, but I had never been able to ascertain what shape it bore. Those whom I questioned were prompt to assure me that they had seen nothing. They had heard stories of the past foolish legends most likely not worth listening to. Once, when I had spoken of the subject to my cousin George, he told me angrily never again to let him hear any allusion to that folly from my lips. That December passed merrily. The old house was full of really pleasant people, 
and the brief winter days were spent in one unbroken round of amusement and gaiety. To me, the old familiar English country house life was a perpetual delight to feel myself amongst kindred and unceasing pleasure. I could not have believed myself capable of being so completely happy. I saw a great deal of my cousin Edward, and I think he contrived to make Miss Tremaine understand that, to please him, she must be gracious to me. She certainly took some pains to make herself agreeable to me, and I discovered that, in spite of that proud disdainful temper, which she so rarely took the trouble to conceal, she was really anxious to gratify her lover. Their courtship was not altogether a halcyon period. They had frequent quarrels, the details of which Edward's sister, Sophie and Agnes, delighted to discuss with me. It was a struggle of two proud spirits for mastery. But my cousin Edward's pride was of a nobler kind, the lofty scorn of all things mean, a pride that does not ill become a generous nature. To me he seemed all that was admirable, and I was never tired of hearing his mother praise him. I think my cousin Fanny knew this, and that she used to confide in me as fully as if I had been her sister. "'I dare say you can't say I'm not quite so fond as I should be of Juliet Tremaine,' she said to me one day. "'But I am very glad that my son is going to marry. Husbands has not been a fortunate family, you know, Sarah. The eldest sons have been wild and unlucky for generations past, and when Edward was a boy I used to have many a bitter hour, dreading what the future might bring forth. Thank God he has been and is all that I can wish. He has never given me an hour's anxiety by any act of his.' Yet I am not the less glad of his marriage. The heirs of Crichton, who have come to an untimely end, have all died unmarried. There was Hugh Crichton, in the reign of George the Second, who was killed in a duel. John, who broke his back in the hunting field thirty years later. Theodore, shot accidentally by a schoolfellow at Eton. Jasper, whose yacht went down in the Mediterranean forty years ago. An awful list, is it not, Sarah? I shall feel as if my son were safer somehow when he is married. It will seem as if he has escaped the ban that has fallen on so many of our house. He will have greater reason to be careful of his life, and he is a married man. I agreed with Mrs. Crichton, but could not help wishing that Edward had chosen any other woman than the cold handsome Julia. I could not fancy his future life happy with such a mate. Christmas came by and by, a real old English Christmas, frost and snow without, warmth and revelry within. Skating on the great pond in the park and sledging on the ice-bound high roads by day, private theatricals, charades, and amateur concerts by night, I was surprised to find that Miss Tremaine refused to take any active part in these evening amusements. She preferred to sit among the elders as a spectator, and had the air and bearing of a princess whose diversion, for all our entertainments, had been planned. She seemed to think that she fulfilled her mission by sitting still and looking handsome. No desire to show off appeared to enter her mind. Her intense pride left no room for vanity. Yet I knew that she could have distinguished herself as a musician if she had chosen to do so, for I had heard her sing and play in Mrs. Crichton's morning room, when only Edward, his sisters, and myself were present, and I knew that both as a vocalist and a pianist she excelled all our guests. The two girls and I had many a happy morning and afternoon, going from cottage to cottage in a pony carriage laden with Mrs. Crichton's gift to the poor of a parish. There was no public formal distribution of blanketing and coals, but the wants of all were amply provided for in a quiet, friendly way. Agnes and Sophie, aided by an indefatigable maid, the rector's daughter, and one or two other young ladies had been at work for the last three months, making smart warm frocks and useful undergarments for the children of the cottagers, so that on Christmas morning every child in the parish was arrayed in a complete new set of garments. Mrs. Crichton had an admirable faculty of knowing precisely what was most wanted in every household, and our pony carriage used to convey a varied collection of goods, every parcel directed in the firm free hand of the Chatelaine of the Abbey. Edward used sometimes to drive us on these expeditions, and I found that he was eminently popular among the poor of Crichton Parish. He had such an airy, pleasant way of talking to them, a manner which set them at their ease at once. He never forgot their names or relationships or wants or ailments, had a packet of exactly the kind of tobacco each man liked best, always ready in his coat pockets, and was full of jokes, which may not have been particularly witty, but which used to make the small low-roofed chambers ring with hearty laughter. Miss Tremaine coolly declined any share in these pleasant duties. "'I don't like poor people,' she said. "'I dare say it sounds very dreadful, but it's just as well to confess my iniquity at once. I never can get on with them, or they with me. I'm not a simpatica, I suppose.' 
and then I cannot endure their stifling rooms. The close faint odour of their houses gives me a fever. And again, what is the use of visiting them? It is only an inducement to them to become hypocrites. Surely it is better to arrange on a sheet of paper what it is just and fair for them to have. Blankets and coals and groceries and money and wine, and so on. And let them receive the things from some trustworthy servant. In that case, there need be no cringing on one side and no endurance on the other. But you see, Julia, there are some kinds of people to whom that sort of thing is not a question of endurance, Edward answered, his face flushing indignantly. People who like to share in the pleasure they give, who like to see the poor careworn faces light up with sudden joy, who like to make the sons of the soil feel that there is some friendly link between themselves and their masters, some point of union between the cottage and the great house. There is my mother, for instance. All these duties which you think so tiresome are to her an unfailing delight. There will be a change, I'm afraid, Julia, when you are mistress of the abbey. You have not made me that yet, she answered, and there is plenty of time for you to change your mind if you do not think me suited for the position. I do not pretend to like your mother. It is better that I should not affect any feminine virtues which I do not possess. After this, Edward insisted on driving our pony carriage almost every day, leaving Miss Tremaine to find her own amusement, and I think this conversation was the beginning of an estrangement between them, which became more serious than any of their previous quarrels had been. Miss Tremaine did not care for sledging or skating or billiard playing. She had none of the fast tendencies which have become so common lately. She used to sit in one particular bow window of the drawing room all the morning, working a screen in Berlin wool and beads, assisted and attended by her younger sister Laura, who was a kind of slave to her, a very colourless young lady in mind, capable of no such thing as an original opinion, and in person a pale replica of her sister. Had there been less company in the house, the breach between Edward Crichton and his betrothed must have been notorious. But with a house so full of people all bent on enjoying themselves, I doubt if it was noticed. On all public occasions my cousin showed himself attentive and apparently devoted to Miss Tremaine. It was only I and his sisters who knew the real state of affairs. I was surprised, after the young lady's total repudiation of all benevolent sentiments, when she beckoned me aside one morning and slipped a little purse of gold, twenty sovereigns, into my hand. "'I shall be very much obliged if you will distribute that among your cottages today, Miss Crichton,' she said. "'Of course I should like to give them something. It's only the trouble of talking to them that I shrink from. And you are just the person for an amina. Don't mention my little commission to anyone, please.' "'Of course I may tell Edward,' I said for I was anxious that he should know his betrothed was not as hard-hearted as she appeared. "'To him least of all,' she answered eagerly. "'You know that our ideas are vary on that point. He would think I gave money to please him. Not a word, pray, Miss Crichton. I submitted and distributed my sovereigns quietly, with the most careful exercise of my judgment. So Christmas came and passed. It was the day after the great anniversary, a very quiet day for the guests and family at the Abbey but a grand occasion for the servants, who were to have their annual ball in the evening, a ball to which all the humbler class of tenantry were invited. The frost had broken up suddenly, and it was a thorough wet day, a depressing kind of day for any one whose spirits are liable to be affected by the weather, as mine are. I felt out of spirits for the first time since my arrival at the Abbey. No one else appeared to feel the same influence. The elder ladies sat in a wide semicircle round one of the fireplaces in the drawing room. A group of merry girls and dashing young men chatted gaily before the other. From the billiard room there came the frequent clash of balls and the cheery peals of stentorian laughter. I sat in one of the deep windows, half hidden by the curtains, reading a novel, one of a boxful that came from town every month. If the picture within was bright and cheerful, the prospect was dreary enough without. The fairy forest of snow-wreathed trees, the white valleys and undulating banks of snow had vanished, and the rain dripped slowly and sullenly upon a darksome expanse of sodden grass, and a dismal background of leafless timber. The merry sound of the sledge-bells no longer enlivened the air. All was silence and gloom. Edward Crichton was not amongst the billiard players. He was pacing the drawing-room to and fro from end to end, with an air that was at once moody and restless. Thank heaven the frost has broken up at last, 
he exclaimed, stopping in front of the window where I sat. He had spoken to himself, quite unaware of my close neighbourhood. Unpromising as his aspect was just then, I ventured to accost him. What bad taste to prefer such weather as this to frost and snow, I answered. The park looked enchanting yesterday, a real scene from fairyland, and only look at it today. Oh, yes, of course, from an artistic point of view, the snow was better. The place does look something like the great dismal swamp today. But I'm thinking of hunting, and that confounded frost made a day's sport impossible. We are in for a spell of mild weather now, I think. But you are not going to hunt, are you, Edward? Indeed I am, my gentle cousin, in spite of that frightened look in your amiable countenance. I thought there were no hounds hereabouts. Nor are there. But there is as fine a pack as any in the country. The Daleborough hounds, five and twenty miles away. And you are going five and twenty miles for the sake of a day's run? I would travel forty, fifty, a hundred miles for that same diversion. But I am not going for a single day this time. I am going over to St. Francis Wycherley's place. Young Frank Wycherley and I were sworn chums at Christchurch for three or four days. I am due today, but I scarcely care to travel by cross-country in such rain as this. However, if the floodgates of the sky are loosened for a new deluge, I must go tomorrow. What a headstrong young man, I exclaimed. And what will Mr. Tremaine say to this desertion? I asked in a lower voice. Miss Tremaine can say whatever she pleases. She had it in her power to make me forget the pleasures of the chase. If she had chosen, though, we had been in the heart of the shires, and the welkin ringing with the baying of hounds. Oh, I begin to understand. This hunting engagement is not of long standing. No, I began to find myself bored here a few days ago, and wrote to Frank to offer myself for two or three days at Wycherley. I received a most cordial answer by return, and am booked till the end of this week. You have not forgotten the ball in the first. Oh, no, to do that would be to vex my mother and to offer a slight to our guests. I shall be here for the first, come what may. Come what may, so lightly spoken. The time came when I had bitter occasion to remember those words. I am afraid you will vex your mother by going at all, I said. You know what a horror both she and your father have of hunting. A most uncountry gentleman like aversion to my father's part. But he is a dear old bookworm, seldom happy out of his library. Yes, I admit they both have a dislike to hunting in the abstract. But they know I am a pretty good rider, and that it would need a bigger country than I shall find about Vikerly to flow me. You need not feel nervous, my dear Sarah. I am not going to give papa and mamma the smallest ground for uneasiness. You will take your own horses, I suppose. That goes without saying. No man who has cattle of his own cares to mount another man's horses. I shall take Pepperbox and the Druid. Pepperbox has a queer temper. I have heard your sisters say. My sisters expect a horse to be a kind of overgrown bar lamb. Everything splendid in horse flesh and womankind is prone to that slight defect, an ugly temper. There is Mr. Maine, for instance. I shall take Mr. Maine's part. I believe it is you who are in the wrong in the matter of this estrangement, Edward. Do you? Well, wrong or right, my cousin, until the fair Julia comes to me with sweet looks and gentle words, we can never be what we have been. You will return from your hunting expedition in a soft mood, I answered. That is to say, if you persist in going. But I hope and believe you will change your mind. Such a thing is not within the limits of possibility, Sarah. I am fixed as fate. He strolled away, humming some gay hunting song as he went. I was alone with Mrs. Crichton later in the afternoon, and she spoke to me about this intended visit to Vicarley. Edward has set his heart upon it evidently, she said regretfully, and his father and I have always made a point of avoiding anything that could seem like domestic tyranny. Our dear boy is such a good son that it would be very hard if we came between him and his pleasures. You know what a morbid horror my husband has of the dangers of the hunting field, and perhaps I am almost as weak-minded. But in spite of this, we have never interfered with Edward's enjoyment of a sport which he is passionately fond of, and hitherto, thank God, he has escaped without a scratch. Yet I have had many a bitter hour, I can assure you, my dear, when my son has been away in Leicestershire hunting four days a week. He rides well, I suppose. Superbly. He has a great reputation among the sportsmen of our neighbourhood. I dare say when he is master of the abbey, 
he will start a pack of hounds and revive the old days of his great-grandfather meredith crichton i fancy the hounds were kenneled in the stable-yard below my bedroom window in those days were they not fanny yes mrs crichton answered gravely and i wondered at the sudden shadow that fell upon her face i went up to my room earlier than usual that afternoon and i had a clear hour to spare before it would be time to dress for the seven o'clock dinner this leisure hour i intended to devote to letter-writing but on arriving in my room i found myself in a very idle frame of mind and instead of opening my desk i seated myself in the low easy chair before the fire and fell into a reverie how long i had been sitting there i scarcely know i had been half meditating half dozing mixing broken snatches of thought with brief glimpses of dreaming when i was startled into wakefulness by a sound that was strange to me it was a huntsman's horn a few low plaintive notes on a huntsman's horn notes which had a strange far-away sound that was more unearthly than anything my ears had ever heard i thought of the music in der fried scoots but the weirdest snatch of melody weber ever wrote had not so ghastly a sound as these few simple notes conveyed to my ear i stood transfixed listening to that awful music it had grown dusk my fire was almost out in the room in shadow as i listened a light flashed suddenly on the wall before me the light was as unearthly as the sound a light that never shone from earth or sky i ran to the window for this ghastly shimmer flashed through the window upon the opposite wall the great gates of the stable yard were open and men in scarlet coats were riding in a pack of hounds crowding in before them obedient to the huntsman's whip the whole scene was dimly visible by the declining light of the winter evening and the weird gleams of a lantern carried by one of them it was this lantern which had shone upon the tapestried wall i saw the stable doors open one after another gentlemen and grooms alighting from their horses the dogs driven into their kennel the helpers hurrying to and fro and that strange wan lantern light glimmering here and there in the gathering dusk but there was no sound of horses hoof or human voices not one yelp or cry from the hounds since those faint faraway sounds of the horn had died out in the distance the ghastly silence had been unbroken i stood at my window quite calmly and watched while the group of men and animals in the yard below noiselessly dispersed there was nothing supernatural in the manner of their disappearance the figures did not vanish or melt into empty air one by one i saw the horses led into their separate quarters one by one the redcoats strolled out of the gates and the grooms departed some one way some another the scene but for its noiselessness was natural enough and i had been a stranger in the house i might have fancied that those figures were real those stables in full occupation but i knew that the stable yard and all its range of building to have been disused for more than half a century could i believe that without an hour's warning the long deserted quadrangle could be filled the empty stalls tenanted had some hunting party from the neighbourhood sought shelter here glad to escape the pitiless rain that was not possible i thought i was an utter unbeliever in all ghostly things ready to credit any possibility rather than suppose that i had been looking upon shadows and yet the noiselessness the awful sound of that horn the strange unearthly gleam of that lantern little superstitious as i might be a cold sweat stood out upon my forehead and i trembled in every limb for some minutes i stood by the window statue-like staring blankly into the empty quadrangle then i roused myself suddenly and ran softly downstairs by a back staircase leading to the servants quarters determined to solve the mystery somehow or other the way to mrs marjoram's room was familiar to me from old experience and it was thither that i bent my steps determined to ask the housekeeper the meaning of what i had seen i had a lurking conviction that it would be well for me not to mention that scene to any member of the family till i had taken counsel with some one who knew the secrets of crichton abbey i heard the sound of merry voices and laughter as i passed the kitchen and servants hall men and maids were all busy in the pleasant labour of decorating their rooms for the evening's festival they were puffing the last touches to garlands of holly and laurel ivy and fir as i passed the open doors and in both rooms i saw tables laid for a substantial tea the housekeeper's room was in a retired nook at the end of a long passage a charming old room panelled with dark oak and full of capricious cupboards which in my childhood i had looked upon as storehouses of inexhaustible treasures in way of preserves and other confectionery it was a shady old room with a wide old-fashioned fireplace cool in summer when the hearth was adorned with a great jar of roses and lavender and warm in winter when the logs burned merrily all day long i opened the door softly and went in 
Mrs. Marjoram was dozing in a high-backed armchair by the glowing hearth, dressed in a state gown of grey watered silk, and with a cap that was a perfect garden of roses. She opened her eyes as I approached her, and stared at me with a puzzled look for the first moment or so. "'Why is that you, Miss Sarah?' she exclaimed. "'And looking as pale as a ghost. I can see even by this firelight. Just let me light a candle, and then I'll get you some sal volatile. Sit down in my armchair, miss. Why, I declare you're all of a tremble.' She put me into her easy chair before I could resist, and lighted two candles which stood ready upon her table while I was trying to speak. My lips were dry, and it seemed at first as if my voice was gone. "'Never mind the sal volatile, Marjoram,' I said at last. "'I'm not ill. I've been startled, that's all. And I've come to ask you for an explanation of the business that frightened me.' "'What business, Miss Sarah? You must have heard something of it yourself, surely. Didn't you hear a horn just now, a huntsman's horn?' A horn? Lord, no, Miss Sarah. Whatever could have put such a fancy into your head? I saw that Mrs. Marjoram's ruddy cheeks had suddenly lost their colour, that she was now almost as pale as I could have been myself. It was no fancy, I said. I heard the sound and saw the people. A hunting party had just taken shelter in the North Quadrangle. Dogs and horses and gentlemen and servants. What were they like, Miss Sarah? The housekeeper said in a strange voice. I can hardly tell you that. I could see that they wore red coats, and I could scarcely see more than that. Yes, I did get a glimpse of one of the gentlemen by the light of the lantern, a tall man with grey hair and whiskers, and a stoop in his shoulders. I noticed that he wore a short-waisted coat with a very high collar, a coat that looked a hundred years old. The old squire, muttered Mrs. Marjoram under her breath, and then turning to me she said with a cheery, resolute air, You've been dreaming, Miss Sarah, that's just what it is. You've dropped off in your chair before the fire and had a dream, that's it. No, Marjoram, it was no dream. The horn woke me, and I stood at my window and saw the dogs and huntsmen come in. Do you know, Miss Sarah, that the gates of the North Quadrangle have been locked and barred for the last forty years, and that no one ever goes in there except through the house? The gates may have been opened this evening to give shelter to strangers, I said. "'Not when the only keys that will open them hang yonder in my cupboard, miss,' said the housekeeper, pointing to a corner of the room. "'But I tell you, Marjoram, these people came into the quadrangle. The horses and dogs are in the stables and kennels at this moment. I'll go and ask Mr. Crichton, or my cousin Fanny, or Edward, all about it, since you won't tell me the truth.' I said this with a purpose, and it answered. Mrs. Marjoram caught me eagerly by the wrist. No, miss, don't do that, for pity's sake, don't do that. Don't breathe a word to missus or master. But why not? Because you've seen that which always brings misfortune and sorrow to this house, Miss Sarah. You've seen the dead. What do you mean? I gasped, awed in spite of myself. I dare say you've heard that there's been something seen at times at the Abbey, many years apart, thank God, for it never came that trouble didn't come after it. Yes, I answered hurriedly but I could never get any one to tell me what it was that haunted this place. No, miss, those that know have kept the secret, but you have seen it all to-night. There is no use in trying to hide it from you any longer. You have seen the old squire, Meredith Crichton, whose eldest son was killed by a fall in the hunting field, brought home dead one December night, an hour after his father and the rest of the party had come safe home to the abbey. The old gentleman had missed his son in the field, but had thought nothing of that, fancying that Master John had had enough of the day's sport, and had turned his horse's head homewards. He was found by a labouring man, poor lad, lying in a ditch with his back broken, and his horse beside him staked. The old squire never held his head up after that day, and never rode to hounds again, though he was passionately fond of hunting. Dogs and horses were sold, and the North Quadrangle has been empty from that day. How long is it since this kind of thing has been seen? A long time, miss. I was a slip of a girl when it last happened. It was in the winter time, this very night. The night Squire Meredith's son was killed. And the house is full of company, just as it is now. There was a wild young Oxford gentleman sleeping in your room at that time, and he saw the hunting party come into the quadrangle. And what did he do but throw his window wide open and give them the view, hello, as loud as he ever could. He had only arrived the day before and knew nothing about the neighbourhood. So at dinner he began to ask where were his friends the sportsmen, and he hoped he should be allowed to have a run with the abbey hounds next day. It was in time of our master's father, and his lady at the head of the table turned as white as a sheet when she heard this talk, 
She had good reason, for her soul. Before the week was out, her husband was lying dead. He was struck with a fit of apoplexy and never spoke or knew any one afterwards. An awful coincidence, I said, but it may have been only a coincidence. I've heard other stories, miss, heard them from those that couldn't deceive, all proving the same thing, that the appearance of the old squire in his pack is a warning of death to this house. I cannot believe these things, I exclaimed. I cannot believe them. Does Mr. Edward know anything about this? No, miss. His father and mother have been most careful that it should be kept from him. I think he's too strong-minded to be much affected by the fact, I said. And you will not say anything about what you've seen to my master or mistress, will you, Miss Sarah? pleaded the faithful old servant. The knowledge of it would be sure to make them nervous and unhappy. And if evil is to come upon this house, it isn't in human power to prevent its coming. God forbid that there is any evil at hand, I answered. I am no believer in visions or omens. After all, I would sooner fancy that I was dreaming, dreaming with my eyes open as I stood at the window, than that I beheld the shadows of the dead. Mrs. Marjoram sighed and said nothing. I could see that she believed firmly in the phantom hunt. I went back to my room to dress for dinner. However rationally I might try to think of what I had seen, its effect upon my mind and nerves was not the less powerful. I could think of nothing else, and a strange morbid dread of coming misery weighted me down like an actual burden. There was a very cheerful party in the drawing-room when I went downstairs, and at dinner the talk and laughter were unceasing. But I could see that my cousin Fanny's face was a little graver than usual, and I had no doubt she was thinking of her son's intended visit to Vikerley. At the thought of this a sudden terror flashed upon me. How if the shadows I had seen that evening were ominous of danger to him, to Edward, the heir and the only son of the house? My heart grew cold as I thought of this, and yet in the next moment I despised myself for such weakness. It is natural enough for an old servant to believe in such things, I said to myself. But for me, an educated woman of the world, preposterous folly. And yet from that moment I began to puzzle myself in the endeavour to devise some means by which Edward's journey might be prevented. Of my own influence I knew that I was powerless to hinder his departure by so much as an hour. But I fancied that Juliet Tremaine could persuade him to any sacrifice of his inclination, if she could only humble the pride so far as to entreat it. I determined to appeal to her in the course of the evening. We were very merry all that evening. The servants and their guests danced in the great hall, while we sat in the gallery above, and in little groups upon the staircase, watching their diversions. I think this arrangement afforded excellent opportunities for flirtation, and that the younger members of our party made good use of their chances. With one exception, Edward Crichton and his affianced contrived to keep far away from each other all the evening. While all was going on noisily in the hall below, I managed to get Miss Tremaine apart from the others in the embrasure of a painted window on the stairs, where there was a wide oaken seat. Seated here side by side, I described to her, under a promise of secrecy, the scene which I had witnessed that afternoon, and my conversation with Mrs. Marjoram. "'But good gracious me, Miss Crichton!' the young lady exclaimed, lifting her penciled eyebrows with unconcealed disdain. "'You don't mean to tell me that you believe in such nonsense. Ghosts and omens, an old woman's folly like that!' "'I assure you, Miss Tremaine, it is most difficult for me to believe in the supernatural,' I answered earnestly. But that which I saw this evening was something more than human. The thought of it has made me very unhappy, and I cannot help connecting it somehow with my cousin Edward's visit to Wycherley. If I had the power to prevent his going, I would do it, at any cost. But I have not. You alone have influence enough for that. For heaven's sake, use it. Do anything to hinder his hunting with the Daleborough hounds. You would have me humiliate myself by asking him to forego his pleasure, and that after his conduct to me during the last week. I confess that he has done much to offend you. But you love him, Miss Tremaine, though you are too proud to let your love be seen. I am certain that you do love him. For pity's sake, speak to him. Do not let him hazard his life, when a few words from you may prevent the danger. I don't believe he would give up this visit to please me, she answered, and I shall certainly not put it in his power to humiliate me by a refusal. Besides, all this fear of yours is such utter nonsense, as if nobody has ever hunted before. My brothers hunt four times a week every winter, and not one of them has ever been the worse for it yet. I did not give up the attempt lightly. 
I pleaded with this proud, obstinate girl for a long time, as long as I could induce her to listen to me. But it was all in vain. She stuck to her text. No one should persuade her to degrade herself by asking a favour of Edward Crichton. He had chosen to hold himself aloof from her, and she would show him that she could live without him. When she left Crichton Abbey, they would part as strangers. So the night closed, and at breakfast next morning I heard that Edward had started from Wycherley soon after daybreak. His absence made for me at least a sad blank in our circle. For one other also, I think. For Miss Tremaine's fair proud face was very pale, though she tried to seem gayer than usual, and exerted herself in quite an unaccustomed manner in her endeavour to be agreeable to everyone. The day passed slowly for me after my cousin's departure. There was a weight upon my mind, a vague anxiety which I struggled in vain to shake off. The house, full as it was of pleasant people, seemed to me to have become dull and dreary now that Edward was gone. The place where he had sat appeared always vacant to my eyes, though another filled it, and there was no gap on either side of the long dinner table. Light-hearted young men still made the billiard-room resonant with their laughter. Merry girls flirted as gaily as ever, undisturbed in the smallest degree by the absence of the air of the house. Yet for me all was changed. A morbid fancy had taken complete possession of me. I found myself continually brooding over the housekeeper's words, those words which that told me that the shadows I had seen boded death and sorrow to the house of Crichton. My cousins Sophie and Agnes were no more concerned about their brother's welfare than were their guests. They were full of excitement about the New Year's ball, which was to be a very grand affair. Every one of importance within fifty miles was to be present. Every nook and corner of the abbey would be filled with visitors coming from a great distance while others were to be billeted upon the better class of tenantry round about. Altogether, the organization of this affair was no small business, and Mrs. Crichton's mornings were broken by discussions with the housekeeper, messages from the cook, interviews with the head gardener on the subject of floral decorations, and other details, which all alike demanded the attention of the chatelaine herself. With these duties, and with the claims of her numerous guests, my cousin Fanny's time was so fully occupied that she had little leisure to indulge in anxious feelings about her son, whatever secret uneasiness may have been lurking in her maternal heart. As for the master of the abbey, he spent so much of his time in the library, where, under the pretext of business with his bailiff, he read Greek, that it was not easy for any one to discover what he did feel. Once and once only, I heard him speak of his son in a tone that betrayed an intense eagerness for his return. The girls were to have new dresses from a French milliner in Wigmore Street. And as the great event drew near, bulky packages of millinery were continually arriving, and feminine consultations and expositions of finery were being held all day long in bedrooms and dressing rooms with closed doors. Thus, with a mind always troubled by the same dark, shapeless foreboding, I was perpetually being called upon to give an opinion about pink tulle and lilies of the valley, or maize silk and apple blossoms. New Year's morning came at last, after an interval of abnormal length, as it seemed to me. It was a bright, clear day and almost spring-like sunshine lighting up the leafless landscape. The great dining-room was noisy with congratulations and good wishes as we assembled for breakfast on this first morning of a new year, after having seen the old one out cheerily the night before. But Edward had not yet returned, and I missed him sadly. Some touch of sympathy drew me to the side of Juliet Tremaine on this particular morning. I had watched her very often during the last few days, and I had seen that her cheek grew paler every day. Today her eyes had the dull, heavy look that betokens a sleepless night. Yes, I was sure that she was unhappy, that the proud, relentless nature suffered bitterly. He must be home today, I said to her in a low voice as she sat in stately silence before an untasted breakfast. Who must? she answered, turning towards me with a cold, distant look. My cousin Edward. You know he promised to be back in time for the ball. I know nothing of Mr. Crichton's intended movements, she said in her haughtiest tone. But of course it is only natural that he should be here tonight. He would scarcely care to insult half the county by his absence, however little he may value those now staying in his father's house. But you know that there is one here whom he does value better than any one else in the world, Mr. Main, I answered, anxious to soothe this proud girl. I know nothing of the kind. But why do you speak so solemnly about his return? He will come, of course. There is no reason he should not come. She spoke in a rapid manner that was strange to her and looked at me with a sharp, inquiring glance that touched me somehow. It was so unlike herself. It revealed to me so keen an anxiety. No, there is no reasonable cause for anything like uneasiness, I said. 
but you remember what I told you the other night. That has preyed upon my mind, and it will be an unspeakable relief to me when I see my cousin safe at home. I am sorry that you should indulge in such weakness, Miss Cry. That was all she said. But when I saw her in the drawing room after breakfast, she had established herself in a window that commanded a view of the long winding drive leading to the front of the abbey. From this point she could not fail to see anyone approaching the house. She sat there all day, everyone else was more or less busy with arrangements for the evening, or at any rate occupied with an appearance of business. But Juliet Tremaine kept her place by the window, bleeding a headache as an excuse for sitting still, with a book in her hand all day, yet obstinately refusing to go to her room and lie down when her mother entreated her to do so. "'You will be fit for nothing tonight, Julia,' Miss Tremaine said almost angrily. "'You have been looking ill for ever so long, and today you are as pale as a ghost.' I knew that she was watching for him, and I pitied her with all my heart, as the day wore itself out and he did not come. We dined earlier than usual, played a game or two of billiards after dinner, made a tour of inspection through the bright rooms, lit the wax candles only and odorous with exotics, and then came a long interregnum devoted to the arts and mysteries of the toilet, while maids flitted to and fro laden with frilled muslin petticoats from the laundry, and a faint smell of singed hair pervaded the corridors. At ten o'clock the band was tuning their violins, and pretty girls and elegant-looking men were coming slowly down the broad oak staircase, as the roll of fast-coming wheels sounded louder and without, and stentorian voices announced the best people in the county. I have no need to dwell upon the details of that evening's festival. It was very much like other balls, a brilliant success, a night of splendour and enchantment for those whose hearts were light and happy, and who could abandon themselves utterly to the pleasure of the moment a faraway picture of fair faces and bright-hued dresses, a wearisome kaleidoscopic procession of form and colour for those whose minds were weighed down with the burden of a hidden care. For me the music had no melody, the dazzling scene no charm. Hour after hour went by, supper was over, and the waltzers were enjoying those latest dances which always seemed the most delightful, and yet Edward Crichton had not appeared amongst us. There had been innumerable enquiries about him, and Mrs. Crichton had apologised for his absence as best she might. Poor soul! I well knew that his non-return was now a source of poignant anxiety to her, although she greeted all her guests with the same gracious smile, and was able to talk gaily and well upon every subject. Once, when she was sitting alone for a few minutes, watching the dancers, I saw the smile fade from her face and a look of anguish come over it. I ventured to approach her at this moment, and never shall I forget the look which she turned toward me. "'My son, Sarah,' she said in a low voice, something has happened to my son. I did my best to comfort her, but my own heart was growing heavier and heavier, and my attempt was a very poor one. Julia Tremaine had danced a little at the beginning of the evening, to keep up appearances, I believe, in order that no one might suppose that she was distressed by her lover's absence. But after the first two or three dances she pronounced herself tired and withdrew to a seat amongst the matrons. She was looking very lovely in spite of her extreme pallor, dressed in white too, a perfect cloud of airy puffings, and with a wreath of ivy leaves and diamonds crowning her pale golden hair. The night waned. The dancers were revolving in the last waltz, when I happened to look towards the doorway of the end of the room. I was startled by seeing a man standing there, with his hat in his hand, not in evening costume, a man with a pale anxious-looking face peering cautiously into the room. My first thought was of evil, but in the next moment the man had disappeared and I saw no more of him. I lingered by my cousin Fanny's side till the rooms were empty. Even Sophie and Annie had gone off to their own apartments, their airy dresses sadly dilapidated by night's vigorous dancing. There were only Mr. and Mrs. Crichton and myself in the long suite of rooms where the flowers were drooping and the wax lights dying out one by one in the silver sconces against the walls. "'I think the evening went off very well,' Fanny said, looking rather anxiously at her husband, who was stretching himself and yawning with an air of intense relief. "'Yes, the affair went off well enough.' But Edward has committed a terrible breach of manners by not being here. Upon my word, the young men of the present day think of nothing but their own pleasures. I suppose that something especially attractive was going on at Wycherley today, and he couldn't tear himself away. It is so unlike him to break his word, Mrs. Crichton answered. You are not alarmed, Frederick. You don't think that anything has happened, any accident? What should happen? Ned is one of the best riders in the county. I don't think there's any fear of him coming to grief. He might be ill. Not he. He's a young Hercules. And if it were possible for him to be ill, which it is not, we should have had a message from Wycherley. 
The words were scarcely spoken when Truefold, the old butler, stood by his master's side with a solemn, anxious face. "'There is a, a person who wishes to see you, sir,' he said in a low voice. "'Alone?' Low as the words were, both Fanny and myself heard them. "'Someone from Brykerley!' she exclaimed. "'Let him come here!' "'But, madam, the person most particularly wished to see Master alone. Shall I show him into the library, sir? The lights are not out there.' "'Then it is someone from Wycherley,' said my cousin, seizing my wrist with a hand that was icy cold. "'Didn't I tell you so, Sarah? Something has happened to my son. Let the person come here. Truefold, here. I insist upon it.' The tone of command was quite strange in a wife who was always deferential to her husband, in a mistress who was ever gentle to her servants. "'Let it be so, Truefold,' said Mr. Crichton. "'Whatever ill news has come to us, we will hear together.' He put his arm around his wife's waist. Both were pale as marble. Both stood in stony stillness, waiting for the blow that was to fall upon them. The stranger, the man I had seen in the doorway, came in. He was a curate of Wycherley Church and chaplain to Sir Francis Wycherley, a grave middle-aged man. He told what he had to tell with all kindness, with all the usual forms of consolation which Christianity and an experience of sorrow could suggest. Vain words, wasted trouble. The blow must fall, and earthly consolation was unable to lighten it by a feather's weight. There had been a steeplechase at Wycherley, an amateur affair with gentlemen riders on that bright New Year's day, and Edward Crichton had been persuaded to ride his favourite hunter Pepperbox. There would be plenty of time for him to return to Crichton after the races. He had consented, and his horse was winning easily. When, at the last fence, a double one with water beyond, Pepperbox balked his leap, and went over head foremost, flinging his rider over a hedge into a field close beside the course, where there was a heavy stone roller. Upon this stone roller Edward Crichton had fallen, his head receiving the full force of the concussion. All was told. It was while the curate was relating the fatal catastrophe that I looked round suddenly and saw Juliet remain standing a little behind the speaker. She had heard all. She uttered no cry. She showed no signs of fainting, but stood calm and motionless, waiting for the end. I know not how that night ended. There seemed an awful calm upon us all. A carriage was got ready, and Mr. and Mrs. Crichton started from Wycherley to look upon their dead son. He had died while they were carrying him from the course to Sir Francis's house. I went with Juliet Remain to her room and sat with her while the winter morning dawned slowly upon us. A bitter dawning. I have little more to tell. Life goes on, though hearts are broken. Upon Crichton Abbey there came a dreary time of desolation. The master of the house lived in his library, shut from the outer world, buried almost as completely as a hermit in his cell. I have heard that Juliet Tremaine was never known to smile after that day. She is still unmarried and lives entirely at her father's country house, proud and reserved in her conduct to her equals, but a very angel of mercy and compassion amongst the poor of the neighbourhood. Yes, this haughty girl who once declared herself unable to endure the howls of the poor is now a sister of charity in all but the rogue. So does a great sorrow change the current of a woman's life. I have seen my cousin Fanny many times since that awful New Year's night, for I have always the same welcome at the Abbey. I have seen her calm and cheerful, doing her duty, smiling upon her daughter's children, the honoured mistress of a great household. But I know that the mainspring of life is broken, that for her there hath passed a glory from the earth and that upon all the pleasures and joys of this world she looks with a solemn calm of one for whom all things are dark with the shadow of a great sorrow. End of At Crichton Abbey by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama